far uh, or near migrated then we have to grade the disk prolapse into three grades and the zones so this is uh, how i approach the um, disk herniation so if the uh, disc herniation is high and is up migrate. I use the transpedicular technique for high down migrated disc herniation. I use pedicular tommy technique for low migrated disc herniation with foramen stenosis. It's good to uh, use the outside in or the mobile outside in technique or uh, without foramen stenosis half and half or the epidural uh, scopic technique work very well. If the disc herniation is not migrated and it is a grade one or two or contained inside out technique works very well for uncontained you can either use extreme lateral and can follow the low migrated disc herniation path for grade three herniation you have to treat it like a low migrated disc herniation and use the same path for central disc herniation extreme lateral on inside out approach works very well for paracentral extreme uh, out on half an hectare techniques work very well for foraminal and extra foraminal uh, take disc prolapse it is better to use mobile outside in technique because you can uh, divert the we start doing more and more endoscopic cases you'll be actually be able to identify that the lamina is sloping down and you will expect your pass to be at the end of that but otherwise there is no shame in keep going on taking images to know exactly where you are so here also at present i am going to take an image uh, i've already taken an image inferiorly i'm going to take an image again right now to check my superior extent can you come down please image so that gives me a good guide as to how superiorly i have to go in order to protect the pars as well and in order to you know not remove unnecessary bones as i said that endoscopy i feel is about targeted it's a targeted surgery you try and save as much natural anatomy as possible that's actually my biggest goal of i feel which is of endoscopic surgery it's it's more like a surgical strike you know so if you see here if you see the image put it on uh, picture yeah. in picture please Siam, can you show the you can you see the Siam image? The image intensifier image, please. Can you show the image intensifier, please? Yeah, we are able to see. Yeah, yes, I'm somehow. just above the tip of my superior facet. So this is what I still need to remove. If you see the endoscopic view, this is what I still need to remove. Okay, and inferiorly now this will this is going to be my pedicle down. Shoot, karo wapas. See, I'm on the superior border of my pedicle. So. I use this to, to confirm that I have removed enough bone and it identifies and gives me an idea. 300 patients of open surgeries, uh, so the pain reduction was significantly less in endoscopic spine surgeries, while the resurgery was required in only 9 patients of endoscopic spine surgery. They concluded that endoscopy is non-inferior to open technique. Finally, this uh, paper came from Korea. It showed this paper is basically discussing the evaluation of endoscopic spine surgeries. This paper demonstrates, it shows that the first generation is discectomy, second generation is decompression, and third generation is endofusion. So as an operating surgeon goes from first generation to third generation, the complication rates come down. As you can see, in first generation, it was just 8.2% which comes down to 3.4% in third generation of surgeons. The pain criteria are significantly improved from first generation to third generation. The conclusion is that generational change of endoscopic spine surgeries over open surgeries in degenerative spine and prolapse disc are possible as a surgeon gets more experience with endoscopic surgeries and it definitely produces a good clinical outcome. Now, every technique has its own limitations. This is our experience, actually. We have did around 78 cases. 12 cases were interlaminal. 66 were transforaminal. And we had one complication, infection, in which we required a revision surgery. All the patients had good improvement in pain. Now, as all, all, all techniques has its few limits. It's been set as max over here in this machine. So at Samba, present, we're on 104 pressure. Samba, I'm Dr. Malcolm here. Yeah, yeah, bolo, bolo. But yeah, Indian machine, it's 102, it's not 60, it's pressure. Tera. <laughs> okay, this is an Indian machine, it just shows bigger figures. Okay, okay. Okay? No, I have no experience, good, thank but, you for... But the advantage of this yeah. machine is, it has a foot pedal. Okay. So when I want pressure in an emergency, my assistant has to just press the foot pedal and I get a huge pressure jump. Okay. So in a massive bleeder, I can just use it for a couple of seconds, right. see the bleeder, coagulate it and drop the pressure again. Oh, lovely. So I think we'll, we'll, I'll discuss this with you later to buy one. Okay. Sure. Thank you.
So I think go Try to you one get one tray. Great. Mactronic. Can I have a question? Uh, is the foraminotomy is uh, routinely done in, 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 in stenosis or it depends on preoperative planning or finding? So I will, I will prepare it on, absolutely on preoperative uh, finding. So in this case as well, I'm going to check the foramen. Once I finish this decompression, I will put my nerve hook and I will check the foramen. So you're inferiorly, in fact, I've already checked with my, just give me the nerve hook, please. So there is no compression. I can see that the nerve is very well free. So this is the pedicle there. This is the pedicle mm -hmm. of the L5. And that I'm completely, like, okay, shoot Lelo. Okay, shoot Lelo. See yeah. Yep. So I think I will be below the medial border or uh, the middle of the pedicle inferiorly also. Yeah, so I yeah, don't feel is, that there is, is any compression whatsoever yeah, over there. So there are basically only two challenges while dealing with migrations. One is fragment is not in line with the endoscope or the instruments. So to tackle this, if you are going much steeper, you are going to go much more into deeper into the disc. So you just need to go much more flat so that you target the epidural space or the just the posterior annulus. There you can uh, target the either the tail of the herniation or you can just cut the annulus and see the disc herniations. Secondly, in the uh, craniocaudal direction, there is a, uh, our endoscope is almost always in line with the disc, but for dealing with herniations, if, for example, if it's a down-migrated herniation, our endoscope needs to come from the top. So our entry point needs to be much more cranially so that we target at the lower migrated disc herniations. And similarly, for up-migrated, you need to go from downwards so that you target the up-migrated fragments. So in using this variation, you can change the, your entry point and you can easily tackle this challenge of fragment not being in line with your endoscope. So you can change your endoscope orientation so that the fragment comes to your line and you target it properly. The second challenge is the facet joint blocks the axis. Now you can see that uh, the, uh, the lower part of the foramen is very small and it is because there is a superior articular process and there is sometimes this is a diamond tipped bendable burr uh, which is quite inexpensive and uh, can be used to about I think 10 cases and as you open this foramen up you can see this down migrated fragment is easily accessible now. You can see it, you can use your flexible graspers to retrieve it and uh, these were the fragments that I had retrieved in this case and since this case was done under local anesthesia, this was the immediate post-op. I just turned the patient from the OT table to the stretcher and you can see the patient is herself doing all those movements and her pain is completely gone. So the take home message for this is, it is not that complicated. The proper targeting of fragment is important. Entry needs to be lateral to work in the epidural space and flexible graspers are must have and you must learn to use a burr if you are going to practice any kind of migrations in your practice, uh, if you are going to deal with any kind of migrations. Without a burr, it is not possible to do an effective job. Thank you so much. Great one, great one. Thank you, Dr. Ankit, for such a beautiful demonstration and tips and tricks in uh, uh, doing a very difficult case. Uh, I now call upon Dr. Jaydeep Ghosh. Dr. Jaydeep Ghosh. He will tell us how transforaminal fusion is done, augment and put, place it over the facet and just burn it. So that uh, will increase the facet fusion. Yeah, it is theoretically yes, but practically it is difficult to believe. But yes, this is one of the methods in minimally invasive scoliosis surgeries where they do it under vision and put chop the facet and put bone graft. But by just burning it cannot fuse, that's what we believe. Last question to Annette, uh, Ankit, yeah. Uh, when you are using it for uh, lower migrated, uh, are you using the same diameter uh, scope, 4.3, or you would decrease it so you will, you will have more uh, chance for, let's say you are using 3.7? Yes. Come in between, come in between. You are in between two great men. 
Dr. Swapnil Hazare. Thank you. Dr. Praveen Gupta, please, sir. Praveen is an old, old, old friend. Dr. Mehul Modi. I am going to remember his Nokia talk. <laughs> That's wonderful, wonderful. The things change in their relevance. Dr. Ankit Madaria, please. Excellent talk and an excellent demonstration today of going above the dura, removing the foramen in the foramen. Excellent. Dr. Ankit Madaria, you honor us. Thank you. And doc lastly, Dr. Jaydeep Ghosh. Can I request Dr. Sudipas Pongmani? Dr. Nantawat and Dr. Day, I don't know whether he's come yet or is not come, but please can you come on the stage as chairman? The power is going out. And we have Dr. Samya on stage here as chairman. So please, can you all take the sofa, please, gentlemen? And we have our moderator right now with us, Dr. Harshad Parekh. He's very strict. Thank you. He's an excellent neurosurgeon, one of the best neurosurgeons of the city of Mumbai. Thank you. Good morning. So we begin our session with the first talk. I invite uh, Dr. Siddharth Verma for PSLD instruments technique and anesthesia and OT setup. Dr. Siddharth Verma. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, I'll straight away. Five minutes for <laughs> Yeah, okay, sure. So five minutes, they want to uh, relay the OT feed. So maybe after that, we'll have a conversation. Hello? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so I think uh, that, that's the opposite side for Amin. That's the opposite side nerve, what you see here. This is the opposite side nerve. That's the opposite axilla. So there was a full bony, the slight bony compression here, which we have removed. Although the patient does not have much of right-sided symptoms, but we've gone into the foramen. We've taken a CRM image also to show you that we've gone right till the foramen of the other side. And this is my central dura. And that is my ipsilateral nerve. Obviously, there is some bleeding here because we've come back after a long time. We just connect that. But this we had anyway shown you the ipsilateral nerve, which was free. And that's over the top, and that's contralateral side. So, CM? Ah. So, in the CM also, we have checked that we have gone to the opposite side. And I think we are done with this decompression here. And I think now the next step of the surgery, Dr. Kavi and Dr. Kiran will uh, take forward. Hello? Yeah, we, we heard you. Thank you for the nice demonstration. Yeah, what I will. So good morning all of you. Uh, this is a very uh, basic topic and uh, I'd like to quickly rush you through uh, it. And uh, this is about the PSLD instruments, anesthesia and OT setup, especially good for the beginners as I was a few months back. Uh, so uh, before I begin, I, there's a disclaimer, the use of the images don't, uh, you know, this is not sponsored by anybody. So uh, feel free to choose your uh, equipment. So. Uh, so for the instruments, you uh, need something which is known or which came to be known as a stenoscope. And uh, the significant uh, difference being after the publication of such first paper uh, uh, from uh, Korea, uh, that it had a very uh, uh, larger diameter as compared to the endoscopes which were being used earlier. Uh, the, the reason was probably to allow for uh, the uh, bigger instruments to get in. And uh, the one which is, uh, which personally I, I brought for the, as my first instrument was uh, an 8.4 outer diameter and 5.7 mm working channel. Uh, it is also significantly shorter, although you can do with a longer one also, but uh, 
the maneuverability and especially uh, the uh, comfort of the surgeon uh, considering that it, 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 it's always better to have uh, this length and uh, the angle which was uh, because I migrated from doing transferminal to this so maybe some of you may be directly going into this or some some of you may be doing it with UB as well so this 12 uh, degree angle uh, this uh, now many are available but uh, this started with this one then the another uh, component which is very important is the drill system and uh, uh, this uh, monoportal uh, PSLD this doesn't uh, require much instruments but it requires definitely instruments of high quality so uh, the drill system uh, which has to be there has to be uh, good enough because you want to quickly drill off uh, the the lamina and the bone you want to finish your bone work fast so that you can then reach the structures and do your uh, real job so bony work is just for access here uh, as in uh, other endoscopic uh, procedures then you need the Kersen punches uh, of course uh, uh, I started with like most of you will start with lumbar ones so you will uh, require the bigger punches uh, and of course uh, some of you will need uh, or rather it is recommended that you have uh, a hook which will uh, break adhesions and prevent uh, tears uh, blind pulling pushing is very dangerous uh, so even uh, more dangerous in this uh, uh, can we shut the video oh. hello yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so I think we are done here. This is the ipsilateral side. You can see the pulsations, the shoulder, the axilla. We went on to the contralateral side also. And we have seen the contralateral nerve root as well. We have also taken a CRM image. Uh, to, yeah, I think we are waiting. So there is some amount of bleeding there right now. But we have seen the opposite nerve as well. And central dura. And this is the ipsilateral nerve. So I think we are done with the decompression here. And I think... Uh, Dr. Kavi and Dr. Kiran will do the next stage of the surgery now. Any questions? Good job, Samba. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Malcolm. And thank you, everyone. Uh, it was a pleasure. Good. Thank you. So, uh, so these are the punches which, uh, which come with various detachable handles. I bought a one with the a detachable handle just to save on the initial cost of setup and uh, of course you can buy all of them as well it depends on your resources uh, I think uh, the one which uh, has got this ceramic punch it is uh, it is uh, supposed to be a longer lasting punch but don't go for fancy stuff especially if you if you are resource constrained uh, focus on the uh, on the on the on the surgery which you want to do and uh, make sure you have instruments before you begin the procedure uh, so once while you plan the case uh, you will know what <coughs> instruments you will need uh, when you are starting you can discuss it with somebody who's done few cases before just to make sure you have enough instruments uh, so for the uh, drill there are various options which are available i found uh, i already had a angled hand piece uh, with the, which i was using with a local dental drill uh, so i found that it is better to upgrade to a newer one now because the bone work in this uh, surgery is much more than the one which probably will do in transforaminal so uh, that's what I will suggest uh, to you as well uh, the RF uh, I had a RF which I was using uh, with the transforaminal uh, procedure and I found that it was often inadequate to do the initial part uh, of the access uh, to ablate the muscles and uh, you know uncover the bone so I needed a RF which could uh, or uh, or maybe a cautery so either you can use a bipolar in that case superficially or you can go in with a with an RF uh, which which many companies now have uh, irrigation pump uh, I never required any irrigation pump while I was doing the transformal work but uh, definitely in uh, in interlaminar you may need irrigation pump and uh, they say that don't go beyond 50 uh, millimeter but as you could see sometimes it, it can get uh, uh, bleeding might be there and to complete your procedure you may require to either increase the pressure or maybe some people they advocate applying uh, bone wax although personally I have not seen people who are using bone wax a lot uh, so most of us uh, we just increase the pressure slightly uh, move it out of the field and uh, just focus on our area of uh, interest and that's that that does the work for most of us uh, the various uh, equipment available uh, and various fancy probes so don't don't go for much fancy probe you may require only uh, the usual uh, one which which is available with 
most older companies and that works uh, pretty, pretty well. However, if you have a bigger probe, it can make the thing quicker, but that doesn't mean it prevents you from starting the procedure. So you can start with a, with a smaller probe and then maybe uh, as you are uh, having more resources, you can switch on with that. For the anesthesia, I was always more comfortable because I, for me, it was a learning curve, curve upwards transforaminal. So I was always con more comfortable with the, maybe a, a regional one. So I preferred epidural anesthesia with mass sedation in the prone flex position on a Wilson frame. And uh, but, however, it can be done under GA as well. Uh, some of my colleagues are doing it under GA, and they are getting pretty good results. Uh, the plus minus. Uh, of course, uh, with GA, you have certain uh, limitations, especially post-procedure. And of course, all patients, because m many of these patients are elderly, so you don't want to risk them. Uh, so in those cases, you can go on with the, with the, with the regional, uh, which, which might be better. So this was something which I saw at one of my mentors' uh, place. Uh, this was in Korea with Dr. Lim. So when I saw there was silicon padding and all fancy stuff, uh, it was there. So it was a Wilson frame. Uh, the table height, uh, we adjust as per the surgeon's height. There was no special equipment other than this, uh, which, which is required. It's pretty much your standard setup. Uh, for the headrest, it's often better to use a very comfortable silicon uh, headrest rather than, you know, going in and then patient uh, throughout the procedure wants to move their head, especially if they are uh, under regional. If you're giving uh, a propofol or something like that, then your patient is more likely to be, uh, uh, you know, less mobile. Uh, don't ignore the support which is given to the legs uh, as uh, this can be a potential source of uh, complications later on. However, in spite of knowing all this, uh, in my first case, I started with uh, only this. That is all I could manage in my first case. So uh, during the case, we had a lot of struggle and uh, uh, immediately after the case, the first thing I did was to order a Wilson frame. So uh, most of you, especially the neurosurgeons or uh, people who are working with the Wilson frame already will have it, but those of you who are not having it or maybe are graduating from your pain procedures upwards. So then that becomes uh, an, an essential part of uh, uh, this setup. So I'll keep my thing short and sweet. Uh, for those of you who want to see some other technical details, I'll refer you to uh, this one paper, which was probably it describes quite uh, a bit in detail and uh, see you around soon. Uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siddharth. That is one of the very nice way of explaining us about PSLD. By the way, how, what is the cost of stenoscopy? So uh, it's around uh, six lakh Indian rupees. And uh, if you can, uh, if you want to, for, for, for this one which I brought, but if you want to get a cheaper one, they are all available actually. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so I invite Dr. Santosh Tripathi. He will speak on posterior cervical endoscopic foraminotomy and discectomy. Very interesting topic. Dr. Santosh. Thank you. Uh, so I will be talking about the full endoscopic posterior cervical formatomy and a uh, little bit about disectomy and a uh, little bit about the ULBD also cervical. So as we know, endoscopy uh, posterior approaches are getting more and more attention these days. And uh, we know like uh, we do have microscopic laminar formatomy and tube assisted micro endolaminar formatomy. And uh, now <laughs> we are using full endoscopic formatomy. Definitely the basics and principles of surgery are the same. But the difference comes here when we uh, look at these pictures, you know, the visualization is definitely better as uh, in the full endoscopic foratomy as compared to the endoscopic, uh, as compared to other procedures. And uh, it's less invasive and more clear. So the anatomy is quite clear with this procedure. So uh, definitely it's going to be there, the next gold standard. So what are the indications for the full endoscopic for anatomy and disectomy, uh, particularly the cases uh, which have uh, foraminal or paracentral disc herniations and even larger herniations with uh, major component as a paracentral can be uh, dealt with this thing. And even the for moderate or severe foraminal stenosis can be done uh, with the full endoscopic procedures, posterior approaches. So 
the different kinds of scope can be used for this. Uh, uh, most commonly, people use 4.1, but me, I use like uh, uh, my the bigger scope. Like uh, uh, I use almost uh, the same scope for lumber as well as cervical procedures, anti cervical, posterior cervical, and lumber. And that is a diameter of around seven millimeter, working working channel seven millimeter, and diameter around nine, and working sleeve diameter around ten. So. While coming to these procedures, the, the positioning is very, very important. It's usually done under general anesthesia, and it should be done under general anesthesia. And uh, the position is very important. You need to keep the patient a little bit in the um, neck position, little higher as compared to the legs, a reverse turn up position, just to avoid raised intracranial pressure during the procedures. And uh, uh, the most important thing is about the landmarks, uh, radiological landmarks, to safely land our obturator as well as our a dilator. So we need to draw first the mid, uh, mid pedicular uh, uh, spinous process line, midline, and second is the medial pedicular line or mid pedicular line. This is a safe uh, thing uh, to land on the mid pedicular line. So in this picture we can see, and uh, in the lateral view, you should be in the direction of the disc itself. Uh, as we in the lumbar approaches, we go from caudal to cranial, but here we come from cranial to caudal, a little bit uh, um, cranial to caudal. And uh, uh, this is optional, we can draw the facet line also. And uh, so the ideal trajectory between the facet line and the disc line actually. And uh, just to avoid, uh, if, we, if we go a little bit lower, then you need to resect a lot of bone, laminar bone. And if you go from cr uh, uh, lot cranially, then you need to uh, resect a lot of facet. So just to avoid the uh, excessive bone resection, this is the ideal trajectory. It has to be between the facet line and disc line. And this is the landing of the obturator right, right at the uh, mid pedicular line. And uh, this figure summarizes almost all the steps like uh, marking of the um, uh, pedicular line, mid pedicular uh, spinous process line, and, and the lateral view also. So the surgical steps are, maybe you can use a needle initially uh, just to locate the uh, space because the most common problem in the cervical procedures is basically is the wrong level surgery and because the space is very small and so you can uh, during the procedure uh, um, uh, you can you can shift from one level to another uh, so the um, you need to check the trajectory frequently under the c arm and uh, once you reach there the the second step is to clear the soft tissue and the fascia and uh, just to um, have a clear landmarks or the bony process of the lateral pillar. And uh, while using the uh, obturator and the sleeve, it's very important not to push the scope and push the obturator uh, too much. And uh, direction has to be very, very important. Uh, it has to be in the line of the disc most of the times. And uh, the clear identification of landmarks uh, before starting any kind of drilling is very, very important. Here in this case, we can see the clear anatomy, this uh, um, cranial lamina and the caudal lamina as well as the facet joint. So this is exactly, uh, you can see here in this again, the V point of the medial edge of the facet joint is very, very important. This is the starting point of our surgery. And uh, this is basically junction of the uh, superior lamina and the inferior lamina. And uh, lateral to it is the facet joint. So this picture is very, very important. You need to ablate the soft tissue around the facet joint just to have a clear picture of this. Only then you st should start drilling. And the drilling should be started cranially and uh, then comes to laterally. Uh, toward the facet and then caudally. So here you can see in this picture, it's very clear. So the important steps are basically first the hemilaminotomy and then identification of the index level nerve root. And once we identify the nerve root, because in most of the cases after drilling the superior articular process, the first uh, drilling should be the from the superior lamina, inferior as the superior lamina, then the superior articular descending, descending, uh, um, facet, then ascending facet, and once we can visualize the nerve root, then we can see a, uh, a thin membrane over the peri uh, radicular membrane over the nerve root that has to be cleared. And only then we can see the nerve root clearly and we can identify the uh, axilla as well as the shoulder of the nerve root. And uh, how much uh, decompression has to be done for the adequate formula decompression, one need to take out a little bit of uh, descending, out, uh, descending facet, IAP, about uh, almost one third. And then the uh, resection of the SAP has to be done till the, we can identify the pedicle. And once we identify the pedicle, we can say like the decompression is complete. And sometimes uh, we, uh, in cases of disectomy, we don't have much space left um, um, to, 
because we need to avoid the retraction, too much retraction of the nerve root. So in that case, we need to have a little bit of space in the axilla just to take out the disc. So for that thing, the caudal pedilectomy has to be done and that can be done. So we can have a safer access to the disc. So this is all and uh, just would like to show a video of the procedure a little bit. Can How can I? Minimize karna hai. So here is a uh, video you can see, no? Yeah, just landing on the middle pedicle line and just clear the soft tissue and uh, this is a fast forward, little fast forward. So once you're there, you can identify the superior lamina, inferior lamina, and you can see the yellow ligamentum flavum. Then with the carison I am using, I start first taking out the superior lamina called and then the descending article process and uh, then identification of this clear v-point this is junction of iap and the sap and uh, once i take out this i can see the thin membrane over the nerve root that has to be taken out just to identify clear orientation of the nerve root its cranial and the caudal aspect And uh, this is the axillary area. Once you are there, and there, uh, you can take out the disc also just, just by retracting the root with the nerve root retractor. And here I am using the end cut burr just to uh, drill the osteophyte and disc complex. It's a hard disc, it's not a soft disc. So excessive retraction of the root has to be avoided. I, I did a little bit of pedicletomy also just to have a better assess of uh, axillary reason. Can you fast forward? Yeah, Let's sure. Just, time is getting right. It's okay, thank you. So here you can see the fully decompressed nerve root, cranial aspect as well as caudal aspect. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Very nice presentation. Very well enlightened. Dr. Santosh has given us good demonstration. I invite next speaker, Dr. Mohammad Anza, instruments in UB surgery. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the fourth World Congress, especially Malcolm Sir and Samir Sir for giving this opportunity. I'd like to speak on the topic instruments for UBE. At the onset, let me show you the basic <coughs> OR settings for a UBE surgery. This is the OR setting where the surgeon and the uh, scrub nurse are on the same side well, the monitor, the CM all comes from the opposite side. <coughs> the equipments that we use for this UB surgery is a standard arthroscopic system which consists of the monitor, camera and light source. We use a zero degree scope or a 30 degree scope. That is surgeon's preference, a standard bar. Then the radio frequency system, some specialized UB mm. instruments and the rest are the general spine instrument that we use for open surgeries. So coming to the specialized UB instruments, we use a basic dilator. These are seven, this is a sharp seven mm cannulated dilator, which acts as a direction guide for inserting the scope and also the subsequent dilators. Then we have five mm, seven mm and nine mm blunt dilators, which are similar to the ones that we use in the tube retractor set. These dilators, these help in splitting the muscles and these also makes the easy passage for instruments and saline outflow. 
This helps in creating a workspace for the RF, bar, cage insertion and instruments. <coughs> Next comes a UB muscle det detacher. This is a T-shaped bar which, which has got blunt sides and this helps in the subperiosteal elevation of muscles. And this helps in the initial creation of in, in the creation of the initial or the potential working space. Next is a universal retractor. These are semi-tubular ones and this helps in the easy passage of instruments and also keeps the patent saline outflow. The UB root retractors. This comes with 4 mm and 10 mm. This can be right sided or the left sided ones and these have got uh, grooves which are semi-tubular. These semi-tubular retractors helps in the retraction of the multifidus and this keeps the working space open. And this serves as a, an instrument guide and it also keeps a continuous outflow and this also helps in retraction of the nerve root. Next, discussing about the scope, we have a zero degree scope and a 30 degree scope. In zero degree scope, we have got a direct end on vision while in a 30 degree scope, we get a eccentric vision. This is a clinical photo using a zero degree scope and a 30 degree scope. Next, the RF system. This helps in the soft tissue cutting and coagulation and it helps in the ablation of ligamentum flavum, this, and it also helps in control of bleeding. Next, the burr or the drill. We, we can use a round diamond burr or a fluted one. This has got special uh, protective sleeves. This helps in laminotomy, laminectomy, and also for doing over the roof decompression cases of ULBD. Next, the chisels. This can be straight ones, curved or angled ones, hockey shaped ones and this helps in cutting the lamina, SAP and IAP. These are double ended retractors which comes at various angles as 5 degree, 15, 25 and 35 degrees, the width of which may be 2, 3 or 4 mm. This helps in detaching the flavum from the lamina, this helps in releasing the additions between the dura and the flavum and this helps in retracting and mobilizing the roots. And this, with this, we are comfortable to apply bone wax at the bleeding sites. And after doing an anatomy, we can enter the disc with this. This is a picture which shows the mobilization of the root using the double-ended retractors. And the other one shows the, how we can separate the ligamentum flavor. <laughs> this is an Indian knife, which is a spear shaped. And this we use for anulotomy. Next is the general suction tip, which may be 3, 4 or 5 mm. This helps to remove the bone dust. And this also reduces the pressure in case of high pressure in working space when the outflow is not proper. And this we can use as an intradiscal irrigator also. The neck, the general spine instrument sets, we make use of the carison punches, the rotating punches, the pituitary or the disc forceps and the hook. Thank you. Very well shown. I invite next speaker. Dr. Nadir. Yeah. Yeah, please. Hello friends and colleagues, um, I'm Nadir, a uh, neurosurgeon from Algeria. I'm not an Apple surgeon, I'm a Samsung surgeon. I do UB. <laughs> and as such, my presentation is for those of you who are considering starting UB, as you should, given the familiar anatomy, the excellent endoscopic view, the great freedom of movements, and the awesome technique UBE is. This is what I call the UBE box. Useful to practice basic UBE steps on a spine model. 
It will help you train your hand-eye coordination if you are not familiar with anatomy. First things you need to master is the landmarks on the C-arm. Take your time and be precise. The better your markings are, the easier your targeting will be. In making portals, care should be taken not to cross the flavum blindly. Some patients are thin and some obese. Fascia may be shallow or very deep. I use an 11 blade for thin patients and 15 for the obese. Why? Because in obese patients, the 11 blade may cross the fascia unnoticed and reach far too deep, possibly even through the flavum, whereas the round tip of the 15 blade makes it stop on the fascia. I can actually feel how deep I am, so it is safer in my hands. I always start with the instrument portal, always land on lamina, never on flavum. I always, always check the correct level with the lateral x-ray before making the scopic portal. It only takes a minute or two, but you will never ever operate on a wrong level this way. If I'm on a wrong level, the instrument portal becomes the scopic one by simply changing direction. Try to keep your hands out of the x-ray beam while checking position. UBE is the most comfortable technique I ever used. My assistant stands beside me, not across. We both stand relaxed, no neck, arms, or back fatigue. Table is on the lower point. And we both get to enjoy the screen display. Next issue you have to deal with is liquid, and a lot of it. Care should be taken not to flood the room floor, which can put staff and equipment at risk. You must also keep your patients safe and dry. So proper draping is key. Take the time to perfect it. It will make everyone happy. UB being a water-based technique, you will need to get water in somehow. Gravity is best, cheap, safe, and effective if you keep the bag at the level of your head. Water pump is next, but expensive, and only safe with low settings. I never go beyond 30 millimeters uh, of mercury, rarely. What comes in must go out. And as our dear host Malcolm explains it beautifully in this highly recommended YouTube video, it is very, very important that you maintain a flawless egress of water if you want to stay out of trouble. And for this, you may pick your weapon of choice. This one does an excellent job, but your assistant will hate you for it. I personally don't use it because it hampers the ergonomics I talked about. And I like to keep my assistant happy. This one also does the job. But in obese patients, it may be too short to get a proper retraction. This is my pick. It helps the instrument glide in and the water flow out. Simple, durable, effective. Bleeding control. As much as I really love this beautiful country, I really do hate this awful screen. So be proactive with hemostasis if you want to keep enjoying crystal clear view. Don't be sloppy. Radio frequency does a great job most of the time. If not, this will help you control any bleeding. We're all gentlemen when dealing with a nerve root, especially we, spine endoscopists. In UB, you can use your usual root retractor, but your assistant has to be very, very gentle with retraction. Its main drawback is that your instrument portal gets crowded, you lose some freedom of movement, and water outflow is restrained. I prefer using a scopic retractor. It gives me control on how much retraction I need. It frees up both my assistant and my instrument portal. There's always a possibility that you'd have to abort your UBE approach and convert to more invasive techniques. The number one reason, that pesky dural tear you were expecting the least. The good news is that you don't always have to convert. For example, you could leave this small rent unattended, no problem. Or you could use some taco seal to plug it. For bigger tears, this fancy clipper is very handy, quick and easy. Or you can always have fun stitching up the dura under the scope, but you ought to have the proper instruments, namely an endoscopic needle holder, a nut pusher, and a nut cutter or a sharp millimeter garrison punch. The smaller the needle, the better. Leaving a drain is always very wise, but without is easier on patient and staff. 
I don't put a drain in single level cases when good hemostasis is achieved. But regardless, just remember that leaving a drain is always very wise. I try to leave the smallest footprint on my patients. So I only suture a subcutaneous layer and put stair strips on the skin. I prefer cutting along the skin fibers rather than across, but this is easier to convert to open surgery if need be. In summary, the road to UBE is pretty straightforward. It is definitely easier to adopt than uniportal techniques, both technically and economically. So join in and have fun. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madir. Excellent. Very nice for all of us to learn. And we have learned quite a lot on that. Thank you. I invite Dr. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Malcolm, for providing me such a platform to present my work. Managing complications in UV surgery for the beginners. And uh, you face these problems. Uh, number one is wrong label. It typically happens in L45 and L5 as well. And you place your a scope and an instrument in the wrong way, especially in obese patient and more on the right side of surgery. Always confirm with AP view, best for localization, and lateral view only for this direction. Confirm and reconfirm the level because wrong level is not unpardonable. Initial space creation, filling of lost in between the muscle fascicles, and bleeding complicate the, your surgery. Always do radiological localization of spinal lumina junction and uh, bone is your friend to so try to remain on bone and uh, craniocaudal movement of dilator to create a wide zone speed for uh, fluid exit is mandatory and it will help uh, to clear the space. Use RF ablation, coagulation and saver as per requirement. Good saline flow and semi-tubular retractor. TCA fundal, these all instruments help you to clear the way for uh, saline effluent. Initial space creation. Bleeding. The sources of bleeding are muscle, it may be arterial bleeding from interarticular inter artery, superior articular artery, most commonly, inferior articular artery or radicular artery. Bone, especially in osteoporotic, there may be a lot of bone oozing and obviously epidural veins. Bleeding complicates your surgery and uh, it frustrates you. Muscle bleeding can be handled with good saline flow and RF arteries you have to coagulate. Bone bleeding uh, less in, di in diamond bit and low RPM drill. Bone wax can be used. Epidural bleeding, yeah, if it is good pressure and uh, good flow, then it is not a problem, but it happens. And I found it in the Wilson frame is uh, better for positioning. Uh, rolls cause a lot of chest compression and increases vena cable pressure and leads a lot of bleeding in, uh, in the end of the surgery. Bleeding control, RF. Uh, on the Dura, you should use uh, 1 to 2 power of RF setting. Use ball and hook probe for controlling the epidural bleeding. Surgical or abdial patties can be used in the, when you open the spinal lumbar junction and at the V point of uh, upper part of the ligament of lumbar. And surgical or patties can be put. Blunt dissection. Systolic BP should be around 100 mg. And normalized coagulation before uh, operation. Uh, closing outflow and waiting for a few minutes. Cotinoids and gauge pieces, these all help in uh, reducing bleeding. Remove the ligament of lemon, the last. Hypothermia is another complication which happens in initial cases. 
and uh, it depends on the draping, how much waterproof adhesive draping is there, and it should be around 10 centimeters from the midline all around. Normal saline should be at the body temperature, it should not be closed, and uh, use closed system of fluent saline drainage, and warmers can be used for hypothermia management if it happens, patient is having seabring, a lot of uh, problem. Incomplete decompression is also a common cause, uh, common uh, complication in initial cases because of uh, bleeding, surgeon's fatigue and poor retraction. Poor quality of images, huge focus and magnification of uh, camera judiciously. And do a pre-operative planning, um, planning on the X-ray and MRI. And confirmation of range of decompression, interop on CR. For a contralateral exiting route or contralateral forum anatomy, you use uh, 30 degree angle discope also. So these all uh, measures can avoid us uh, from uh, the pain of incomplete decompression. Scope damage is uh, common in initial stages and uh, when creating the initial working space, there is less space and we are not accustomed to uh, distance between working instrument and uh, scope, so there is much damage during the drilling or RF ablation. Keep sufficient distance between drill and scope. Low cost scopes are more prone to damage. And uh, keep RF at low setting. This is all drill damage. Dural tear. This may be because of hard, central hard disk, thinned out dura due to long standing compression, warp detractors, over retraction, over visibility, contralateral side are more common, and repair endoscopically if possible, patch with dura seal. For larger defect or root bulging, converted to open surgery. Other complications, nerve root injury, over retraction can cause nerve root injury, blindness uh, because of uh, uh, pressure pump and a um, lot of pressure, it can happen. Sometimes there may be seizure also because of cerebral edema and we use anti and manitol also. And retroperitoneal saline collection in para UB sometimes happens. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Wonderfully explained and shown your best technique to how to avoid and how to repair the complications. Thank you very much. I invite Dr. Ramindya Basu. He will be ex uh, showing his experience of more than 300 tubular MIST leaf and why one should go to shift to UBA empty leaf. <coughs> Dr. Basu. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to thank the World Congress organizers and especially Dr. Malcolm Pestenji for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present um, in front of the August audience. Yeah, you are. Right. Um, so, uh, like, uh, what I wanted to discuss is, I was very, I'm being very comfortable with uh, tubular surgery for quite some time now, and. Um, like suppose if a patient like this walks into my hospital and uh, gets diverted to my clinic, uh, will I mean like this kind of a patient with an instability with a stenosis, if this kind of a patient comes to me, will get one of these surgeries. So it's like uh, minimal invasive tubular tear leaf is a standard operation for me at this moment for these kind of patients. 
and uh, uh, like I've been doing it for quite some time now, for since 2018. Uh, unfortunately, during my fellowship days in UK, I did not learn in uh, tubular tail because in UK it all was it, it was all open surgeries, big surgeries, coliosis surgeries, and uh, this anterior surgeries. But nobody used to do minimally invasive surgery there, so I did not learn that in UK. But when I came back to India, it's uh, like uh, I, th I, I saw that the minimally invasive surgery is the really need of the hour. And patients demanded that and I had to learn going to different mentors and learn the tubular surgery and started adopting it and started my practice in the end of 2018. Um, gradually, ov over time, most of my cases got uh, converted to MIS TLIF and uh, now my standard practice is doing a MIS TLIF for a lysthesis or a stenosis patient who needs a fusion. So the question comes, did I need to change? I mean, do I need to change? Do I need to push myself to learn something new? And I, I really learned the MIS TLIF technique uh, hard, the hard way. I spent a lot of money, spent a lot of time going different places learning this technique. But do I need to let go this technique and learn something new for doing the same, same surgery? So this, uh, I was uh, really confused with these questions. Uh, or I was, I was thinking whether, uh, am, am I chasing the new girl in the market, the new sexy girl? Uh, is, is it that uh, UB or the endoscopic technique? Is it, the, is it that thing? So I was confused, uh, but then the question, uh, that uh, that came to my mind was is the shift too difficult am i chasing something which is really difficult but the you know the the fact that the endoscopic view is similar to that of posterior microscopic surgery and the standard instruments can be used uh, after that i really feel excited that no i'm uh, chasing something which is achievable so easy availability of the setup is really important for ub uh, for tubular tele if you need the tubal tubular set which is expensive and the microscope is also an expensive instrument So uh, some of the points I'm going to discuss for which I uh, do not like the, I mean like I, some of the points against uh, a tubular surgery, I would say, I don't like this step of burning muscles. After putting in the tube, I feel, see a lot of muscles which I burn with the monopolar or the bipolar uh, to expose the bone, the, the bony landmarks. I don't like this step of burning muscles. That is one step. Second is in UB, if you see that when we have, this is just after landing into the bone. I haven't used any cautery at this moment. I'm just about to pick up my cautery. I'm into the sound space. And you can see that the view is really good. You're, you're able to see the, see the bone very well. So, and you're working medial to the multifidus in an anatomical plane. And this is, this is and uh, my assistant is holding the retracted, uh, retracting the multifidus muscle. This step, I think uh, UB scores over uh, MIS TLIF. And again, the question is whether uh, UB ha patients have, do have really less post-operative back pain or not. There are some literatures which suggest that, but we need long-term studies to validate this result. So this is still a questionable thing. Again, posture of a surgeon, as our friend talked about it a little bit earlier. I mean, if I have two MIs still if in a day, I, my neck really hurts. The surgery, the surgery my back, back and my, and my neck my is stiff. So that is another concern, was another concern for me. Uh, so you're always standing like this when you're trying to decompress the contralateral side. So uh, an assistant surgeon, what, what he said, I think was very uh, pertinent thing. Here you can see that I'm standing like this, my assistant surgeon, he's, he cannot look, look into the microscope because not only because he's short, but the microscope is away from him. So this is a pentero microscope that I'm using, which has the luxury of having a screen. So he's watching the video on the screen. Um, so again, you can see that uh, the microscope is away from the assistant surgeon and he's watching the video on the screen. At the time when I need his help for detecting the root, it becomes very difficult for him at times. Uh, but if you see, on the other hand, the same assistant was assisting me in an UBE case. Uh, he's, he's quite comfortable, you know, he's, he's, he's quite comfortable. He can see the, and at the same time, I am comfortable. I'm, I, I do not have to lean back. I've done the decompression on the opposite side. I'm exploring the opposite side, lateral lysis and the nerve root. And both me and my assistants are comfortable. So, and the, so that, is, that is one of the plus points for me while doing UB surgeries. And again, if you look at the video of contralateral decompression, this is again another point where UB scores over uh, tubular surgery. I'm doing the contralateral decompression. And for that, I have to lean back. And again, for the contralateral decompression, when you're going into the opposite side, lateral lysis, your instruments do really struggle to go, go into the depth at times for severe stenosis. Uh, this is another video where, where, you know, the space between the bone and the ligament 
Uh, and you have to really push with your sucker at times to go into that depth and take out that ligamentum flavum from the opposite side lateral recess. Whereas in UB, the, what, what happens is that uh, the hydro dissection is there and the dura is pushed down naturally by the water and you get a fantastic view of the opposite side. Here you can see I've gone into the opposite side the amount, and I'm standing comfortably. The amount, the, you know, the ease with which I can see the opposite side nerve root is fantastic in UB compared to uh, tubular surgery. So this is one of the, uh, you know, major uh, advantages of UB, I feel. And again, the flexibility, you know, in tube, we have limited vision. And in, if you want to do, uh, see something else, you have to move the tube, move the patient, move your head, move your back, move the microscope. You know, you have to move the entire setup. But in UB, you can see that the flexibility is fantastic. I mean, you can see from top to bottom, just moving your scope and you're standing in comfortably. You can, you can uh, have a fantastic view of you know, flexibility is, is really high in UB. So, so these are the clear cut in, in advantages, more magnification, uh, more mobility, bigger working space, hydro dissection and bloodless field. You don't have to complete, constantly keep sucking. Um, and end plate preparation for uh, tea leaf. Again, is, I think this is, I'm doing the end plate preparation uh, for under a pentro microscope, even uh, which is a very good magnification. I, I cannot see that this space. I'm doing it blindly and re relying on my feeling, feeling of grating sensation that I feel while curating the end plate. So this is, you know, uh, this is end plate preparation for uh, tubular surgery. I'm relying on the f uh, feeling mainly, but if you see on the other, other side, uh, UB, this is not my video. I haven't started UB fusion as yet. I think this is from, uh, I took this video while uh, observing uh, Dr. Mankyu Park in, uh, in Korea. So thanks to him for letting me uh, take this video. I took this video with his permission. You can see the fantastic end plate preparation that was done. You can see the end plates entirely. The, you know, the, uh, uh, this gives you a feeling that you'll have a good fusion. Dr. Uh, so fast. Yeah, just a couple of more slides. UB technique, single-handed <laughs> use of instruments needs experience. And at the same time, uh, what I would suggest is experience of tubular surgery is going to be translated to you know uh, your uh, you know your learning curve of UB surgery. So that's what I feel. There are papers where uh, UB TLF and endoscopic and tubular TLF are being compared, but still we don't have good results or big papers. And again, uh, RCT is going on in clinical trials. On Gov, I can see that RCTs of UB versus MI TLF is going on. We'll await for the results and see what uh, advantages they find out. Thank you very much and the thanks to all my mentors uh, to whom I went, uh, Dr. Son and Dr. Chalali is here. He came to our hospital and uh, demonstrated two wonderful cases and I've got this picture of Dr. Malcolm. Uh, I didn't have a good one. I'll have one with him today. I came to him to learn uh, endoscopic surgery as well. Dr. Ketan Deshpande, Dr. Son and thanks to all my mentors. You know, mentors make you uh, basically what you are today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Basu. Excellent talk. As you have demonstrated the advantages and disadvantages of both the techniques wonderfully done. One should do one which is most suitable to their patients and to you. Thank you. I invite Dr. Sambhav Shah to, he will enlighten us with his posterior cervical full endoscopic discectomy approach. He's a dynamic surgeon. We have just seen his beautiful surgery. Yeah, come Sambhav. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Malcolm and the entire team for inviting us over here. It's a, even last year was a brilliant conference and I'm sure this year is going to be even better. So I'm going to be talking about a posterior endoscopic cervical discectomy uh, and decompression. Now, uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. So, Endoscopic discectomy in the cervical region, obviously a lot of people are doing it anteriorly. They're doing posterior cervical discectomies and posterior cervical foraminotomies as well. However, in my practice, I have limited myself to the posterior cervical endoscopic approach only because as I was telling you when I was operating as well, that for me, endoscopy is not about smaller scar. It is mainly to try and save as much as I can for the patient. We do a laminar tommy, we remove the, lamina is not the offending structure, but we are removing it to get the disc out, to get the flavum, 
doing a discectomy, we are removing the phlegm to go to the disc. The phlegm or the lamina have not done anything when we're talking about a simple slip disc patient. So similarly, in these situations, why do I like endoscopic, full endoscopic discectomies? Because I want to save as much natural anatomy possible and just remove the offending structure. So either it could be a disc or it's a posterior disc osteophyte when I want to do a foramen anatomy. I have ventured into anterior cervical discectomy, but to get that piece of disc which is in the canal or laterally for which I have to go through the whole disc, you know, I don't know what the future of that disc is going to be. And with ACDFs also, we take small incisions and we do the surgeries quite easily. So uh, anterior cervical discectomy has still not convinced me very much, but posterior definitely. And now we have enough evidence as well that posterior cervical full endoscopic approaches, they are doing very, very well. Now, if you see this patient, this patient had a significant left-sided arm pain. She was a 42-year-old woman and <clears throat> she had a disc which was mainly on the pointer is what button? Yeah, sorry, it's not. So anyways, the, if you see there is a left sided posterior lateral disc. So when do, what are the indications for me for doing a posterior cervical endoscopy surgery is if the disc is lateral. I don't do these for central. Obviously you cannot go from the back because you have the spinal cord. So for posterior lateral discs or disc osteophyte complexes, or any other pathology which is just below the facet joint. So this will be my ideal case for doing a posterior cervical surgery. So in this patient, we had a left-sided disc which was compressing her left C6 nerve. She was in significant pain. So most important is reading the MRI scan. So when I read this MRI, I know, for example, in this axial view, you know where the, exactly the disc is lying you know where you want to dock. So I know that I want to dock right here at the laminofacetal junction. I know the amount of resection I will need to do. I know which approach I need to take and how much, where I will find the disc. So reading the preoperative MRI is very, very important. Now, if this disc, instead of jutting out like this, was just over here, I don't think I would have used this approach. I would have then been more preferable to come in from the front like this but this is an ideal case to start off with. Now this definitely, if I didn't know posterior cervical approaches, I would have probably done an ACDF in this patient. I would have fused this segment. So endoscopy does now. I started off doing this endoscopy, but it, before that I used to do tubes. So I know the difference between a tubular discectomy versus an endoscopy. Now, usually below the facet, when we go into the epidural space, there are a lot of epidurals over there and it bleeds. Bleeding is definitely more of a problem to control with tubular or open surgeries as compared to an endoscopic uh, surgery. So it's a clear cut advantage and I think our colleague has already mentioned in the previous case the advantages of endoscopic surgeries. So for me, radiculopathy, far lateral disc, obviously a stable spine or even a disc osteophyte complex. Now, <clears throat> why this approach? Now, if you see here, if I wanted to do an open surgery, the lordosis of the neck, Okay, to expose just the five, six region, we will have to expose right from almost three, four, going down to six, seven. Only then you get the access on one side if you want to do open surgery. So a lot of muscle dissection. If you're doing with tubes, yes, it's a more cone down approach. If you're famil familiar with 14 mm tubes, better, but typically people are using 18 mm, 22 mm tubes. So the amount of dissection, the muscle dissection, as we said, for a T-lift is gonna be the same here. You're, you're gonna remove a lot more muscle uh, to approach this disc. And full endoscopic is definitely a more cone down approach. What is the right way to start this? You start from open, you go to tubes, and then you go to full endoscopic. I would not recommend anyone who doesn't know how to do tubes or have not done a foramen anatomy using tubes uh, to venture into a full endoscopic. So obviously endoscopic, it's a cone down view. There's minimal muscle dilation, there's minimal exposure. We have continuous irrigation and RF, which makes our life much more easier with regards to the bleeding. There's a minimal incision, but obviously there's a very high and a very steep learning curve. So I typically tell people you start with lumbar L5-S1 discectomies, you've done a few 30, 40 of them, you go into stenosis, go into thoracic, and then finally come into cervical spine. So 
As you see here, so we are going to approach this left sided disk. I know now on the MRI where I want to dock exactly. So that it's going to be in prone position. <clears throat> I just use, I don't use any uh, you know, horseshoe or anything, it's a normal prone position. I mark the laminar facetal joint in AP. Sometimes the C6, 7, it gets a bit difficult, uh, especially the lateral view because of the shoulders, you can push the shoulders down. I'm confirming the level again on uh, the lateral image and that's when we take the incision. This is going to be my area where I want to dock and that's below this exactly is where the disc is going to be. So approaches from the left side, so the nine o'clock is superior, this is inferior, that's medial, this is, and uh, six o'clock is lateral. This what you see is a C5 lamina. I'm using my RF to dissect it. So exactly this is what you're gonna see, C5 lamina down here, C6, and that's gonna be the facet joint. Once I have identified the facet joint, I start my burring. So it's exactly what we saw in the, in the live demonstration. The concept remains the same, the steps remain the same, but it's just better vision, I think. So once you've partly removed the lamina, and mind you, this is a completely magnified view. So I'll show you the post-op CT scan and then you will feel that the surgery has been done so minimally invasively. So now what you see here is a C6 lamina. That's the facet joint there. You can see the facet joint line. I'm burning a little bit off the facet now, which is, this is where below this my disc is going to be. Now the, another beauty of endoscopy, the minute you rotate your scope, you can see laterally underneath the facet as well. So it makes your surgery much more safe. So putting in the kerosene to remove the last flavor and a little bit of the forward. facet. Yeah. Yeah, please. Can I forward this from you? Uh, how do I forward this from you, the video? All right. So here you can see the whole C6 nerve beautifully going outside the foramen. That's where I see a disc piece. So whenever we, re we do remove this, this pieces like that, and sometimes you do, the minute you remove the disc, you do find a lot of bleeding. Now we have our RF cautery, which makes it much easier. There are fragments there just underneath the nerve. And that's the reason why the patient has so much pain. There are still fragments lying around, so you can use your nerve hook, you can use your pen field. So these were quite three big fragments which we removed, and the patient was awake, walking within two, three hours of surgery and discharge. She was discharged the next morning as she had insurance. Uh, again, a lot of literature available. So obviously the steep learning curve, inventory, we start with lumbar interlamina, start with open tubes, and I always take a consent for open surgery as well, if in case I feel that I need to, uh, you know, open up the patient again. Sorry. I think the last part of the video was a post-op. So in the post-op 3D CT I had done for this patient, there was hardly any removal of. So in fact, the, this is actually, sorry, I think I've missed this. <coughs> but there's hardly any uh, facet joint removal at all. So this is truly, I think, a completely minimally endos uh, endoscopic approach and giving fantastic results. Thank you. Thank you, Sambhav. It was really very nice demonstration. And yes, I agree with you what you say. Endoscopy is really giving us much more uh, good results than the open one. Any questions from the panelist? No. Any questions? For? Dr. Malcolm. Yeah. One question for Dr. <coughs> Santos. Uh, what, what is your tip and trick for posterior cervical surgery that stop bleeding? Bleeding and, and how to control bleeding when you do the posterior and what the proper uh, water pressure? So I don't use any pressure pumps during my endoscopic surgeries. I just keep them at height of almost eight to nine feet. So I have a hook on top of the theater ceiling on which we hang. And now we are making it automated. So the hook comes down, you put your, uh, you know, your irrigation and put it back up. So it's completely based on gravity. I think as any endoscopic surgery, I don't think it's different for a posterior cervical, but before you touch anything, we use the RF quite religiously. So before I'm going to remove, before I'm going to burn, before I'm taking out any soft tissue or even the disc, I make sure that I'm using my RF 
I'm burning that area, and only then I'm removing it. So when we remove that, this typically you see a lot of bleeding suddenly. Now I think that's the beauty of endoscopy. You know exactly where you are. You are at that time I put my RF to almost two or three, which is much less as compared to what I do when I'm just doing my soft tissue clearance. And you know the area, you know where the nerve is. So the minute you put your RF down with the probe, you don't use your pedal, you don't generate the heat. But when you put your RF and just give some pressure, the bleeding comes down. So you know that you are at the right spot, even inside the disc area. And that's when then I use my pedal to control the bleeding. Also, number two is that I use preoperatively, I all, like all of us, we use adrenaline locks, tell the anesthetist obviously to try and keep the pressure as low as possible and give a head high, especially in posterior cervical surgeries. I always give a slightly head high because if there is any bleeding, it trickles down usually. So I make it assured that the head is slightly higher as compared to the table. I'll just add a small part to it. If you're dealing with a patient of myelopathy, usually myelopathic patients come with blood pressures of around 180, 190. This high blood pressure compensates for blood flow to the cord. One advice to all of you is please do not drop the pressure by more than 15% of the preoperative blood pressure. So admit the patient a day or two before, monitor his BP chart, get a mean average pressure of the blood, inform your anesthetist not to drop the BP below 10 to 15% of the pre-surgical blood pressure because you do not want a white cord setting in. I've had a very bad experience of that. So for a disc, it's okay. What Sambhav said, you try and bring the BP as low as possible. But if you're dealing with myelopathy, you have to get used to operating at temp blood pressures of 140 and 150. Even if you're doing a laminectomy, via endoscopy or open or whatever, you have to deal with higher blood pressures. The best way, I mean, what I have seen in dealing with myelopathic patients and their control of blood pressure is just wait. If it bleeds, wait. Just let the water flow. Wait for the second bite. Don't be in a hurry. It may take a 30 seconds to take another piece of bone out or to remove some more bit of flavor. Be slow. Bleeding just stops by itself and the blood pressure is maintained. You're not worried about your patient waking up in metabolic acidosis or having a white cord syndrome. So when you're dealing with myelopathy or you suspect myelopathy of any grade and hypertensive patients, please, please, please do not drop the blood pressure. That's the advice. Deal with the bleeding with patients. Like Sambhav said, just wait. If you want, you can just touch over there and keep your probe and just wait. Don't do anything. It just stops. That's all I have to tell you guys. Uh, I'll just call the doctors who have given their talks to come on the stage once again. Uh, can I request uh, Dr. Siddharth Verma, Dr. Santosh Tripathi, Dr. Mohammad Anzar, Dr. Nadir Bembarak, Dr. O.P. Singh, Dr. Anindya Basu and Dr. Sambhav Shah to come on stage. May I please request Dr. Masato Tanaka and Dr. Pon Pavit to please come on stage to give the mementos to these doctors who have given their talks. They'll be proud to take their photographs with the best world surgeons. So I request Dr. Masato Tanaka and Dr. Pon Pavit to come on the stage for two minutes, please. And to honor these young faculty. Sir, please come on stage, sir. Please come, sir. We have Dr. Sameh, our World Federation of Spine Endoscopy Chairman also on stage with us. And can I have the photo frames, please? Dr. Siddharth Verma, please. Sir, please come here. Dr. Siddharth Verma, he is not there? Okay. Uh, Dr. Santosh Tripathi, please. Dr. Mohammad Anzar. Yeah, you're in between two, two stalwarts. Congratulations. Thank you. Dr. Nadir from Algeria. One of the bright stars of UB spine surgery coming up. He knows Japanese. There's a shock to all of us today morning. Uh, 
Dr. Om Prakash Singh, can I request Dr. Masato now to give the certificate, please? Momento. God bless you. And then we have a smart, handsome young man, Dr. Anindya Basu, roaring away in Calcutta. Congratulations. It's our honor. And lastly, Dr. Sambhosha. Dr. Sambhosha is a consultant with some of the major hospitals of Mumbai, that is Saifi, Jeslok, I think Breach Candy, and an excellent surgeon, an excellent human being. I'm proud to be his friend. Thank you. We will now continue with the next session. Can I please request Dr. Panpavit and Dr. Masato to remain on the stage, please? Sir, Dr. Masato, please. Just please help us chair the next session for 10 minutes. Dr. Panpavit, please, thank you. And um, Dr. P.C. Day, can I please request you to come on stage, sir? Dr. P.C. Day, please. Sir, please continue. Dr. Vikram. Dr. Vikram, please. Yeah, yeah. Role of tubular retractor for a spinal cord tumor surgery and prospective. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So to start with the session, uh, we uh, invite Dr. Bikram Motho Subramaniam. He is going to speak on the role of the tubular retractor for the spinal cord tumor surgery and his perspective. Uh, you stage yours now. Career. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks to the chairperson on the organizing team to give me this opportunity. And uh, we have been uh, working from the morning extra dural. So I'm just giving some, uh, my approach to intradural work, uh, mainly in the times of uh, spinal cord tumors. So as usual, we need the cavity telescope, the light source, and uh, the ideal situations for tubular retract, I mean tubular system in spine tumor is, uh, it should be segmental. If it is more than uh, two segments or even uh, more than one segment, sometimes it's difficult to approach both the things at the same sitting. And uh, preferably extradural or intradural and extramedullary. Intramedullary still, we have limitations to work on the intramedullary uh, tumors and uh, preferable if they are unilateral tumors and if it is less obese patient because the tubal size will be smaller for us to work much comfortably. When the tubular retractor size becomes longer, we have difficulty in handling the instruments in the limited space for dissection and things. And uh, image guidance availability, definitely, without which a tubular system doesn't help. And preferably hypertense lesion than in T1, T2, that means hydrated soft lesions than odd lesions, uh, which is difficult to work with uh, limited space. So, and as usual, it is less traumatic, less painful, less chance of CSL leaks or meningocele because the muscle covers it and rapid return to work. Yes, or even this has a little uh, uh, higher learning curve because of the longer uh, working channels. 
and uh, better to have uh, specific long coaxial instruments and difficult to, uh, uh, to close the dura if you have uh, longer tubes. A need to have various lengths of tubular retractors depends on the size of the patient and the whether you are operating on lumbar, dorsal, or cervical. And accordingly, the telescope size also differs. So what are difficult to uh, address are the vascular lesions, because uh, at times if the bleeding is high and uh, getting the coagulation and uh, working on to the vascular tumors are a bit difficult and hard lesions and intramedullary lesions. If you need to work with a CUSA, which is to decompress the tumor, you need to long have the longer uh, CUSA systems. The problems uh, naturally with the tubular endoscopic system, the fogging, but uh, uh, if you have the warm saline irrigation and proper uh, OT uh, temperatures, the fogging will be less. Out of focus, yes, when, unlike in microscope where you have the focal length adjustments in uh, endoscope, we do have problem with the focus as we shift from lengths. That too, if you are using a tubular retractor with a fixed endoscope, <laughs> this focusing is a problem. But if you have a dynamic holding of the endoscope uh, with a separate retract um, holding system, you may not ha have this problem. Bleeding, yes, uh, as usual, because this is there is no compressive force uh, like in UBS for uh, dynamic flow of water you do have epidural bleeding problem that you follow the same principles what you use for microsurgical method. Dural closure, yes, you do have problem with the dural closure. If you have proper long instruments, what you have seen in the morning, your working will be easier. That's it. And these are few long instruments what we use for the tubular systems. And this is zero degree scope, 25 degree scope, and uh, specific uh, tubular retractor endoscopes unit the standard tubular retractor systems. And as usual, the <laughs> image guidance is very essential. The standard principles are followed for the tubular system to locate the lamina and the location where your tumor is exactly. So this is a video which shows uh, how uh, most of you know, because most of you are doing the endoscopic units, the same dilator systems, fixing up the uh, tubular retract and uh, the standard microsurgical instruments can be used with extra long length for the assessment of the lamina and the tubes. So this is a patient with uh, anteriorly placed meningioma in the lumbar region with uh, T2 enhancement. You can see it's in the anterior space. So this is a video of the same. So this is uh, the lamina. On to your left is uh, cranial and the right the caudal. 12 o'clock is the medial end and uh, 6 o'clock the lateral end. So once the lamina is exposed after the tubular retractor, the standard laminotomy is proceeded. The epidural space is visualized. You extend the laminotomy the standard way. As usual, uh, when the endoscope is held, if your uh, assistant shifts the endoscope, you have to reorient yourself frequently and make sure that your orientation is same as the assistant also visualize it. And uh, after the exposure of the ligamentum flavum, you can see the dural sac. The fat layer is clear. And once the epidural space is reached, you do have venous ooze. If there is a tumor, definitely the venous ooze will be a little higher because of the intraspinal pressure. The thin gel foams laid on the epidural space does help you to hold the venous ooze. And the bone wax, if there is a bony bleed. So once you get the hemostasis, the standard microscopic way you use a coaxial uh, 11 blade. The uh, holder is in the coaxial phase. So the dura incised. As you have already focused the laminar exposure according to your uh, MRI and uh, CRM guidance. So once you let out the CSF, as you open the arachnoid, you will have gush of CSF coming out. Make sure that you Dural exposure is sufficient to cover the entire length of the tumor. 
the superior and inferior margins are to be exposed adequately. As soon as you open the dural, definitely in lumbar you will have this uh, rootlets popping out. But as you open the dura further, most of the time they settle down as the CSF comes out. You use the same 6-0 roll-in to hitch the dura and bring it through the tubular retractor on either side. And as you hitch the dura, the epidural ooze also will drop down and your dissection inside the dura will be much easier. So as you hitch, the visus ooze you can see coming down. And after adequate hitching, then on dissecting the roots, you can see that's the lesion. If it is a neurofibroma, generally you can gently dissect and pull it out into the uh, canal space, the epidural space. But if it is a meningioma which is attached to the uh, base of the dura, it won't move out. So after dissection, you start incising the capsule and debulking the tumor. If it is little firm, you can even use long segment CUSA instruments to debulk it. So this hitching of the dura and dissection of the roots below the dural margin helps you to keep all the roots away. And as you dissect and periodically debulk, you get more and more space. So after adequate debulking, So the tumor has been removed near totally. A small few fragments which are left over is also been dissected and removed. You can even use a zero degree endoscope, take it inside the dural space and see whether you have adequately removed the tumor. And that is the place where the meningioma originated and has the attachment, which has been cauterized and coagulated to uh, reduce the tumor load over there. So after adequate uh, removal, we are taking the endoscope inside, seeing out the root, seeing out the arachnoid, checking whether we have any leftovers. Once everything is confirmed, you bring it out. Either if you have uh, proper instruments, you can suture the dura, or you can even put a angulated liga clips to close the dura. I have adopted to use a duragen, a collagen dural substitute on lay method. So laid the dural substitute on top of it. And over the top, we laid a sufficient fat, which you can get it from the local tissue itself, fat layer and gel foam to attain hemostasis. So on top of the gel foam, I use fibrin glue to seal the defect and another layer of gel foam on top of the fibrin glue. So once you apply the fibrin glue, you, you can apply another small layer of gel foam. And as you remove the retractor, the muscles fall back and the hemostasis is con uh, attained and the muscles fall back will make sure that there is no leak. And this is the post-op image showing uh, complete removal with this uh, tubular retractor system. This is another uh, tumor uh, at little higher level. This is another tumor. So this is again post-op image. This is in the dorsal aspect. So even the intradural work we can be completely removed with the minimal uh, access. Previously, we used to do hemilaminectomy with a little longer midline incisions. And here you can see the incision is quite small and you do a uh, subcuticular work and very less chance of meningoceles or any other problem. The patient is back to work the next day. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Any Thank you. From the audience. Excellent. Anybody? I I have one question. Yes, so sir. you never suture the dura. So you it's a high, but uh, in the video. Here I have used the dura gen, but you but, can lift the dura yes. and uh, suture the dura when you have the proper uh, coaxial yes, instrument. It's a high risk of CSF leakage. It's a big issue. Uh, so 
most of the time, even with this, I don't have seen any CSF leakage because your coverage of the dura gen is much longer than the opening. And the muzzle play layer comes over and it uh, attains a good plane. So you don't get the leakage that much. But if you have the suturing uh, material and the machine, you can even do a suturing or even put liga clips, lift the uh, dura, both the margins close and use the liga clips. There is uh, endoscopic uh, abdominal liga clips, small yes, miniature ones, yes. you can apply I, even that. I know, but in Japan, we always suture the dura. No, it can be sutured. There is no question. Uh, many times, you know, uh, this duragen can be a problematic and CSF leak can occur. So if it is possible, one tries to suture or what he says is the angular clips which we use. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next talk, Dr. Jayesh. Posterior endoscopic cervical approach, discount do technique. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, uh, good afternoon, chairpersons, and uh, would like to thank uh, Dr. Malcolm for this wonderful opportunity. So, we are again discussing the posterior endoscopic cervical approach. So, lo look at this patient. This is a 33 year male, male patient having a neck pain, uh, C6 radiculopathy, classical neck pain in the right C6 dermatome, right side reflex is down and of course right side lateral c5 c6 foraminal disc prolapse see the another one 36 year female neck pain right side c5 c6 disc prolapse with classical radiculopathy unilateral disc prolapse so what what are see the, the changes in this era advanced era what 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 kind of consent we should explain in the cervical patient so first you you discuss with your patient that first fusion surgery pros and cons so pros of course conventional standard uh, classical scdf and you discuss the problem also ntr next car adjacent segment uh, risk adjacent segment disease risk is 2.5 percent per year still in this era you should also explain the options you should suggest the option of motion preservation surgery. The two options artificial replacement or you explain the posterior cervical discectomy. And of course, I believe that in this medical legal things, you, it's very uh, mandatory you give the options of motion preservation surgery, particularly in cervical spine. The problem with the arti artificial displacement <coughs> is the heterogeneous ossification rate after three year follow up is 64%. So almost you'll end up the result with the CDF that what literature says and that's why it's not remained popular. Now, if you have a, some certain indication, of course, the posterior cervical discectomy is classical motion preservation surgery. Whether you do with the tube, I, I suggest you start with the tube, start with the open, then tube, and then you should end up with the full endoscopic approach. So uh, according to me, these are the indication. Classical soft disc, Lateral and foraminal cervical disc herniation or spurs using a single level laminar foraminotomy. It, is it possible by multiple level cord compression? Of course, yes. We'll show you the couple of cases in which multiple cord compression with secondary canal stenosis can be achieved with a single incision. What are the cases in which predominant, predominant posterior compression? If some patient had previous fused anteriorly and elderly morbid patients in which posterior instrumentation is not warranted. And of course, Dr. Vikram shows the cervical IDM. Unilateral single uh, uh, cervical IDM can be approached endoscopically. Uh, let's, let's highlight some uh, anatomical point. So this is the V point we can see here. You use a tube or full endoscope. Your landmark is V point. So what is that? Adjacent superior and inferior lamina and it apex is the facet joint. This is the V point where you should land up. Now, what is the difference between the cervical foramen anatomy and lumbar foramen anatomy? You should remember that in the, the nerve root in the cervical uh, foramen, which is 
exiting above the number of same level of pedicle. So it means your nerve root will find in the lower one third of foramen. In contrary, the lumbar spine you will find the nerve root in the upper one third of foramen. And that's why it's very important. If you are starting this cases of cervical endoscopy, you should remember that your nerve root would be uh, dead vertical in your view. In lumbar, it would be a perpendicular to your view. It's very, very important. Another important thing is vertebral artery you should always keep in mind. Vertebral artery would be lying 6 millimeter to the anterior part of the disc, lateral margin of the disc. So it's, it's a close. So what is the uh, landmark uh, while you are approaching from the posteriorly? That is a lamino facet joint. So you should remember that your lamino, lamino facet joint is corresponding your, to the most middle margin of vertebral artery. You should not go medially uh, to that lamino facet joint while working deep. So for one level decompression, you have to convert this V to U. So you start with the superior lamina, then your inferior lamina, laminotomy, and you can remove up to 50% of facet joint. With up to 50%, all the literature says there will be no instability. For two level, what, con what can be the bony decompression? A one level of lamina, full laminectomy, and adjacent laminotomy. For three level, one level of full lamina and adjacent uh, half laminotomy. This is for three level. We'll show you the couple of cases. Standard, uh, I do both full, uh, full as well as tubular also. We'll show you today the Destandus technique. The midline, you should mark the incision. Usually I use the uh, neck, little bit neck flexion help to open the interlaminar space. So less and less bony drilling is required. Then just, uh, just lateral five to six millimeter one, uh, middle to the one centimeter, you mark the incision. Then this is a destandu tube. We all very well know that. Uh, this obturator, outer tube, and the inner tube. And you just start with the incision and the subperiosteal spine, paraspinous dissection done till you find the cervical lamina. And you directly land up your tube. Whatever the tube you are using, easy go, destandu, or whatever, you just land up at the V point. And this is the video. So your first endpoint should be, this is the V point we can see here, this is the upper lamina, this is the lower lamina, and this apex of the V is the facet joint here. And this is the, uh, the medially, 12 o'clock is, uh, is the spinous process. So you start with the uh, cranial lamina, then quadral lamina, never start with the middle facet joint. See, if you start the dealing with the facet joint, the only problem which I find very tiresome and cumbersome in the cervical spine is the bleeding, right? So for that, if you had done a laminotomy first, and then you have a good space, you can put a gel form there. So the only, uh, the, according to me, the best hemosis technique is put a gel form. Never try to coagulate. You put a gel form. You just, where the bleeding, you just put a piece of gel form underneath the facet joint. Immediately, it will stop. Then you, the on, other difference, this is the root. As I told you, this, this root should be the vertical. It should be vertical in your vision. And you have to drill a facet in a such a manner that your axilla and shoulder both is, should be clearly seen. Then this disc removal, your axilla and shoulder both should be under clear vision. Some bony osteophytes and what is the end point? Your, your, uh, uh, some instruments like dissectors or ball probes should be passed within end of the foramen. To dissect. So, what about the two level? So, this one is the, this is one of the patient in which patient was operated for myelotomy, uh, the uh, myelopathy. Anterior fusion has been done. There were multiple level. Then again, his patient present with the secondary canal stenosis. So, I tried posteriorly. The only difference you should land up directly on lamina, not on the V point. So, this is a lamina. You drill it, make it thin. Yeah, look at the mobility. Look at the mobility of the destando system. So that is the reason by single level incision you can approach the three level. Then you use uh, upcut rongers, and it should not be more than uh, two millimeter or three millimeter. Otherwise, you can again land up with the myelopathy. 
Now, how you deal with the bleeding? So first, as I told you, you just put a gel form, piece of gel form, and then wait. Piece of gel form and wait. You can use a surgery flow also. If still not stop, you 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 remove your inner cannula, and without endoscope or microscope, you just wait and pack. And then again, you take st start over again. So lo look at the drilling I have been done for the two level here. The mid midline spinous process is remain. For opposite side, you can use two millimeter cut, and you can do a contralateral complete two level decompression. Yeah, this is for three level. This was an elderly morbid lady, uh, more than three level anterior compression. So I and uh, did not want uh, warranted instrumentation. I done a posterior decompression. This is three level decompression. For that, one level lamina and adjacent level half lamina. So this is three level decompression. And this is the post uh, bony decompression, one level, two level, and three level. So we can see that the facet joint is completely intact, midline is intact, so biomechanics is completely intact. Superior. That same patient, uh, another patient with uh, C67 disc prolapse, single incision, of course, in female, cosmetically far better. Another patient. So what we say, uh, if we compare the PECD with uh, SCDF, so 100 patient of SCDF and 100 patient of PECD were compared. On long-term results, 4% re recurrence rate after SCDF and 6% after PECD. So clinically, no difference. Now we can also say, you know, in, in case of uh, cervical straightening of the spine or in which cervical little bit kyphosis, no lordosis, if you do posteriorly, what happened on long run? Whether there is a subluxation, whether, whether there is a progressive kyphosis, what should we do? So the year is a literature, five years follow-up. Somebody has done five-year follow-up after open foraminotomy, and they have found out there are a 20% progressive kyphosis after posterior approach. Same, if, if they have also compared in 2016, in which group of patients with cervical lordosis less than 10 degree and more than 10 degree, there were no progressive kyphosis if every, everybody has done endoscopic foraminotomy. So of course it is a safe. Why, what is the reason? Once you use the endoscope, the facet joint removal would be very, very minimal. On this study by Keem, it is 0.98% plus or minus six millimeters. So only 10% compared to a 30% if you use a microscope or open approach. That is particular reason. Of course, uh, my friend Dr. Vikram say, uh, all the single level IDM can also be approached with this, the tubular approach. So the take home message, the endoscopic decompression is one of the good alternative with equal clinical outcome and if you, particularly you are giving the motion preservation indicated in single level or multiple level in which decompress is indicated by posterior approach and uh, after you must try after crossing a long steep learning curve of cervical endoscopy it's one of my book so i here uh, i i would take the liberty to invite you for the 10th anniversary conference of the neuroendoscopy society of india it's a nasicon 2024 uh, in 28 to 30 March 2024. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jayesh. Wonderful. Very nice technique, the standard technique. Wonderfully shown. Great. We are connecting to the OT for five minutes. They're going to show us the skin marking and then we'll continue with our talks. Can you connect to the OT, please? The next speaker, please be ready. We'll be starting in five minutes. Can you show us the OT, please? Yes. Hello, Dr. Anand. Yeah, Malcolm. Can you can hear you us? Can Hello. you tell us what you have done? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So before I start, I, there is a one uh, request to the auditorium audiovisual guys. Yeah. That they keep the two-way communication live. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the problem is now this patient is under anesthesia for more than three hours. So actually, we can hold our talks for a minute or two. Yeah, sure, sure. Just to show the vital steps. But the audiovisual guy doesn't understand the importance, and he keeps on. Uh, he doesn't connect the relay. Yes, really sorry. We were in the yeah. talks, but so now we are ready. No issues. Uh, we have done a transforminal approach here. Okay. Uh, we took an entry around nine centimeters from the midline, 
and we went in almost 35 40 degrees at angle okay and we have now already prepared the end plates uh, can you appreciate the uh, bleeding end plates there yes we can see the bleeding end plates uh, there is a slight cartilaginous tissue there which uh, kiran is trying to remove so yeah. the end plates are beautifully seen yeah. the bleeding yeah they are very well prepared and now we will be putting in the cage of around 11 by 25 and we will be using a bone substitute for grafting great and some bone matrix bone marrow okay so, so now what we will do is we'll put on put in the cage okay can you just orient to me which is the uh, l4 end plate and which is the l5 end plate तेरा स्कोप जरा रीफोकस करना and now this area this end plate which you see is okay. is lower end plate of l4 okay and now this is the disc space as seen straight in front of you with two end plates parallel the red ones okay and here we are coming out now so i am in the foramen okay and this is the entire disc already prepared okay okay thank you okay so you can continue now once we put in the cage i will show you the cm pictures about the no, no we want to see you putting in the cage ah, so okay, okay. we'll right. wait for you to put in the cage right. if okay. you are ready please let us know yes yes sure i think everybody in the audience wants to see how you are hammering in a cage okay okay great <coughs> yeah so almost entire disc is prepared okay okay you can remove <coughs> super a very good afternoon to all of you i bring you greetings from the department of anesthesia holy spirit hospital i welcome all of you we have been there with your surgeons giving anesthesia to your patients so i'm going to talk to you about post operative pain management for spine surgeries it was rightly said by julius caesar in the first century that it is easier to find men who will volunteer to die than to find those who are willing to endure pain with patience pain post op pain is one of the most feared problems that the patients have 50% of these patients are inadequately treated as per meta analysis more than 80% of patients experience post op pain out of which nearly 70% have moderate to severe pain in fact they have said that nearly 8% of patients postpone surgery because of concerns of associated post op pain let us recapitulate the pathophysiology of pain so that we can treat it adequately so tissue trauma nerve injury after surgery will cause inflammation release of inflammatory mediators like histamine bradykinin prostaglandins serotonins and neurophils these activate peripheral nociceptors and cause transmission to the cns which is perceived as pain releases neurotransmitter substance p and peptides these cause vasodilatation and plasma extravasation and edema in the local area so whenever there is a peripheral stimulus like a tissue injury or surgery there is transduction or and nociceptors are stimulated these nerve fibers 
A delta and C nerve fibers carry this nociceptor uh, stimulus to the dorsal horn cells of the spinal cord. And some of these impulses pass to the ventral and ventral horn cells, which initiate segmental reflex responses, which cause increased muscle tone that we see and also reduce the GI motility. Some impulses are transmitted to the higher centers by the spinothalamic tract, and these induce suprasegmental and cortical responses, which is normally perceived as pain. So if you don't treat the post-op pain, what are the consequences? These nociceptor stimuli that are there, they cause neuroendocrinal stress responses. They cause hypermetabolic and a catabolic state. There is increased sympathetic tone, the blood glucose goes up, the oxygen requirement is increased. There's a hypercoagulable state. And such patients then become prone to myocardial ischemia and DVT. To treat pain, also we need to evaluate pain. How much is the pain? This is usually done with a visual analog scale, VAS, as it is commonly said. Here the patient is asked to grade his pain on a scale of 0 to 100 or a scale of 0 to 10. So in general, how do we treat post-op pain? We have pharmacological methods, non-pharmacological methods and procedures. Pharmacological methods are acetaminophen, paracetamol, NSAIDs, opioids, and alpha-2 agonist. Procedures like regional anesthesia, the neuroaxial blocks for spine surgery, wound infiltration, and now we use erector spinae blocks. Non-pharmacological, as you all know, music, tense, cryotherapy, the cold therapy. The analgesics act at different sites of action, right from the peripheral right up to the CNS. Let us see the analgesic ladder. The WHO guidelines to treat acute pain say that you must first start with non-opioid analgesics like acetaminophen and NSAIDs along with opioids and adjuncts of local infiltration because the pain immediate post-op is very, very severe. Then the pain reduces and then you can go off the adjuncts and just continue with the non-opioid analgesics and the opioids. Subsequently, only the non-opioid analgesics will be required. International Association for Study of Pain and WHO have recommended a use of multimodal analgesia regimens. So in this, there is synchronous administration of two or more pharmacological agents. We use different drugs with different mechanisms of actions at different sites of action along the pain pathway. This helps to lower the doses, provides additive and synergistic action, and lesser side effects. So coming to acetaminophen, the most commonly used drug, the paracetamol, it's a first line of treatment, mechanism of action, it inhibits the prostaglandin synthesis in the CNS, usual dose, 650 milligrams per orally or 1000 milligrams uh, intravenously every six hours. Maximum doses not to be exceeded, four grams per 24 hours. And to re reduce the doses if the patient has liver damage. NSAIDs, NSAIDs as you all, all know, it inhibits the COX-1 and COX-2, prevents the action of uh, the formation of prostatins and is an anti-inflammatory, analgesic, antipyretics. The commonly used ones, diclofenac, pyroxychem, ibuprofen, ketrolac, ketoprofen. COX-2 inhibitors have gone into disrepute due to their cardiovascular toxicity. You, whenever you prescribe NSAIDs, keep in mind their adverse effects and their limitations. GI ulcerations, bleeding disorders, coagulopathy, renal dysfunction, Asthma also can be precipitated with NSAIDs and it can cause allergies. Opioids. Opioids is another group, big group of drugs which is very, very helpful but can have problems. It acts on the mu receptors, kappa receptors, delta or sigma receptors. The commonly available drugs that we have in India, morphine, fentanyl, buprenorphin and pentazosine. These bind with the receptors in the CNS and peripheral nerve terminals and modulate this nociceptors. But remember the side effects. Opioids have to be used with discretion as they can cause respiratory depression, nausea, vomiting, and as I said, dependence and addiction. Local anesthetics are the, the mainstay of analgesia. These local anesthetic drugs bind to the sodium channels 
preventing the propagation of action potential along the nerves. We use them in spine surgery, especially at wound infiltration, immediate pre-op along with vasoconstrictors or immediate post-op uh, just before reversal of anesthesia. Local anesthetics are also nowadays used with as erector spine A blocks. Drugs used, lignocaine, bupivacaine, ropivacaine. Remember the maximum doses. This is very important for you. Lignocaine, 5 milligrams per kg when it is used alone and 7 milligram per kg when used with adrenaline. Bupivacaine, 3 milligram per kg. Ropivacaine, 3 milligram per kg. If you exceed these doses, Dr. you may Jayashree, land up with systemic toxicity. Jayashree, can we make it faster now? Yes. Time is Epidural up. anesthesia is the gold standard. Here we use local anesthetics along with op opioids and these are usually introduced by the surgeon under vision and then tunneled out. Every patient of epidural anesthesia has to be properly monitored. We also have PCA pumps which allows patients to receive analgesics on demand. A basal rate is delivered in a limited time. Patient can self-inject an additional dose if they want and a lock-in period is there to prevent an overdose. Yes. You can have intravenous PCAs or epidural PCAs. Last now slide. this is the erector spinae block, a facial block in which the, uh, the local anesthetic is injected along with the dexamethasone in near the erector spinal muscle. 20 ml of a local anesthetic is infused or you, or you can give it even by infusions. Dr. Jayashree, can yes. we? Yes, sir. Faster. Yes, sir. Last slide. Last. Ketamine, uh, gabapentins, these are other drugs, uh, drugs that can be used. <coughs> Cryotherapy is what you normally do. Uh, what we normally do, preoperatively, gabapentinoids, if your patient is already on that, acetaminophen may be given. Interoperatively, we use opioids, acetaminophen, wound infiltration, NSAIDs, and erector spinae blocks. So, postoperative medication, you continue NSAIDs, acetaminophen, epidural infusions, if you have an epidural catheter with <coughs> locals and opioids, transdermal opioids may be used, rectal diclofenac or tramadol may be used, ketamine, PCA infusions with tramadol Dr. and Jesse. fentanyl, and that's it, last time. Yeah, last time. So, key practice guidelines. Consider the risks and benefits of each modality. The choice of medication, dose, route, and duration of therapy should be individualized. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent talk. Very enlightening. Can we go to OT, please? <coughs> Hello? Yes. Yeah. Can you show us? Yes. Yeah, we are. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> okay, is it plug me? Karna hai thoda? Haan, plug me. Ye kidar hai? Cage. Hello, can you tell us what you're doing? What have you done? Yeah, what we have done is we have put a, a cage glider over the dilator now. Okay. And that cage glider is uh, semi-circular. It okay. is half open. So it can very well uh, show the track for the cage to go inside as well as it can adjust a slight size up and down. Okay, so now the cage is on the foramen and you're yes. hammering it in. Yes, correct. Okay. And he's holding the slider in place. Yes. Now, is the slider protecting the exiting and traversing routes? Absolutely. Okay. So that is a, can you can you focus and show the position of the uh, slider on the patient's back? Yeah, you can go ahead with positioning the cage which cage further. Okay. So you're holding the blue handle. Yes. Okay. So okay. And that's towards the patient's head end. Yes, it is towards actually the head end, and it is protecting the axilla as well as the exiting route. Okay. So you're now introducing, uh, what size cage are you introducing? Uh, 10, 1025. Okay, fantastic. You're almost there, I think. You can remove the slider now, disengage it. Yeah, disengage it. Okay, excellent. Okay. Can you show us the slider? Clean it and show it to us. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so this is a slider designed by us. It's an ESFI baby. Okay, cage is quite in. Nice. Can you push it a little in further? Yeah. Position it a little better. Yes. We'll remove it after. Can you check a lateral, please? Can you show us the depth? Uh, 
uh, can you show the AP actually? Yeah. I want to see whether you've reached the opposite medial pedicular line. Yes, yes, sure. Because if that would be the end point of your cage insertion. You should not exceed the opposite medial pedicular line. So this is nice and anterior, considering your angle. Your angle is almost 45 degrees from the median, so that's good. These were your shaver images, okay. Yeah. Wire guided shavers, excellent. So we are doing something like a A lift. And you've got the cage in. Yeah, cage is at the medial pedicular line, so I would not advise you to push it further in. Yeah. You can disengage the cage now. Uh, we will be putting in the screws and. Uh, yeah, they'll be pocketed in your screws. Yes, and then compress a little bit and then remove the cage engager. Okay, thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your demonstration, thank you. sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And all Hello. Next speaker, Dr. Deepika Shukla is our anesthetist. She will be also speaking in the same. Dr. Deepika. A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so my topic for today is awake spinal surgery leading to enhanced risk recovery after surgery. So I hope you all are awake enough. We can proceed with the topic. So today I'll be dealing with uh, the current evidence-based major perioperative considerations in awake spinal surgeries. Conventionally, general anesthesia is the mainstay of spinal surgeries, but now with the newer modalities in anesthesia, innovative approaches are being used. And secondly, um, with the uh, patients being more uh, addictive to alcohol, drug intake is increasing. With general anesthesia, the requirement of anesthesia medications is, is more, leading to more perioperative complications. So that's why uh, the surgeries are divided into minor, major, It's coming like this only. Okay. So uh, the surgeries are divided into minor, major, and complex. The newer modalities can be used in minor and major procedures with lesser duration of surgery and with one or two levels of decompression or fusions. Not for complex surgeries like major tumors. The anesthesia techniques which are used for awake spinal surgeries are basically local anesthesia with conscious sedation, spinal anesthesia, epidural anesthesia, a few cases of ultrasound guided bilateral erectrospiny block along with medications which need to be given for sedation. Multimodal anesthesia already Dr. Jayashree has dealt with. So coming to conscious sedation in which we monitor, uh, do complete monitored anesthesia care throughout. Patient is not completely knocked out. That's why it is more stressful for the anesthetist in OT. And for conscious sedation, a good amount of local should be given in the paraspinal muscle combined with the facet joint block. And we give good amount of analgesia with the Ramsey score of three that the patient is arousable and can communicate with the surgeon as well as the anesthetist. So uh, here is a um, study in 2020 for anesthesia for endoscopic spine surgery of the uh, spine in an ambulatory surgery center in which they used monitored anesthesia care with sedation. And a uh, patient was given, uh, given local along with uh, uh, monitored anesthesia care with sedation and LMA. The patients were discharged two hours after the surgery. This is a, a study in 2020, single level awake transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion. In this, spinal anesthesia was given with 15 mg of isobaric bupivacaine. And patients was, uh, uh, intra patient was completely stable. Now this uh, study deals with advantages of the combination of conscious sedation epidural anesthesia under fluoroscopic guidance in lumbar spine surgeries. 
In this surgery, 111 patients were taken and the uh, epidural space chosen was just above the level of the uh, surgical site. The exclusion criteria was if the surgical time was more than four hours, anterior lumbar interbody fusion, surgeries which are performed under local anesthesia, and surgery levels above T12 to L1 disc space, and ASA patients four and above. This is a fluoroscopic picture of uh, the local anesthesia getting uh, uh, instilled in the epidural space. The epidural space was reached with a two-hoist needle of 20 gaze. This is uh, fluoroscopic guidance has several advantages because in case of revision surgeries, we can, there are multiple additions. So the advancement of the epidural is not there. We can repeat the injection above or below the level of the uh, drug instilled. We can immediately confirm that the drug has reached the space and lower volume of local anesthetics are needed. Minimum 7 ml was used in this study. We can adjust the anesthetic level as under fluoroscopic guidance that the level is going too cranially. We can adjust the table height. We can make it head high so that it goes more caudally. And inadvertent subdural or subarachnoid injections can be avoided. In this study also they gave conscious sedation with a loading dose of dexmedetomidine followed by maintenance doses additional doses of midazolam and early doses of midazolam top-ups was given. In this study, it was concluded that epidural anesthesia with high diluted local anesthetic, they used 0.3 to 5 ropivocaine, results in satisfactory analgesia with minimal motor blockage. The criticism was that clinicians, uh, it will be uh, post-op uh, examination of the neurological function will be clouded. So uh, in a tabular form, these are the basic pearls and pitfalls of different modes of anesthesia for spine surgeries. For endoscopic transfer in a lumbar interbody fusions, if we go for conscious sedation, there will be lesser surgical duration, decreased blood loss, decreased duration of hospital stay, disadvantages will be post-op nausea, vomiting will be more, and maintenance of patient airway is a challenge. Lumbar disectomy and laminectomies can be done under regional anesthesia, spinal, as well as epidural anesthesia, provided it is two level or three level. The advantages will be increased analgesia, patient comfort will be more, there will be less blood loss, decrease in the intraocular pressure. Disadvantages, it is not suitable in patients with anticipated difficult airway, patients with coagulopathy, patients who have contraindications for regional anesthesia, and may hamper in the post-op neurological examinations. Then last, the conditions which are not suitable for conscious sedation or regional anesthesia stand alone, general anesthesia and preferred in such cases. Advantages are airway secured, we are less stressed, patient tolerance is good, surgical exposure can be increased, hemodynamic control is more, and early post-op examination of the neurological functions. But in cases of old age and cardiopulmonary function compromised patients, it can be detrimental. Now, many surgeons and many hospitals have adopted enhanced recovery after surgery protocols. Dr. Deepika, time is running out, please. Yes, sir. In 2021, so these guidelines are very important in all the spine surgeries. So under these guidelines for enhanced recovery in the pre-op period, patient counseling and education is important. Patients should know what the patient is going to undergo. Risk assessment and screening should be done prior so that we know which patients are uh, good for a conscious sedation and regional anesthesia and which patients should be taken under general anesthesia. Shortened fasting hours should be kept less than six to eight hours. Analgesia should be preoperatively started. Intraoperatively, minimal invasive technique. Can we do faster? Yes, the last yes. slide. Intraoperatively, normal volumia and normal thermia should be maintained and try to be opioid-free analgesia. Post-operatively, early mobility should be induced and early break of NBM. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deepika. Nice pearls and pitfalls you're given of various types of anesthesia.
Any questions from the panelists? <coughs> Uh, to Dr. Uh, Ken Kare. So, uh, as you know, in the United States, medical opioid is uh, the entrance of the opioid abuse. So, I would like to know your, your, your country's situation. Hello. Yes, we do have this problem of opioid abuse. Okay. So we have now going in for more of epidurals and local anesthetics agents. Thank you. I would like to ask the last speaker, uh, in the case of the fusion and percutaneous school, uh, you avoid to use the opioid, possibly, normally the the pain is quite severe. So what is the modality that you use to control the pain? Hello. So, uh, so now USG guided erectrospiny plain block is a very good modality. So it gives, uh, we are giving in our patients, it gives almost 24 hours pain relief. And we can add on with it uh, NSIDs and acetaminophen. Do you think the tancodal injection can reduce the pain? So pardon? Uh, tancodal epidural injection can can, can Epidural use injection it. is definitely good. If you are keeping the epidural catheter in C2, we can give a continuous infusion. We are doing it in our patients. So it totally depends on the you know surgeon and anesthetist. They have to decide on that. What is the modality of surgery? How much duration it is? Depending on that, we can. Uh, plan our mode of anesthesia and as well as post-op analgesia care and even erectrospiny block we can put catheters and there are studies on the net available thank you can i request the speakers of this session to please come on stage dr jayashree dr dipika and uh, our two friends from the neuroendoscopic <laughs> spine society dr jayesh and dr vikram please Please come on stage. Dr. Anta, if you can come on stage, please. Can I request Dr. Masato to please give a, a plug of honor to Dr. Deepika? Maybe Indian people are very beautiful. Even I'm beautiful, Masato. You, you, you only appreciate the women. You don't appreciate the guys. That's not good. Thank you. May I request Dr. Pantavit to give the plug to Dr. Jayashree, please. May I request Dr. Masato to please hand over to Dr. Jayesh. Wonderful talk by both of them. Really impressed. Thank you. And may I request Dr. Pan Pavit to please hand over to Dr. Vikram. We will now break for lunch. See you soon after lunch. Everybody is hungry. laptop huh?
I have I have with you in Facebook. Oh, <laughs> I know you. That's why I know you. Okay, thank you. You're a great surgeon from Japan. I know. Thank you. Oh yeah. Uh, my my is here. <laughs> Dean. Ah, Harrison Kim. I know him very well. Bim. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> It doesn't work. So, Sama, 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 could you help me? Mister, Mister, is it working? What? It's not working. <laughs>
I can come also with my own computer. Is it easy? Okay, I come with my computer own. Okay, okay. It doesn't matter. Okay.
हेलो हेलो डॉक्टर वेलकम कैन बी स्टार्ट या वी आर नाउ हैविंग द नेक्स्ट सेशन सेशन सिक्स एंड इज द वर्चुअल सेक्शन द वर्चुअल टॉक्स द फर्स्ट टॉक इज बाय डॉक्टर जीनिया इथो ही विल टॉक अबाउट not vessel plasty sorry for the mistake i hope it is vertebral plasty i was wondering i tried to look into the you know google what is vessel plasty i couldn't get the answer so this uh, typical uh, devil's error in printing uh chalo chalo kare re bab so whatever plasty japan experience dr zenia can you hear us yeah around the world there are many types of vertebral plasty and we usually use bessel x for over 10 years in basal plasty there are three major characteristic one the main approach is monopotal ex extrapedical two using a teflon mesh back inhibits cement leakage three new bone cement substance are biocompatible biocompatible <coughs> our basal plasty kit is composed from bone cement power, power powder in the syringe can i call Metatorial the chairman mesero liquid dr amit dr pat powdale and dr chalili delivery to dr amit this is an more portal extrapedical approach of the accurate bone access point that is at the supra dr. and Chalili. lateral corner of the pedicle under local anesthesia and a fluoroscope a bone access needle is inserted the cannula and the precision drill can go ahead new cement is injected in the core container mesh container inhibit to rig the cement when press cement container make large and lift up the end plate maximum volume is around 5 cc like figure cement and mesh make spicula for invasion to cancerous bone ha heat is lower than 65 degree while the pmmm method temperature reaches 120 degrees ha creates no gas which affects arrhythmia or decreases blood pressure ha cement hardness is moderate so that it is not easy to create adjacent bcf natural strontium 88 is often taken as a supplement as its characteristics is also osteo inductive the strontium incorporation in bone mineral leads to modification in the crystallinity of bone mineral this bcf was a metal calm compressed type with a vacuum in the center basal plasty restore the vertebral height preoperative the anterior column of the vertebra was compressed and the shape was the wedge after injection a new of new cement in the container restoration of vertebral height was shown shoe union make a vacuum in the vertebral body an alligator mouse was shown in the lower column and the new cement filled in the vacuum March for BCF are also treated by basal plasty. 
the upper column patient was treated for two BCFs. The lower column patient was treated for BCF. Both patients felt no pain immediately after vesoplasty. Outcomes of vesoplasty were good and pain was cured freely and rapidly. Bus of spine pain during movement of rising up and any other motion was decreased promptly. Initial pain of 10 also decreased to 3 or 4. The Japanese Orthopedics Association score increased. However, all parameters aggravated gradually a little bit after six months. Because osteoporotic patients have many problems with aging, such as less movement, poor nutrition, and incomplete medication. In the analysis of CT image, Average anterior column height of vertebral plasty has increased 18% one month later and settled at 12% two years later. Average middle column height was the most composed. After one month of vertebral plasty, average middle column height increased 23%. One month later and settled at 20% two years later. There was almost no compression of the posterior column before proceeding, and it was not changed much after vertebroplasty. The complication rate of vesoplasty was 11.7%. Leakage and the epidural space occurred in 23 cases, 2.1% with only one case of neurological deficit. There was five lip fracture cases. After two years, Jason fracture cases had occurred in 9% of the patients, the percentage of which was similar with the natural occurrence rate of the osteoporosis. There was one case of hemostrax, which was a technical error but it was in the initial stage of the learning curve. These images show cement leakage into the epidural space due to over rapid injection in the initial stage of the learning curve. Fortunately, this patient with multiple myeloma recovered without low back pain or neurological deficit. Be careful of your injection speed. Preoperatively, only T12 suffered a vertebral fracture, but one month later, T T11 and L1 experienced a vertebral compression fracture, which were treated by vesoplasty again. Jason fracture cases has occurred in 9% of the patient, which was similar with the natural occurrence rate of the osteoporosis. It is important to put them in a hard mold jacket for three months and they should be treated with medication. Conclusion Partial recovery of vertebral height. It is rarely easy to restore vertebral height. During the initial period of the learning curve, it's important to take care of control the volume, pressure, and speed of injection cement at the terminal injection. The bone cement is biocompatible. Vessel plasty is less complicated but not always safe. Osteoporosis must be treated by medication throughout the patient's life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Ito, for a good presentation. Uh, I want to ask, what is the volume of the cement you use? One, two, 
What is the viscous amount of the cement, the grade of the cement you use? And third, what is your post of protocols after the vertebral plastic? Sorry, these are all recorded talks. Uh, recorded talks sent to us by. Not online? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, second talk by Dr. Shen Venter, how to become endoscopic MIS surgeon. Uh, <clears throat> well, my, I think I was ignorant about vessel plasty and vertebral plasty, uh, but I don't know why it is called vessel plasty. Still, any 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 uh, clues from the audience, learned guests, faculty? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Angioplasty and vessel plasty. Okay. That's a good idea. Next talk. Good afternoon, India and the rest of the world. I'm Dr. Sean Fenter from Cape Town Spine Center, and I will be discussing how to introduce endoscopic and minimal invasive surgery into your practice. One of the first questions I get asked from traditional surgeons is where do I start? And it's easy to become overwhelmed when you look at this list. Um, and these are the techniques that I've incorporated into my practice, but it's not even all the techniques available to um, convert to endoscopic or minimal invasive surgery. Um, my answer usually is choose one technique, master it, and then move on to the next technique. Um, the Alternative is to start and micro discectomies and micro decompressions as a traditional surgeon because that's a fairly easy step into the right direction. Um, it teaches you to uh, work in an environment where you're seeing slightly less, but at the same time, you can open up and you can extend the incision if you are having a complication or you are struggling. It's also got the familiar air technique and the air environment uh, with a microscope. Whereas the more water medium techniques, I think that is ideal for people that's been exposed in the past to endoscopic, um, who's had a little bit of experience and who feel comfortable using both hands, one for a camera, one for a tool. For the purposes of this talk, it was important for me to look at my own learning curve and I broke my learning curve into a early, middle and late phase and I found that in my early phase, I had a lot of re-operations because I wasn't doing enough and then in my middle phase, I was having a lot of complications because I was doing too much and then in my late phase, I was able to find a happy medium where I had very few complications and no re-operations. This also then correlated with my time, um, minutes per level, which went from 87 minutes and more than half down to 40 minutes. After having looked at my own learning curve, I decided that it was worthwhile looking at the published learning curves and I found a fairly common narrative uh, throughout all these studies that I looked at. Um, when I looked at Lee et al's paper, I found that they also had an early phase higher re-operation rate, which was very similar to my own experience. And they saw it as that the surgeon was uh, having a hesitancy to com experience a complication with the combination of lack of experience as the reason for this. Um, when we look at the types of complications, a incomplete discectomy followed by a dural tear, and in third place, the nerve I nerve injuries, um, and these are mainly discitis, um, and the transient weaknesses, um, they tend to resolve. 
the literature seems to lean towards time as a major tool of proficiency, um, but I think also that the whole theatre team gets better um, and supports the surgeon better. Um, so, having said that, according to the literature, you have graduated from your learning curve after 31.8 classes, at which point you will be the David Copperfield of disc herniations. The single most important advice I can give you is to travel. Travel locally initially and get to see the procedure. Um, see how it works in other people's hands and um, there's a lot of resources in just around the corner from you. From there I would start moving on to Godava workshops. Um, I personally think that they have a limited role uh, in training but they are very valuable in training um, because they are able to upload my 3D perception of the anatomy in re relation to the equipment that I use. It helps me to determine my same zones, um, but it's not very useful in refining technique as such. Attend congresses to meet like-minded people, network, share ideas, find solutions to certain hurdles. Um, that's why this conference is so extremely important. Then. Identify a surgeon internationally, perhaps, um, that you've enjoyed listening to or seem to be a leader in the field uh, or even someone that's been recommended. Make contact and go and spend a few sessions with him. Um, first prize would be a nice travel destination and make a holiday out of it. I aim for short, powerful trips with a formal training program attached to it. Lastly, mentorships and observerships. This is usually my last step prior to implementing a new technique in my practice. And this is where I bring all my prior knowledge, uh, the Kadawa workshop 3D uh, recollection of it, and I try and polish and I try and get it all to synchronize. Um, this is where I refine before taking the procedure back to the patient. My very first case, I had my mentor uh, on a WhatsApp call and with Bluetooth earphones, he was able to hold my hand throughout the case. And I have such fond memories of Master Pesanji uh, sharing my first case with me. Now, one of the things that I neglected in my previous slide is my theater technician. This is not a must, but I can honestly tell you that my life is so much better for it. So I travel where I can with my theater technician uh, and I get to focus on the important surgical technique and he gets to um, focus on all the off-field uh, and behind-the-scenes detail. For instance, I would have never thought to ask what procedure to follow and how to clean the scope after performing a decompression for a discitis. Um, the reality is that in your first case, you don't want to think about water pressure. Prepping the theatre team. Um, this is a time that you take that you divide and explain to everyone their respective roles. Since uh, uh, divide responsibilities, it uh, but more the time importantly, we'll keep this on the time side to answer questions from and start team. the next talk. Remember, this is new to them too. Talk. About the next talk is by uh, Dr. Tariq Yazar from Turkey. It's a, going to be a virtual talk. He's going to speak on a promising post-operative prediction of decompression of stenosis in incompatible clinical and radiological images.
Can you start, Dr. Yazar? Uh, yes. Do you hear me? Yes, very yes, well. Yes. But you have you have my uh, talk uh, on your records. Yes, yes. yes. We have a PPT. You have my MPEG four. Yes. Oh. It's uh, being uh, displayed. Yeah, yes. It, does it, did it start? Yes, yes, please start. Okay. Oh my God. You have yeah, put, put on your slides? Oh. Uh, you, you have my speech, but how can I? Get the voice. Can I do screen sharing again? You please start. You please start. But Dr. <laughs> Tariq, you may just say change the slide and we will change the slides for you. It's already on the screen. Uh, yes, my image, I, I can see it. Uh, but it will start here. You can see on your computer? Yes, I have my computer with me. So we will change the slides. Yes, please. You, you can see the slides on your computer? Uh, there's a very small, I cannot see. Oh. Tariq, can you see the slide on your computer? Uh, yes, as a slide, I can see it, but I have two slides. Number one, it's on the left, and I can see myself near, near the first slide. The second slide after you is the next following slide. Oh, yeah, this is the next one yes. slide, but I cannot read. It's very small. It's not a full screen. Sir, can, can you share, share yourself? yourself? Yes, I can see myself in another no, slide. Can you share yourself? Can you share yeah, the yes. screen? Share, share the, the screen, screen. your screen. Open your PPT and share your screen, sir. OK. Many thanks. Well, this is the end of my, uh, OK. This is the end of the uh, slides. I will take the... Oh, yes. Problem? No problem, no problem. So then, go, can thank you. you. Forward? Th thank you. Ah, very good. Yeah. You succeeded. Congratulations. Thank you. Keep talking. Sir, please start. No, I am talking there. He is talking, but we cannot hear you. Can you hear? No, we cannot. No. You are. You talk. Uh, are you talking on the Wi Fi? What are you talking on? What we can do is we may go to the next one and yeah. we come back again. Would that be okay with you? 
we'll come back to you sir later we'll go proceed with the new presentation and we'll come back again to you is it okay thank sir you. thank you thank you okay okay you can you cannot hear me i think um we are going to the next talk by dr boris pavlo he is from ukraine he will uh, talk to us to have a fresh look on pld anesthesia the talk is for 10 minutes it is not a virtual talk it's a recorded talk yeah can you dear colleagues i'm glad to welcome you i represent the neurospine clinic from kiev ukraine the main areas of our professional activity are orthopedic spinal Please neurosurgery project on the biggest screen. and interventional pain management and today i would like to point you our experience in the treatment of uh, lumbar sacral radicular pain there is no conflict of interest in this work flavored drugs and product using uh, a bit of history 19 TFT first device of radio frequency destruction uh, by Cosman, uh, father and son. 1974, uh, radio frequency is used to treat of pain. 1981, introduction of special cannulas, uh, expense indications for radio frequency, and 1998, beginning of uh, pulsed radio frequency. The general scheme of radio frequency action is as follows. The active electrode is located paraneurally. The passive electrode is located on the skin above the large muscle mass. And uh, for example, uh, in the gluteal region or in the sc scapula region, after connecting the radio frequency generator uh, around the tip of active electrode, an electromagnetic field arises which has, uh, depending on the specified parameters, a ther therapeutic effect. On the right side of the slide, you can see radio frequency generator, set of cannulas, active electrode, and the passive electrode. Uh, the therapeutic field around the tip of active electrode is approximately 11 millimeter in diameter. It's necessary uh, to distinguish between two fundamental types of uh, radio frequency exposure, which can be said by the generator. This is constant type or uh, of impact and the pulse type of impact. The results of first is uh, coagulating necrosis. The result of the second is a change in electrical uh, conductivity properties of tissue. The pulse type of exposure was proposed in the mid 19s by Cosman. Uh, the generator produced bursts of pulses, bursts of pulses, with frequency of uh, 500 uh, kilohertz, with a duration of uh, 20 milliseconds, and at interval of uh, 480 milliseconds. Large intervals do not allow the tissue to hit up above uh, 40, 42 degrees of Celsius. In this aspect, the work of Erdin et al, published uh, in 2009, is of great interest. According to the received data, uh, the intrinsic ultrastructural components of axons have been found to show microscopic damage after exposure of uh, exposed to uh, PRF, including membranes in mitochondrial morphology and disruption disorganization of uh, microfilaments and microtubules. 
damage uh, is more pronounced for C fibers than for A delta and A beta fibers. Thus, the therapeutic radio frequency effect is distributed primarily to block the conduction of pain impulses. Motor and sensory fibers remain practically impact. A few words about epidemiology. Prevalence of the lower back pain in developed countries has a side of pandemic serious, not only medical, but in socioeconomic problem as well. In the USA and countries of Western Europe, the prevalence of lower back pain is uh, 40, 80 persons and the annual incidence, five persons. It's the second most common after respiratory diseases. The reason for going to the doctor and the third by the frequency of hospitalization. From different categories of low back pain, they will focus on the uh, specific uh, discogenic and uh, radicular uh, since they often coexist. The connection of lumbar pain with uh, intervertebral disc irritation was established by the Hirsch and Lehman in 1948. Uh, later, the data were refined by Nikolai Bogduk. During this degeneration, not only uh, the germination of nerve fibers in the central section of the disc is observed, but also an increase in the density of uh, innervation. In the nerve fibers of the disc in the spinal nodes, a monoreactivity to substance P was found. So at least some of the fibers and receptors of the disc are nociceptive and their stimulation can be source of discogenic pain. And inflammatory response experimental can lead to change in uh, phenotype of neurons as a result of the which most of them become nociceptive. One of the interventional methods for treatment of discogenic pain is IDEAD, a minimal invasive method for releasing heat energy into the intervertebral disc. Radiofrequency electrode catheter system, uh, disc rod or um, now flex rod, uses heat to calculate the receptive and decompress the disc. Stepwise increase in it temperature from uh, 50 uh, to 65 degrees Celsius. You can see the patient prone position, uh, the marking of surgical field, the catheter system in the integral disc, contrast discography in AP in the lateral view. In the treatment of radicular pain, a tunnel imaging method used to access the dorsal root ganglion. Mm. Tickling the C-arm beam to the ipsilateral side, X-ray anatomy Scottish dog. Our target point is under, under the dog eye, under the dog eye. You can see the patient prone position the electrode is placed paraneurally uh, with uh, dorsal root ganglion. The root is contrasted with Omnipac. Two series of 120 seconds are performed in pulsed mode at a temperature of uh, 42 degrees Celsius. Uh, all manipulations are performed the outpatient basis in the operating room under fluoroscopic C-arm control. Monitoring of indicators, vital functions carried out. The, the duration of procedure is up to 40 minutes after the manipulation and our duration is carried out. But, uh, there is a problem. Alpeutic resistant lumbar radicular pain associated with protrusion intervertebral disc. Uh, 
We published the first results of our experience. Interested colleagues from Spain, Italy, and the United Arab Emirates. Unfortunately, the coronavirus pandemic did not allow us to take part in the representative international forums last. However, our research on this issue is ongoing and we are uh, confident that we will soon provide you with the more extensive data on this issue, which will include more than uh, 200 cases. Uh, but this is perspective. So sincere and extremely grateful, I appreciate your time and attention. We would like to once again thank uh, Dr. Malcolm uh, for the invitation to take part in such a representative forum. It's a great honor for us. Thank you very much. Dr. We now call upon Dr. Mohinder Kaushal, who will be on virtual talk. He is um, from Amritsar. He is going to talk on self reinvention of the Standu philosophy. Dr. Mohinder. Dr. Mohinder, can you hear us? Uh, thank you, organizers, for. Uh, on top opportunity and uh, inviting me for this prestigious meeting and uh, requesting me to speak on a topic which is very dear to my heart, reinventing spine endoscopy, journey from distendio philosophy and beyond. Thank you once again. My gratitude to our teacher and mentor, Professor Jean Distendio. My disclosures, So I am a user of uh, spine endoscopy, posterior uh, philosophy or technique. And among posterior endoscopic systems, we have a distendio technique, which is sort of a benchmark. It relies on conventional dissection. Then we have a muscle dilatation techniques in which there are uh, systems, which is orthospine system. Then uh, we have a second generation orthospine due UV system and UV uh, technique, which is very popular in Korea. And uh, then we have uh, PSLD techniques such as full endoscopic, true endoscopic and uh, stenoscopic and so on. So talking about innovation and reinvention, you can see here how Dr. Destendu started his uh, journey as far as spine endoscopic techniques are concerned. See the prototype which he designed in 1993 and gradually he developed this technique which we are using, all of us are using today and uh, from here I have uh, uh, tried to reinvent further or to carry forward the distinctive philosophy ahead and uh, I designed a uh, first generation orthospine system, then second generation orthospine system and need to reinvent first to prevent a tissue creep which usually creeps in when we are using a uh, uh, distendio system and we have using gauze above and below which causes additional stripping of the muscles and from uh, using gauze we switch over to using a speculum even if you can see here that uh, there is a speculum with a tube and this speculum uh, I discussed with Professor Distendio and he was very kind that he uh, started using speculum in his uh, clinical cases and he uh, then uh, subsequently never used a gauze to do a retraction of the muscles. And then uh, other additional features of arthrospine tube is that uh, when you are close to the surgical target, you switch over to a saline mode. So staining of the lens tip is avoided. And uh, this is a system where you can use a zero degree and a 30 degree scope. 30 degree scopes is always there in inventory. If you are an orthopedic surgeon, there is an orthopedic department in a hospital and the scope can be rotated 360 degrees. And here suction also moves independent of the to wherever indicated. 
so just a advice to young budding uh, spine uh, endoscopic uh, surgeons that uh, you must try to understand the philosophy and principles of various techniques whether interlaminar or transforaminic and then you may have to familiarize themselves with all the techniques and choose the philosophy and the training that you want to embrace this is very very important and uh, talking about orthospine due physical features it is a classical posterior interlaminar concept and anatomy and appearance is like microscopic and endoscopic methods and uh, it's good for uh, surgeons who are already familiar with endospine technique and uh, you have at liberty to switch over to saline mode from dry mode when you are working close to the surgical target such as uh, continuous saline inflow helps and outflow helps to create a constant hydrostatic pressure which uh, gives you a clear and enhanced field of view and this is easy for uh, surgeons who are conversant with the arthroscopy or a eslg technique and you can see here when you are using the saline mode there is only a one port through which the fluid goes in and there is another working port through which the uh, fluid comes out as you can see here this is a tube and this is a sounding technique which we usually uh, do when we are switching over to uv technique you can see here how the bisinger root is approaching the tube and uh, once it go, go, goes close to the tube there is a sounding uh, sound which surgeon comes to know that it is at the right place then you can slide the scope over the bisinger root switch over the saline and withdraw this tube and start working in a uv mode so indications as far as interlaminar endoscopy is concerned uh, you can address all the pathology within the canal or a disc which is extra phenomenal there you have to land outside the pass rather than in the in the canal you have to land your tube has to be docked over the lateral to the pass so i think virtually you can do this uh, with this system all the issues which uh, all degenerative spine pathology is there are two one one resim var sadece resmim var resim kalıp altta tarih yazar diye bir tane daha kare var and resim yok tarih yazar yazıyor internal pathologies also can be addressed yes. and infections you can do a abscess drainage also or debridement also and this is a simple tamam. instrumentation if you tamam. see there are dilators there are small tubes and there is conventional simple uh, same carison punches so it is sort of uh, the assembly complements the conventional uh, uh, discectomy instrumentation or a canal decompression instrumentation and any mi system when you are using a ub fusion or a mis endoscopic fusion any mis instrumentation can be used along with this assembly and just to share with the house that indications remain same as open spine surgery here and here is a demo case there is a huge l5 s1 disc on one side it is herniated knee chest position over bolsters or surgeon can use uh, break the table also and this is the first is a number 11 knife about 12 mm in season Use then five millimeter dilator, then ten millimeters. Slide the tube over the dilator and start working uh, as demonstrated in these pictures. And uh, you can see the removal of the flavum, lateral side of the dura and the nerve root is exposed. And then you remove the disc, and in the end there is a nice, excellent view of the decompressed nerve root. You can see. And when you want to switch over to saline mode, then you there is no need of suction. and this is a endoscopic picture when you are doing a saline endoscopy so here again you can see the flavum superficial layer deep layer and part of that to be fat there is a retraction of the nerve root and then you can do a discectomy in a standard manner and here when uh, it is extra foramen herniation this is in the dry mode where we are trying to expose the uh, area later to the pars here we are using a bar to make the job little more comfortable for the surgeon and then you expose the area do the discectomy and you can see the exposed and decompressed nerve root and talking about endoscopic assisted mis fusion this is a case which i have done somewhere way back in 2015 and i have used a dry technique here and you can see these are the mri pictures this is a endoscopic decompression and after that you prepare a disc and put in the cage this is the same patient in 9 months follow up and you can see already the uh, it's a monolateral fixation and 
it's a fusion is in progress excellent fusion and patient is also very happy now i think we i have a several years follow up in some of the patients where i did monolateral fixation with the an endoscopic assisted fusion so less is always better but that doesn't mean that you do a inadequate job inside you are maximally invasive at the uh, pathology side you have to do adequate discectomy adequate decompression so that is very very important for all of us to understand small incision doesn't mean that less than adequate job at the uh, at the surgical target so this is a small incision with arthroscopy due to and this is a uv technique you can see the small uh, incisions which are very cosmetic also and yeah. post op protocol in this patient is mobilized uh, out of bed once the effect of anesthesia is over they can have a shower in the evening back access programs are started return to sports is allowed after about 6 weeks or 8 weeks and only we tell them that avoid repeated forward bending and heavy weight lifting that uh, precaution is important to avoid uh, further uh, issues such as back pain or a uh, decrease complications are the wrong level due to tear nerve disease sir? infection decrease okay. and they can be addressed there are ways to address that so this is beyond my uh, talk i, I have uh, a virtual talk you can tell your right to do your questions otherwise there are only two or three slides more okay please go ahead complications and then there are few related issues and there are rf related issues and uh, so talking about spinal endoscopy I started doing these uh, procedures in 2002 until now. I have done close to 5,000 plus procedures, and I am still uh, routinely doing these procedures wherever they are indicated. I had uh, my share of complications. As you can see, dural tears, discitis, nerve injuries, and decrease superficial bone infections. They can be addressed. There is no issues on that. And uh, just to a word about minimizing learning curve. experience and technical skill of endoscopic surgeon matters when you are learning spinal endoscopy every surgeon is not cut out to work through a tube or through a small uh, tubular feature and patience perseverance and temperament to work through narrow confines is very very important for a surgeon during early learning more time required for the procedure and complications encountered will be little greater but patience pays good idea to set aside longer operating time and have simple case selection during early learning curve so i always say there are three steps to learning visit a colleague who is doing this kind of work routinely and uh, try hands on cadavers once you build up that confidence then you do a first surgery in your theater so to summarize arthrospine due uv technique can be used in dry psld and uv modes sounding technique helps minimize uv learning curve radiation and excess tissue rf radiation and it is indigenous design thus it is very very cost effective also so Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Doctor Kaushal, for your uh, continuing innovation of techniques which are described earlier, which uh, shows your extensive experience in the number of cases that you do. Uh, can we play the Doctor Tarip? Lise açtı istersen. Tamam. Ee, paylaş şeyi. Bakın sağ üstte üstte orta üstte sağda. Ne oldu? Heh. Tamam. Ha? Doktor Tarık. Yes, uh, just now we are starting. Yeah. Şey. Şarap kutusuna at şarap şeyini. Tamam, sesim çıkmıyor ama orada. Okay, we can see your slide. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Keep going. E, ne yapacağım ben? Şu, şu şeye mi bas, şuraya mı basayım? Bastım bir şey olmadı. Ha. I would like to thank to Doctor President Pesonji because to be here is a big honor for me. Thank you, thank you, dear friend. 
The name of our paper is a promising postoperative prediction of decompression of stenosis in with incompatible clinic and radiologic image. Background and purpose. Some of the patients who undergo surgery for spinal stenosis from time to time have residual symptoms and low function and health-related quality of life for some time after surgery. When we realized that postoperative some cases are not happy after UB, we wanted to find out a promising and objective predictor for the patient's postoperative prognosis. In this way, we could determine the pathology objectively and more accurately in multilevel spinal stenosis. There is no doubt that the UB technique is not to blame. There may be errors in the determining decompression levels. Incompatibility makes it difficult to determine the correct decompression indication. She is a typical example for this topic. She had hip surgery 11 years ago bilaterally. For her, it's hard to stay in the same position. She uses a steel underwire corset, and this corset is helpful. She wakes up three or four times while lying down due to severe pain. Pain radiates to the left hip. Left thumb is worse. Anteversion of the pelvis and horizontalization of the sacrum are seen in the preoperative period. In addition, the knee joints are in some flexion. Since the bilateral hip replacement surgeries of the patient shifted the localization of the femoral heads to the dorsal, pelvic anteversion increased, compensatory hyperlordosis has developed. The lower lumbar lordosis should be corrected and the height of the lumbar L45 level should be increased and stabilization is required. The positions of the femoral heads push the pelvis anteversion. So, postoperative hyperlordosis occurred. This case, very interesting example for the is it the back or the hip topics? We can see the, our intervention to spine, stabilization of the L45, instability, and the decreasing some hyperlordosis of the spine. Postoperative sacral slope, better than before. Transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, is a good solution for this case, but uh, neurologists, they don't like to do it often because it's very difficult and time-consuming technique. Electroneuromyography was investigated for the localization of the compression with transcranial magnetic stimulation. Many thanks for your kind attention. Do you hear me? Hello? Do you hear me? Thank you, Thank you, sir, for your sweet and short presentation. Thank you.
What is the take home message from your presentation, sir? Uh, localization of the compression preoperatively uh, could be difficult to determine. There are some different uh, reasons, but uh, MIP uh, is very strong, much more better, better than the uh, somatos uh, SIP, than uh, magnetic stimulation using uh, to determine the localization of the compression is much more better uh, for the correct indication, we may approach the correct indication with this uh, technique. That's why uh, we can be more objective about the decompression levels. That's why it's very, uh, very good for the difficult cases. Does it, uh, your technique give the mapping? Of the compressive area? Yes, yes. M MIP, mapping, yes. Mapping. But I didn't do it. It's a neurolog uh, performing this technique, of course. So, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's very kind of you. Fast forward. Uh, can I just ask uh, Dr. Anand Kavi? Dr. Anand Kavi? So I'm here on the stage. Oh. Let me see, sorry. Uh, he's going to talk to us on targeted transforaminal approach to migrated lumbar disc. Uh, we thank the chairman of the previous session. Uh, can I call Dr. Pon Pabit, Siri Piran, Dr. Pravin Gupta, and Dr. Hayatri on the stage? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it being a transforaminal day, so I would be speaking on transforaminal targeted approach to migrated lumbar disc herniations. Now, especially with the beginners, uh, there is always a worry that we may not be able to tackle high migrated herniations with transforaminal endoscopy, and which is a little bit true, especially for the beginners. It is definitely a big hurdle. But if you approach it properly and if you target it well, it is very easy and very easily doable. So in my presentation, I would be just presenting a few examples, few cases. Transforaminal endoscopy can be successfully done for non-migrated and low-migrated herniations, where our primary objective is precise landing in the safe triangle of Cambin and under the base of the herniation and then excising, ablating, and washout of the pain generators. But migrated and extruded intracanal herniations pose a very great challenge even for an experienced endoscopist. What are the problems? The target fragment is usually out of your line of sight. It is in the field sometimes of the endoscope, but it is out of reach. And the anatomical obstacles due to the difficult anatomy and degenerative changes. Now we all know that migrated herniations could be in two planes. Either it could be in the vertical plane that is up migrated or down migrated herniations. And next is horizontal migrations means there could be central extrusion of the fragment. There could be foraminal herniation. There could be far lateral herniation. So how to tackle? We will see one by one. So this is a case of central extrusion at L5-S1. Now usually people are worried to tackle a big central extruded fragment at L5-S1 because they feel that due to iliac crest, we may not be able to target it properly particularly if it is central herniation. But it is very much doable. You can put the needle exactly in the center in the posterior annulus. 
And this is the diagrammatic representation of what we see in the endoscope, where we come across the tight collar of annulus through which there is mushrooming out of the fragment inside the canal. So what we need to do is first we need to identify the hurdle. So here the hurdle is the tight collar. So we need to just make a small nick in the posterior annulus. And then it is absolutely easy just by slow tugging, you can get whole mushrooming out. And this procedure you can very well do in less than 30 minutes. So we have not gone inside the canal. We have not touched the flavum. We have not retracted the dural sac. And here we are where the herniation is out done under local anesthesia. So I think these are the wonders of this technique. And there is no chance of remnant or anything because everything we see, it is just in front of you. And the results are so gratifying. They are immediate and patients are completely relieved. Coming to foraminal herniations, we come across them nearly 5 to 10%. They usually compress the exiting route. Pain is very severe in these patients, and these patients usually present with some sort of paresthesia or unilateral claudication. This is a small example where we see uh, there is a foraminal herniation pushing on the exiting route. And in the first video, you can see the patient is excruciatingly painful. And in the second video, he's completely relieved as soon as you tackle that herniation. Now, foraminal herniations, if you want to go through posterior inter uh, midline approach, it is little difficult because you will have to remove a lot of bone and sometimes you end up destructing the parts to reach the foraminal fragment. Whereas in case of transforaminal approach, it is just in front of you. So in the morning, we just demonstrated the basic technique wherein we went at around 35, 40 degrees angle. So around between 8 to 12 centimeters, if you put your needle, you are bang on the herniation and it is very easy to get it out. So here is a small video. So these are some of the simplest cases to start with for your transforaminal endoscopy career. Foraminal herniations are very simple to tackle. So once you get out your, get the herniation out, uh, the endoscopic anatomy you can very well relate with, which is seen here in the upper diagram. I'll just push a little bit. So here you can see the tip of the superior articular process and the axilla very clearly. And this is the free exiting root and the area of the dorsal root ganglion. Coming to the next type of herniation, this is a extra foraminal herniation case where you can see that the herniation is just outside the facet and pushing the exiting root in the far lateral area. This is the parasagittal image which is showing completely blocked intervertebral foramen with compressing of the exiting root. So this is the diagrammatic representation. So here the targeted approach, your target is to first identify the exiting root and put your endoscope just underneath the exiting root. So once you do that, you use the root as your guide and just rotate the cannula a little bit away from the midline ventrally and that is the fragment there. So this is the diagrammatic representation. So you put the hook underneath the exiting root, just tease it, loosen up the fragment. And get the fragment out. 
Once the fragment is out, you can see the free root. So this is nicely bulging, completely decompressed, free exiting root. And this is the post-operative MRI where you see that the fragment is gone. And almost good recreation of the foramen there on the parasagittal post-operative image. Now we consider the vertical migration. So usually uh, superior migration is between the two routes, the traversing route as well as the exiting route, because that's the area of the least resistance. So here in this video, I'm just trying to explain how the herniation has gone out. So the herniation has pushed through the area between the two routes. That is the axilla of the exiting route and the traversing route in the lateral recess. And usually this is what happens in up-migrated cases. Oh, this is the video. So first you identify the anatomy. This is the exiting route again. And you are just underneath the facet there. So usually these up-migrated fragments are anchored to the upper end plate with a small piece of cartilaginous tissue, which you need to cut to de-anchor those fragments. So once that is done, you can very well use the hook again and tease the fragment out between the space, between the two roots. So this is the CM picture of where we are actually teasing the fragment out from. And once you see the tail of the fragment, you can very well grasp it out. So this is a high up migrated fragment being removed. And here you see now the free traversing route. And that's the vacant area through where the migration was removed. Now, lastly, the down migrated fragment. Now, in case of down migrated fragment, which travel along the lateral recess, the lateral wall of the pedicle is the hurdle. So this is the base of the pedicle and uh, base of the uh, superior facet. So what we do is we do a small hole there with a burr and we gain entry to the central canal. So this is again the diagram. So here we do not go inside the disc because our target is away from the disc. It is inside the canal and down migrated. So once we create a small window, it is very well reachable and we can get the fragments out. And here we can see the completely decompressed uh, dura and the root through that window. So thank you very much. So this was a, a very small presentation. I wanted to be it in time. So I hope you've liked it. Thank you. Timely and targeted doctor. Yeah. So very much both precise. Thank you. We appreciate. Minimally invasive and maximally effective. <laughs> uh, She's there. Dr. Marisa is, is here. Dr. Marisa. Dr. Masato Tanaka will talk to us on CM free only for navigation. Orthopedic surgeon must have CM eyes. Am I right? And MRI mind. Is that right, Dr. Tanaka? Yes. Uh, 
Yes. Yep. Okay, my talk is about shear free olive. My talk is completely different from other doctors. <clears throat> Problem of conventional MIS technique, it's number one is PS placement. Number two is shear. Number three is guide wire. According to the paper, PPS, Parkinson's pedicus group, misplacement rate is more than 15%. Radiation exposure is a big issue for us. If you would like to put 10 pedicle screws, you have to use five minutes CR. Guide wire problem is sometimes a fatal complication, as you know. <clears throat> if you are all spheric surgeon, to compare with other doctors, you have five times cancer risk. You should remember that. If you are MIS spine surgeon, compare with other orthopedic surgeon, you have 10 times radiation risk because the body needs a lot of, lot of radiation compared with arm or, or leg. As you know, in 1986, there was a disaster in Chernobyl. During this accident, 31 people died. However, more than 4,000 cases were suffering from thyroid cancer. That's why we never use CR. So for lumbar interbody fusion, there are several methods. Proof is an old technique because of the risk of dural tear. TRIF is an old standard for me. And if you love this technique, but it's a very narrow corridor, in my opinion. Delif is another technique, but uh, lumbar plexus injury is a, is a risk. That's why in Japan, ORIF, oblique lumbar interbody fusion is uh, very common. It's mainly because the cage coverage rate is completely different. If you put just a little one cage, it's 13%. But for air leaf from lateral, you can put a big cage. So maybe you know the indirect decompression. Let me show you the concept of this. If you put a huge cage from lateral, you can reduce spongial stasis and restore neural foramen and also reduction in annular prolapse. If you compare with T leaf, all leaf is much better. Step one is preoperative planning. Only left side approach is recommended because of the IBC. Location of the area crest and lower rib is a uh, main concern. And the plate should be vertical if you would like to use CR. Check the position of psoas muscle because it's a high risk of uh, 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 number plexus injury. Step two is patient position. As I said, light lateral deductus position due to IBC. Table should be break to open up the disc space. And then approach the uh, retroperitoneal space, external, internal, transverse abdominal muscle, and then retract the petroleum. And then for disc preparation, use curet, laps, and linkuret. In Japan, we use allograft and, and uh, uh, artificial bone. Let me show you the video. First step is put the reference frame and then take CAT scan. Now I'm using uh, uh, navigation. Very small skin region, just three centimeter. And then approach the L45 disc now I cut the disc, huge corridor compared with Cambin triangle. 
and then all instruments are navigated. This is navigated instrument. Cage is also navigated. No sea. And then percutaneous pedicle screw is also put in the lateral position. Very small skin incision. And then another guy is putting the pedicle screw with percutaneous way. After putting the screw, then the load is also inserted percutaneous way. This is post of the x-ray. We perform a comparative study, OLIF and MIS leaf. We measure especially foraminal enlargement and critical evaluation. This is a result. Actually, the clinical result is very similar. However, if you look at the surgical time and bar loss, OLIF was much better than TLIF group. And if you look at foraminal height of OLIF was enlarged significantly compared with TLIF. Now we can perform simultaneous OLIF and PPS. One surgeon perform OLIF, another guy will perform PPS like this. Let me show you the video. Now, <coughs> assistant is putting pedicle screw like this. And then, front side, I'm using the navigated curve like this. If you perform this technique, two level interbody fusion, just one hour and a half, less blood loss. If you look at pedicle screw, precisely inserted. Uh, we already reported, so if you put pedicle screw in a lateral position, you can reduce 30 minutes. If you perform simultaneous technique, you can reduce one hour. This is a spinal deformity. So several vertebra was already fused. One solution for this condition is asymmetrical PSO. We also perform a PSO. However, it is a lot of time and a lot of blood loss. According to the paper, so massive blood loss, more than 2,005 milliliter. And if you perform PSO, it's a high risk of neurologic injury compared with OLIF. Our solution is CM-free navigated lateral osteotomy. Let me show you the video. Now I'm using the navigated osteotome without SIA. And then this is navigated curve. And then cut the contralateral side of the cortex, release the body, body completely, and then put the cage without SIA. This is pre-op, this is post-op. In Japan, we have a lot of this kind of patient because we are now suffering of grain of the society. So for elderly patient, big surgery is not allowed, as you know. So we perform MIS fusion. So first stage is five level OLIF, and then one week later, PPS, like this. Let me show you the video. First stage is anterior CM-free OLIF technique from L1 to S1, five level OLIF. Now I'm doing drape, draping. In Japan, only allograft is that allowed. That's why we always take uh, iliac bone and the CAT scan. Now this is registration. All instrument is navigated. That's why we don't have to use SIA. Navigated shaver. Navigated call and curet is also navigated. After that, we put PPS like this. This is post-operative x-ray. 
we perform a comparative study, OLIF fiber and T leaf fiber. We measure the uh, angle, L5, S1 angle, and height. If you look at the result, if you put the olive cage, because we open the disc, open the disc and cut the ALL, that's why we can create good low doses compared with TRIP. This is a result. Take home message of my talk is CM cream olive technique is beneficial for patient and spine doctors in terms of radiation problem. Natural osteotomy for adult spinal deformity is one of the best solution for fused lumbar deformity. CM free olive fiber is a novel technique to create excellent L5 S1 low doses compared with T fiber. Thank you for your attention. Tanaka, for such a uh, informative and uh, so many in, uh, newer um, techniques and for telling us that you can do much more. I know the time is a big issue for now, but <laughs> I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, we also using the OR navigation. Yes. It's very uh, useful device, okay. But uh, my question is, uh, you know, the multiple roots also can cause uh, the different problems. Some bleedings, ecchymosis, etc. The, the other problem is uh, how can uh, uh, managing the accuracy problem during the surgery. Even in open surgeries, we are putting the, the telescopes very strongly, but sometimes we can uh, lose the accuracy and need the additional uh, work. The last question is, if you have a central or lateral stenosis uh, with the deformity, is it possible to do this surgery uh, without any uh, decompression? Thank okay, you. Well, the last question. So, uh, indirect decompression is achieved only 95%. We perform 5% or direct decompression, like uh, TDF or something. And uh, have you ever performed ORIF? So compared with Cambin Triangle, it's small, but the Orif Corridor is very big. And it's uh, actually, I, I said, I don't use SIA, but I can see the, the anatomy directly. So, and blood loss is very less. It's not likely. Thank you. So you do a complicated surgery to a very small incision. Yes, yes. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Because it's MIS. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, could I now call upon Dr. Harshavardhan Rao Rani? He is the Vice President of Surgery Center. He will talk to us on full endoscopic stenosis decompression, out and in technique, and technical consideration. So I would uh, like to thank uh, Professor Malcolm Pastunji and team for inviting me uh, to the, this prestigious event. And I will be presenting my uh, work uh, in a full endoscopic stenosis decompression. 
the out and in technique, uh, what are the technical considerations? So we have already published this uh, technique in the advanced technique of endoscopic lumbar spine surgery. And uh, I will be uh, describing the, uh, or trying to summarize in the nutshell the technique uh, through my talk. This will be my content. And uh, so starting with the rationale of uh, uh, endoscopic stenosis decompression or any uh, type of endoscopic spine surgery, the spine surgery has evolved over a period of a time, uh, not only to minimize the skin incision, uh, but to minimize the damage to the posterior vital structures, which are the facets, uh, uh, posterior ligament complex and the paraspinal muscles because uh, we know this is the cycle of the uh, teri uh, the the uh, what we can call fail back syndrome where the trauma to the posterior ligament complex or the trauma to the facet joint which can give to the iatrogenic instability the trauma to the paraspinal muscle is equally uh, 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 important uh, because uh, it can give to the persistent low back pain this is the 50 year lady uh, mri which was operated one year back for the tubular decompression at l4 l5 but we can see at the end of a one year also there is a persistent of a uh, uh, muscle edema uh, all across from l1 to l5 in the steer image so uh, so we try to evaluate the uh, paraspinal damage which is caused by the uh, endoscopic stenosis lumbar decompression so we measured the uh, paraspinal cross sectional area of erector spiny and the uh, uh, the multifidus muscle and also we try to uh, uh, evaluate the fatty infiltration scale through this uh, paper and we found no difference in the pre op as well as one year post op surgery so there was no uh, damage as well as uh, there was a very minimal fatty infiltration at the end of one year uh, after the ESLD. So uh, coming to the main topic, the indication and contraindications are the same, just like uh, uh, other techniques, the uh, mainly the central and the lateral recess stenosis, which is principally caused by the central and the paracentral disc herniation, facet and ligamental hypertrophy. As well as the other pathologies like the facet cyst or the ligamentum flammum cyst can be tackled through the same technique. The only contraindication is a gross segmental instability uh, and the, in the case of a severe degenerative scoliosis where uh, it becomes a difficult to uh, starting from the docking as well as the decompression. So AO has come up with a uh, nomenclature for the endoscopic science surgery technique. I will not go into details of the rate. So the, uh, the knowing the layered anatomy of ligamentum flavum, it forms the principle of the outside and in technique. If you will see, there are two uh, layers of the ligamentum flavum, the superficial layer where the fibers are the loosely arranged, haphazardly uh, arranged and they are attached to the margins of the upper and lumbar, lower lamina. We can see uh, on the upper endoscopic view. Uh, while the deep layer is a contragular sheet which spread across cranially caudally and attached mainly on the ventral surface of the lamina. The innermost layer is mainly only the vascular uh, layer and uh, it is mainly a vascular, uh, it appears wing, uh, pinkish in the color. So uh, the surgical plan, uh, technique or the surgical planning starts with the uh, knowing the uh, the, the X-ray, uh, I uh, routinely perform the AP as well as the uh, flexion extension X-ray to rule out this instability. The AP X-ray is mainly used to know the, uh, the, the width of the interlaminar window, which is more important to know the amount of bony decompression is required to do a uh, outside end technique or the endoscopic stenosis decompression. The, in the lateral view, I prefer to see the, uh, the height of the uh, disc space as well as the orientation of the disc space. The MRI, the MRI is the mainly uh, 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 thing which we need to see is the uh, the 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 sub laminar and the sub uh, uh, the sub facetal extent of the ligament of flevum, the thickness of a ligament of flevum, which we need to see in the preoperative MR. Uh, in the axial view, we need to see the, uh, the the orientation of the facet to know the mainly the safer decompression or the safer level of bony decompression we can do uh, in the uh, endoscopically. Also, the spinous process orientation is equally important to know the mainly the um, um, the width of a interlaminar window. I prefer to go from the convex side of the uh, uh, deformed uh, lumbar spine. 
so this will be my surgical uh, the endoscopic setup uh, so i prefer to do uh, all the uh, cases the stenosis cases in the general anesthesia because it gives uh, excellent comfort to the patient as well as me it also uh, if the patient is not uh, uh, suitable for the general anesthesia the, uh, it can be done under uh, epidural anesthesia i prefer to break the table but the uh, there are controversies to uh, to whether to break the table during the endoscopic stenosis decompression that is the another topic of a discussion so uh, if you see uh, 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 as compared to the normal interlaminar approach we where we do directly dock over the interlaminar window uh, in ulbd or the esld we prefer to dock over the uh, the facet ligamentum flavum junction we preferably call it as a v point or uh, the the caudal tip of the inferior uh, inferior articular process so um, so bony decompression, uh, any type of endoscopy, even arthroscopy, we need to start uh, with the fixed um, surgical landmark. So for me, uh, it is a caudal tip of inferior articular process, uh, which we also called as a V-point. And I will prefer to, uh, to do a drilling, start a drilling from the IAP, and I will go up to the spinal lamina junction. Then in sequence, I will follow the uh, drilling to the spinous process base, which allow me to uh, go on the contralateral side. Uh, then I will come from the tip of SAP to the caudal lamina. The contralateral drilling depends if the, whether the, uh, the, the contralateral facets are equally hypertrophied or not. The end point of the bony drilling is the free until we see the free margins of a ligamentum, fil uh, ligamentum phlegm. So uh, we have already discussed this in the chapter uh, as the full endoscopy, the bony drilling is the most important thing. So uh, in the bony dr uh, drilling, we need to do uh, two types of manure. One is a rocking or the, uh, uh, we need to, uh, as the b -well is the fix, we need to rock the endoscope to reach the all the corners of the interlaminar window. And another is the, uh, the rotating uh, maneuver. So this is the uh, maneuver which I am following. One is a, a ro rocking movement where the bevel is act as a hinge which is resting on the facet and uh, uh, by the rocking movement or the rotating movement I can reach all the corner of the, uh, the interlamina window. So uh, uh, after the, uh, uh, what will be the end point of the bony drilling is the free margins, we are seeing the free margins of the uh, uh, ligament of phlegm. Uh, once we will see the free margins of a ligamentum phlegm, the, uh, the ligamentum phlegm is detached or elevated from the under surface or the ventral surface of the lamina or the facet by this uh, type of a uh, uh, probe or we can use the curved dissector or the carison punch so that it can be freed from the, all the attachments or the ventral attachments of the, uh, 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 all the bony attachments. Dr. Aurani, your time is up. Okay, sir. Uh, so, uh, so contralateral decompression. If uh, uh, if necessary, we can go to the contralateral side. I will just show one video only. So, this is a representative case where 65-year female she was having low back pain with a uh, right side radiculopathy, predominantly the claudication and SLR positives. She was having the mainly the uh, the the right side complaint. So, this was the ULBD right side approach where I'm uh, dissecting the the uh, the interlaminar uh, the muscle which over the ligamentum they were finding out the tip of the cranial uh, caudal tip of the inferior articular process i will start the drilling from of the iap and i will reach up to the spinal laminar junction so this is the iap drilling i will reach up to the spinal laminar junction and with continuation with that i will uh, drill the base of the spinous process so uh, this uh, as we see, there is a lot of uh, under uh, under attachment or the ventral attachment more on the cranial side. We need to drill more on the cranial side as compared to the caudal ends. Uh, end. So uh, the the rest of the things, uh, the lateral recess decompression can be done, carried out with the carison punches, and the, all the ligamentum phlegm can be resected and block. So if necessary, the disectomy is uh, required, it is uh, carried out and uh, the contralateral decompression carried out by tilting the scope on the opposite side. Okay. So I'll uh, jump to the, my last slide. Uh, 
So yes, the out and in technique of ESLD provides the safe and effective method. It provides the all the type advantages of uh, endoscopic spine surgery like a uh, uh, lesser intraoperative blood loss, minimal soft tissue damage, and uh, early post-op recovery with the preservation of a uh, spinal stability. The longer operative time and steeper learning curve is the only hurdle uh, while acquiring this type of a uh, uh, technique. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aroni, for excellent. Uh talk and showing us the technique and technical consideration. I will now call upon Dr. Mohit Sharma. He will give us tips and tricks and techniques of interlamina endoscopy. Dr. Sudhir, keep ready. The next talk. Good afternoon uh, for the organizing committee. Thank you for calling me on the stage and letting me give this talk. Uh, so, the common problems and challenges faced in interlaminal approach and their solutions, I'll be discussing on that. When do I choose between an interlaminal versus a transforaminal approach? So usually interlaminal approach is restricted for me in my paracentral disc cases. It can be done at any level. For lateral disc and central stenosis has, has a comparable result. Uh, familiar for surgeons shifting from conventional decompression to microscopic decompression, then coming to interlam interlaminal decompression. Though it is technically more demanding, but if you once master it, you start loving it. Transforaminal approach is for foraminal, extraframinal, huge central herniations and levels from L3 to S1. And if you're going for an L5-S1 level high, uh, huge disc, you need to be familiar with the trans like approach also. It has a steep and an easy learning curve. When coming to interlaminar, we get a flexibility. We have a viewing angle of 15 to 25 degree, and that is what we are trained from. Being spine surgeons, we are trained to see the shoulder completely. We are trained to see the thecal sac completely. Whereas in transforaminar, we are just parallel to the thecal sac. The viewing angle is 25 30 degree, but then the to and fro uh, angulation is only 3 degrees to 5 degrees. The instrumentation that you need to always have with you is a 4.1 working channel, 5.7 mm wide working channels for stenosis cases, disc forceps, kerosene punch, pen fields, flavin analog are must. RF cautery should be there with you. You should have a better cautery so that you can have adequate hemostasis in the early cases, a diamond burr, bone wax, and curates. Now for the entry point. Medial entry point is preferred for ipsilateral decompressions. Lateral entry point, if you, want, if you feel that there's a center stenosis and you have to go to the contralateral side, it is preferred that you go have a lateral entry point in the interlaminar window as shown. You need to understand your anatomy very well. You can go through videos available in the internet. You can, have, you can thoroughly go for category courses and get a fine movement of your wrist and hand so that you know where you need to land up. Now you can see the skin marking. Once I'm doing the skin marking, I imagine the laminar junction and where I'm going to have my entry inside. And then I dock my, uh, I take my needle and then dock it further. So the insertion of cannula over the dilator, the dilator should create a single facial plane. It shouldn't be creating multiple facial planes. It should be actually at a junction of the spinal laminar and the flavum junction. It should dock with stability and always use an AP view to see your placement. Positioning of your hands. When you're doing your early cases, you need to position your hands very comfortably. Coming from a microscopic decomposition and then going for interlaminar surgeries, you should know that you have to rest your arm and for resting an arm, I use a technique by using my C-arm, making it lateral so that I can rest my right elbow over there and I can comfortably do all the manuals on my left hand. You need to avoid fogging in the early cases. Have a proper C-arm cover, a, a proper camera and a scope cover. And your little finger and the thumb does all the to and fro movements required. So you can see the movements. This is the variability we get with the interlaminar approach. Burring has to be in a fixed pattern with flavum intact. I do my burring before doing a flavectomy on the ipsilateral side. Some people prefer doing it after doing a flavectomy also if required, but I try to do, I do, try to do my burring in, uh, prior to the flavectomy. This is how your burring pattern should always move. Your hand should be in a C-directed pattern. You need to identify the structure, then your extent of decompression has to be accurate. It should be from the superior tip of the ascending facet till the inferior pedicle and the middlemost part. Once you find your range, you see the epidural fat, always try to go to the lateral border of the nerve. Bone bleeding should be cauterized at this point. 
your irrigation height should be 70 to 100 centimeters usually from the surface. I don't use any pumps because this is the adequate amount of height and irrigation flow that I get. And try to tell your anesthetist to keep a lower blood pressure. I'll go through this short video. Achieving adequate hemostasis is the first in the early stages. Once you find your rent, you can do your flavectomy next. Once your flavectomy is done, complete flavectomy on the lateral side. You can easily see that once the rent is made, the epidural fat and the bleeding starts to occur. Then you have to complete the flavectomy over there. Once you reach that complete the flavectomy, try to reach the lateral border of the nerve, find your disc, probe it out and hook it out to see an adequate decompression. So what are the common challenges faced once a person is starting his interlaminar approach? Non-ergonomic position. Position is not correct. He, he faces a lot of problems by positioning his hand. So you have to have a correct positioning and you can take rest on the CM on your right elbow. Irrigation, light, scope problems. Dissemble the parts and see prior to the surgery that your scope and camera are all good and they are doing well. See your irrigation height. And try to keep the pressure, lower blood pressures. Map of 70 to 75 millimeter edge is very good. Wrong position, bad rotation and depth of endoscope is the second, third most common problem. Correct management of rotation and depth has to be there. Some people say, I don't see anything because you do not try to achieve hemostasis in the early stages of your surgery. Heart calcified disc. If you, see, if you see that you're going to have a heart calcified disc, use your burr. Do a burring which has to reach laterally and try to increase the bone resection. You can use face mills, you can use osteotomes, for, and you can also use wider channels so that it becomes more easier for you to do. Difficult retraction of nerve root, always try to reach the lateral border nerve and you'll be able to go beyond the shoulder. If you see a dural dent, small dural dents are usually not, you don't need to do anything. You can use glues and also you can leave them. I try to take deep skin, uh, deep tissue uh, tight closures and then take a skin closure to it. If there are larger rents, root louts are coming out, try to put them back. If you're not trying to, if you're not able to get it, go back. Don't shy away. You can go for an open procedure and seal the dural rent. The take home message from this is, it, 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 uh, interlaminar approaches is less damage to the normal anatomy, less blood loss. It has quicker recovery. It reduces the post-operative stay. It is easy and similar for conventional surgeons to come and with definitely comparable results and it's a safe and effective procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. For a very excellent uh, lecture showing us the challenges and how to solve possible solutions and suggestions. I now call upon Dr. Sudhir. He will talk to us the challenges he himself faced in his early practice and uh, how he solved them. A very good afternoon to everybody. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Malcolm for uh, inviting me for this wonderful conference here. So this is a 56-year-old female uh, who came to us with severe neurogenic claudication and back pain radiating to both lower limbs. And uh, this was what we were doing. And this, was, uh, this is considered as the gold standard for this amount of uh, stenosis in these patients. So while uh, most of us are discussing the uh, tips and tricks and techniques of uh, how to do each and every technique, uh, I would uh, like to describe and discuss the challenges which we face during our early experience uh, while doing endoscopic spine surgery. Myself, I'm Dr. Sudhir from Chennai. And uh, so now, uh, when we think that this much amount of incision and open wide decompression is required for these kind of cases uh, to a stage where everything can be dealt minimally invasive when we think about it. The first question which arose in most of our minds a couple of years back is how it's, it, is it possible or is it even possible at uh, the wildest of our dreams? 
then we had the learning process we all know we go through various learning process like reading various textbooks but for endoscopic spine surgery that alone is not sufficient as most of the speakers described here we have to undergo various cadaveric courses we have to undergo life surgery courses etc and we know that the learning process in case of endoscopic spine surgeries and mis is very steep so this is uh, the first case and uh, this is what i did l45 uh, discectomy uh, after doing discogram transforaminal lumbar discectomy under local anesthesia and uh, this was done and obviously after the first case we all get the feeling that we did it and this is going to be the next step and immediately we found that the patient had residual pain and during our initial 5 to 10 cases the chance the recurrence was high and residual pain was persistent in most of the patients so the next question which arose in our mind is is it even possible to go ahead with this or should we stick on to what we are doing and what is best in our hands so the other most important challenge that we face most of us is that our uh, number of surgeries and we tackle different type of pathologies starting from degenerative trauma deformities infections everything in our clinical setup unlike in western countries where they focus on one particular technique throughout their career the next most important challenge we faced was the inventory so when you ask for a quote for a complete endoscopic system we all know how much it costs so initially we had lot of issues in procuring that but we have to understand that when we become confident of our procedure then all these things becomes very easy the next challenge we, which we faced was convincing the patient especially down south when you uh, tell uh, the patient about a new procedure that you are going to do under local anesthesia you have to, though we may talk that uh, doing it under local anesthesia is very easy for the patient they are scared about the pain which they will undergo during the procedure and we face this a lot when comp when we uh, actually convinced our patients for endoscopic spine surgeries so what we did was we discussed with our anesthetist and we started using dexmedetidin in all these patients and currently we are coming up with a paper for the same and this is one of the articles which was published the quality of conscious sedation using dexmed and according to this paper the surgeons and anesthetists had a high satisfaction rate with conscious sedation while satisfaction with sedation was scored approximately 8.5 in among the patients and it was very safe and effective to treat sciatica and it yielded high satisfaction rates so then we made sure that our indication has to be very specific when you are dealing with endoscopic spine surgery so we chose our patients with positive straight leg raising test when the leg pain is more severe than the back pain radiating pain with or without neurological deficits and sufficient treatment conservative treatment and it had failed and always the radiological findings we all know it has to correlate with the clinical symptoms and signs so this is the anesthetic protocol which we use we use midazolam on mg iv along with fentanyl 10 to 20 microgram per hour iv and we routinely use dexmed 1 microgram per kg infusion over 10 minutes followed by 1 mg microgram per kg per hour infusion and local anesthesia we use 0.5% bupivacaine and we use ga for full endoscopic interlaminar and ube so the next step was full endoscopic interlaminar discectomy however we all know that those who have practiced uh, open surgeries or microscopic surgeries interlaminar discectomy is quite easy compared to the transforaminal lumbar discectomy so this is one of the uh, first interlaminar discectomy and uh, this particular step was very difficult for uh, us when you try to retract the nerve root over the huge prolapsed prolapsed disc fragment uh, and we encountered two dural tests during our initial 20 cases and then gradually we found that it has to be done very gradually and in a sequential way so this is another one of the technical challenge which we faced during our interlaminar endoscopic discectomy so our series is total number of cases since august 2017 was about 108 of which 54 were transforaminal approaches and 49 interlaminar approach recently i've started ube in the past couple of days i mean maybe two to three weeks and i've done five cases the hospital stay for almost all the patients on an average is two days and blood loss is negligible the total duration of procedure as such it started from two hours and now it has reduced to about 30 minutes when it comes to interlaminar endoscopy and transforaminal the residual pain was present in nine patients recurrence happened in six patients and all these six patients were during the initial 20 patients after that the recurrence was not there however post-op dysesthesia was one of the complications which we find even now but the uh, rates have reduced significantly infection was in two patients and dural tear as i said it was encountered in three patients 
when we went through the literature, we found that the post-operative dysesthesia following transforaminal decompression, it should be expected in about one-fifth of the patients and foraminal stenosis and recurrent herniated disc surgery are considered as potential risk factors for post-operative dysesthesia. And now we have uh, been doing this uh, ULBD using tubes and uh, this is how we do. You do contralateral decompression using unilateral laminotomy and we have started using endoscopes as well along with this procedure and we are coming out with our early results. So from our experience, we found that yes, it's very much possible. It's not even that hard if you know what you're doing. So to conclude endoscopic spine surgery, we all know that it has a very steep learning curve. We should go through the steep learning curve and we should not try to jump over, follow the learning process step by step. We have to follow the technique which is best in our hands. We may attend so many conferences, but only one or two techniques will be very good in our hands and I think we have to stick on to that and we have to keep updating ourselves and open always open whenever you have difficulty we have opened a couple of cases during our initial period and less is always more thank you Sudhir best results in best hands with the best technique and best they know um, uh, Dr. Sudhir just stay on stage please may I ask Dr. Uh, because of the previous session, that is uh, Dr. Masato and uh, Dr. Harshavardhan, Dr. Mohit Sharma, please to come on stage and receive their mementos. One scoliosis guy to the other guy. Uh, Dr. Anand Kavi, please. May I request Dr. Hayati to please give Dr. Anand Kavi his. <laughs> and now Dr. Masato Tanaka, one Olif master, one scoliosis master to the other. Thank you. Harshavardhan Ravarani, please. Dr. Mohit Sharma, where is he hiding? And Dr. G. Sudhir. I thank you, chairpersons. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, please. We'll start now with the next session. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I am the chairperson of it. And I asked Dr. Masato to be with me again on stage. Dr. Tanaka, I am asking you to climb up again. May I request Dr. Hayati to come with his talk and uh, Sir, you please conduct that. First of all, Dr. Hayati will talk to us on planning strategies, not at single level, but multiple level stenosis. That's getting more and more complicated yeah. now. Huh? First of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Pestonji and organizing committee and the speakers. It's became uh, annually. We are um, every year coming to India. And also, the, there is a big uh, cooperation between the many uh, the societies. So thank you for all the, the chairmen and uh, when I see the time, limitations i omit its um, some uh, slides so if you feel the some uh, <clears throat> uh, 
Okay. Please forgive me. Okay. Okay. As you know, uh, I will give you some basic information for have to remember about the uh, stenosis. You know, spinal stenosis is a complex phenomenon. It's starting from the, the disc pathology. When uh, the, it starts, we will see the radiologically. Then the first joint arthritis and the yellow ligament thickenings, vertebral body osteophytes. And it can, all these can cause the metameric uh, circumferential instability. Then we see the stenosis. Uh, it is very common problem and uh, we have many uh, uh, tools for uh, the solving this problem actually. The first thing, you know, in the first step is generally we are applying the, the conservative treatments. If it is not work, we can uh, have uh, many of other techniques surgically. Open surgeries, microsurgery, endoscopic surgeries. If you look at the literature, there are some problems actually, because we know that the stenosis is not an alone phenomenon. It has many other problems uh, accompanying by this the, 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 uh, the spinal stenosis. But we've seen very high surgical results. When we compare the, our own cases, we have some suspicions about the literature, because we know that the drawbacks, I think, it's we know that uh, the, there is no specific clinical assessment tool or scoring system for evaluation of the, the, the cases. And elderly cases have many co uh, comorbidities, arthrosis, other joint problems, and uh, there is no strong evidence-based uh, studies in the literature still. So to get good result is not so easy because of comple this complexity. So the planning and strategy is very important, especially in the endoscopic surgeries. We have to make good diagnosis for this. The patient assessment is the first step, of course. Examinations, orthopedic examinations or neurogenic examinations important. Radiological assessments and injections, if you need, maybe, as the talk, the, the doctor, uh, target Tarek Yazar, the electromyophysiological uh, studies can be important. The, the big issue is the defining the, the responsible level or levels. For this, we have, uh, we need to know about the dermatomes, myotomes, and uh, sclerotomes, and all the, the, the these uh, uh, Topics should be assessed, should be uh, assessed together, and also the other important things is the muscle conditions of the patient and also the functional tests. We know that the, the claudicasia is the cardinal uh, physical um, the finding in the, the this patient group, but it can be uh, comes from the vascular sources and neurogenic, metabolic, and orthopedic problems. And as I said before, there are many uh, the uh, clinical assessment tools is completely similar to each other, and still we need the very wide assessment tools. So in the planning, we have to find the target point or points. For this, we have to consider the age, gender, heredity job, health conditions, and the patient habits. For the planning, we need the very uh, thin or very um, good uh, uh, radiological uh, workups. For this, we have to assess the alignment, deformity, instability, degenerations in MRI. We have to see the facet joints completely, disc, nerve roots, muscles, everything. And in CT, bony structures and the assessment of the disc material and uh, the ligament calcifications and dislocations or subluxations of the facet joints and bony quality should be assessed. In this, uh, in this pathway, we have some pitfalls. For example, the arthrosis is a big issue. It, the patient has also, besides the, the spinal stenosis, 
The patient has also coxarthrosis, knee arthrosis, intrapelvic entrapments, fatigue failures in the lumbar segments. And also we can have, we can face with the, the vascular problems, lymphatic circulatory problems, and many of other neurogenic uh, disorders. Also, we know that the characteristics of the lumbar spine stenosis, it can be single located, it can be multi-located or multi-segmental. For the strategy, definition, the main or related causes is important. Then we have to make plan for additional interventions, stabilizations, injections, radiofrequency applications, or maybe we need uh, more than one or two level decompressions. Uh, and the consecutive decompressions can be important. And maybe we need uh, using multiple techniques, posterior plus uh, foraminal or transforaminal techniques. This is a sample case for you. There is no instability, but very comorbid case. And we did the after surgery you see in the, the immediate uh, CT, it's ugly uh, picture, but now you see the level by level, we did uh, complete uh, decompression. But it was the main problem was in the, the four, five, but we add three, four and four, five as one, because uh, there are many uh, other uh, segment problems. And here we did S1. And the second case is very important. We did before about three uh, months ago, we did uh, three level UBE decompression, but we seen the L4 and L5 radiculopathy after surgery in right side. When we look at again in the, the detailed radiographies, we seen many problems, L4, 5, S1, L5, S1, the right side far lateral uh, stenosis. So, and you see here, we did additional decompression for this. After two levels uh, far lateral decompression, the patient became pain free and the functions completely uh, recovered. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, I will give you. Precise, uh, succinct lecture. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, you know the the vertebral segments has uh, the the stabilizers. In posteriorly, we have to uh, protect the posterior capsulo ligamentous complex. Then we have to protect the facet joint and we have to be about the uh, disc or inter uh, discal uh, problems. If you be sure about the posterior capsule ligamentous complex and facet joint integrity, and if you have some uh, uh, osteophytes or spontaneous, spontaneous uh, fusion, you can do uh, multiple uh, intervention in same segment. One question. Uh, in Japan, we have a lot of this kind of double, double crush region. It's a L45 lateral stenosis, L45 stenosis and L5 S1 lateral stenosis. Then the symptom is L5 nerve root. So how do you distinguish the, yeah. this? This condition it's very difficult because we know that the nerve roots also can uh, supply from the the other levels there is no unique uh, the, the the neurogenic uh, the uh, uh, distribution so actually we are trying to make the, the dermatomes sensitive and motor innervations in the physical examination and also you can uh, apply the, the uh, injections, but also injections sometimes can cause the mistakes. When you do the L5-S1 injections, maybe 
you, the patient can be completely pain-free because of uh, the common fibrils uh, can uh, supply the same areas. It's very difficult because of this, if we have a very strong tools, which is we are using the, the endoscope, we are trying to do a possible points decompressions. Thank you. One observation that I have seen in my practices that in patients with stenosis, usually multi-level stenosis involving 3, 4, 4, 5, and 5S1, the L5 nerve root need not have double crush. It can even have triple and even can even have four crushes. It can be crushed by an axillary disc at L4, 5, traversing when it is in the lateral recess, especially at its bony edge of the uh, S1. So that is where it gets trapped. It can get trapped in the L5 S1 foramen and it can get trapped extra foramenally also. So there is no clear cut answer, but there has to be a surgical planning. So when I'm dealing with multiple level stenosis, I start with the four five. I check whether the disc is a causative factor, then work upon the lateral recess, cut the upper part of the L5 lamina by two or three millimeters to check the exit of the root, whether that is free. Because that is the point where you have a bone behind a pedicle on the side and a vertebral body in front. So I want to open up that particular C arc to make sure that the traversing route of the L5 is open over there, sir. And then if I suspect that there is something wrong with the L5 S1 foramen, I go extra foraminally to track the route from there. So therefore, I check the entire route from its birth at L4 to its passage at L5 S1 out. It takes some time. But that is the only way that you can be sure that your patient will be pain-free post-op. Thank you what, so much, sir. What is the point of uh, suspicion? Sir, so multi-level stenosis this, and uh, foraminal stenosis, lateral stenosis, central stenosis, all it's seen as a one mess at that time. No, is it on the table or before uh, you... Pre-operative planning. It's part of the pre-operative planning, sir. Uh, could I now you, call sir. upon Dr. Uh, Zope? Dr. Zope? Dr. Nilesh Zope, please. He will talk to us on UB in multi level lumbar. No? He's para going to UB. speak on para UB. All right. Para UB in multi level stenosis. Am I right? Okay. You don't like stenosis. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah. 
good afternoon myself dr nilesh first of all thank dr malcolm sir for providing me this opportunity today we are discussing about para ub dextectomy what is para ub <coughs> it is equivalent to endoscopic will say approach indication foraminal and extra foraminal pathology from l1 to s1 just discuss about case 50 year male right side anterior thigh pain no improvement with conservative treatment this is a mri picture showing l3 l4 right side foraminal and extra foraminal disc herniation now what are treatment option posterior midline approach with tilip yes i understand but why just only for disc removal you have to cut facet and fuse it will say approach i don't know and i don't have courage to ask at this moment to anyone to teach me it will say approach transforaminal discectomy yes it is possible but not for a beginner and it is something a procedure we are learning for only for extra foraminal and foraminal disc herniation that might be negative point with transforaminal discectomy para ub is comfortable you can use para uh, sorry ub procedure for all lumbar spine pathology surgical steps skin marking mark midline mark the disc space mark the base of spinous pro sorry base of transfer process of upper and lower level your skin entry portal is at base of transfer process of upper and lower entry level and you should triangulate on dors dorsal surface of facet and pars dissect the tissue after going inside try to find out superior lateral corner of inferior pedicle and walk along the lateral edge of sap move cranially if required bur some amount of lateral part of sap enter in the axilla use rf probe to clean the axilla check your position under image this is a discectomy you can see the fragment popping out and right side image we are removing the fragment let's see and this is the pinkish nerve root which can which can see after decompression if possible let me check this video is running or not yeah this clearing of soft tissue working in the axilla this is the disc fragment popped out now we are grabbing the disc fragment and removing it now we are trying to retract the nerve root in the axilla this we are on the dorsal surface of nerve root this is the nerve root which is implant advantage minimal soft tissue damage minimal bone cutting no arteriogenic instability no need for fusion thank you thank you dr zope for a new technique para ub in your hands it looks so simple Uh, could I call now the next speaker, Dr. Sigdem Mumku from Turkey? Please come. She will talk about bipodal endoscopic spine surgery, its pitfalls, and early learning curve. Thank you. 
Hello. <laughs> uh, hi, dear colleagues. Uh, I, 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 my name is uh, Dr. Çiğdem Mumcu from Turkey. Uh, I am a neurosurgeon. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be part of uh, this amazing Congress. Uh, today, uh, I will present uh, biportal endoscopic spine surgery, uh, pitfalls and early learning curve. Uh, the basic principles of UBE are uh, creating potential cavity, uh, making triangulation and adjustment uh, of saline flow. Uh, unlike the uh, joint, absence of natural cavity on the lamina uh, makes surgery a little more complicated. Uh, that is why creating uh, a good workplace is one of the uh, essential components of UBE surgery. Uh, UBE can perform uh, in the cer cervical, thoracic, and lumbosacral spine uh, uh, for different pathologies. Many degenerative spine cases can be operated by uh, UBE. Uh, there are many benefits uh, uh, of UBE, including uh, less tissue trauma, less bleeding, uh, less postoperative pain, and rapid recovery time as compared to open spine surgery. Also, free handling, excellent magnification, and the same steps as microsurgery, which makes it easier uh, to learn in the training process. Uh, UBE has a long learning, a relatively long learning, uh, learning curve. Uh, if the surgeon uh, is experienced with open spine surgery, uh, familiar uh, surgical steps may not be difficult. Uh, for the beginner, uh, especially making initial working space, keeping uh, uh, saline uh, outflow, controlling epidural bleeding, uh, and bony drilling uh, are challenging, uh, uh, and they require more practice. Uh, beginners should choose a simple discectomy by the left side approach in earlier phase, uh, which may reduce the difficulty of practicing. Uh, applying zero degree endoscope at uh, the beginning may help the surgeon uh, adapt to the UBE surgery more quickly. Uh, additionally, standardized training program and practicing uh, on the models or cadavers are of great help to shorten the learning curve. Uh, skin marking is very important to successful UBE. Uh, under fluoroscopic guidance, uh, to uh, get true AP view uh, to ta target level is vital. Uh, after radiologic landmarks are identified on the AP view, uh, two entry points are made uh, uh, 1 to 1.5 cm above and below the intervertebral space on the medial interpedicular line. Uh, also, two second incisions are made horizontally and second incisions uh, should be a little longer in order to make free outflow. Uh, uh, both dilators are reached the spinolaminar junction, uh, passing through the multifidus triangle. Uh, our goal uh, is to reach to uh, this point without crushing or over-extracting with any muscles and also expand it with blunt dissection. If there is not enough experience in creation of working space, uh, this will lead to extension of operating time. Uh, for beginners, uh, one of the most basic pitfalls is difficulty of triangulation. Uh, the surgeon starts uh, with a fluoroscopic uh, guidance, uh, although uh, most of this step is uh, done mainly by feel. Uh, to do uh, initial successful work uh, space, uh, two distal portals must be formed at triangle on the lamina. Uh, this triangulation has been related by the distance uh, between uh, the in the, uh, incisions. If you make incisions uh, far from each other, it's very likely uh, to uh, it's very likely that you will uh, not see uh, your instruments. 
if you make incisions too close each other, uh, your instruments get blocked or fighting in space. Uh, so distance uh, between two incisions must be two to three centimeters. Um, uh, for UBE, uh, excellent hand and eye coordination is required for surgeons. Uh, the experience is quite similar uh, to playing a computer video game. Uh, if you don't uh, have ability like this, in the early phase uh, of learning, uh, the instruments may be lost under the endoscopic uh, view uh, and uh, even enter the wrong intervertebral space for the reason of multiple roots. Um, a correct placement of the endoscope in uh, an instrument is required uh, for a safe procedure. Uh, also, uh, we talk about a triangle uh, is addressed to the uh, spinal laminar junction for paramedian approach uh, to, to the laminar facet junction for paraspinal approach. So identification through the endoscope of the spinal laminar or laminar facet junction is critical for starting the bone drilling. Uh, maintaining, uh, maintaining continuous fluid irrigation is another most important factor in UBE. For this, uh, arthro pump can be used under the pressure control. Uh, optimal hydrostatic pressure should be uh, kept uh, about 30 to 50 millimeter mer mercury, or a natural pressure due to gravity uh, can, be used, uh, can be used also. Uh, water outflow on the skin inc incision must be checked uh, during surgery uh, to avoid in increasing epidural pressure. Uh, if the flow is stopped after inserting of instruments in the working canal, uh, a little cut of fascia under the skin should be helpful. Uh, another common pitfall is running into a bloody field. A small bleeding during UBE may complicate uh, the surgery and operation time uh, extent, mainly from uh, struggling against uh, blurred vision. In this case, uh, it is not recommended raising or squeezing uh, the salimbeck for high flow because it may lead to over increase of the epidural hydrostatic pressure. Uh, in most cases, continuous saline irrigation uh, helps control of bleeding. Um, additionally, if we move the endoscope deeper and uh, closer to the, to the pathology, we can get a clearer, clearer view. Uh, another, uh, uh, usually the epidural van bleeds, but we can freca frequently see arterial bleeding uh, that comes from uh, segmental artery. If it bleeds, we will see the screen uh, red cur curtain. Um, the epidural bleeding can be uh, more effectively managed by RF. Uh, also, we can use bone wax, gel foam, or hemostatic agent. Uh, agent. Uh, systolic blood pressure uh, should be kept at 100 millimeter mercury. Uh, Uh, now uh, I would like to uh, I would like to show some video uh, for the beginner. Uh, anatomic orientation of the interlaminar area area is important. We should know uh, where is cranial site, where is uh, caudal site. Uh, after that, targeting on the spinal laminar junction uh, is one of the main uh, main keys for the orientation. Uh, at the initial step uh, for interlaminar approach. Uh, this area is the safe zone. Uh, after identifying it, uh, then soft tissue is removed by RF uh, around the interlaminar area to create a working space. Uh, hemilaminectomy. Uh, Hemilaminectomy is performed uh, using high speed bar and kerosene punch. Uh, uh, the bone drilling begins uh, from the spinolaminar junction and lower portion of the lamina of the superior vertebra until detaching the ligamentum flavum. Uh, uh, however, uh, uh, however uh, during laminectomy, uh, it is necessary uh, to be very careful to keep the drill in the endoscopic view uh, center constantly. A uh, kerosene ranger must be manipulate, manipulated very carefully to avoid uh, dural tear, uh, but uh, not blindly bite. Uh, the, the bone uh, drilling 
uh, must be completed before removing the uh, ligamentum flavum. Uh, the ligamentum flavum is carefully dissected and safely splitted uh, with a minimal resection. Uh, you can see in this video. For the discectomy alone, uh, we preserve uh, the ligamentum flavum uh, as much as uh, possible. Uh, now I will show you another video. Uh, the um, axillary and shoulder area of the transversing root uh, nerve root are expo explored uh, to confirm the position of the herniated disc. Then the annulus fibrosis is uh, insist by dissector and then the herniated disc is removed by uh, forceps. Uh, the RF probe is used uh, hemostasis. Uh, then the skin incision is closed. Uh, insertion of minimal drain is performed uh, be uh, before skin closure is uh, uh, closure if hemostasis is not enough. Um, Yeah, uh, in the early learning period, uh, we can face some uh, complication, uh, uh, dural tear, root injury, incomplete decompression, hematoma, and infection can be seen. Also, at the beginning, uh, proximal uh, uh, and contralateral, okay, so last uh, slide. Um, uh, Complete hemostasis and blood pressure management during the surgery are important for the prevention of epidural hematoma. Uh, uh, as a result, uh, UB is a safe and innovative technique under the excellent. are useful for uh, shortening the learning curve. Uh, some complications could be expected in early learning curve. Uh, more attention is uh, required for the beginner to use instruments uh, carefully in this technique. Uh, for the beginner, making working space, uh, keeping fluent saline outflow, uh, control of epidural bleeding, uh, and successfully bone drilling may be challenging and may require more practice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Seisho. Dr. Sigdam, your presentation was excellent and very clear and very educative. Could I now call Dr. Shah? Shai Shah? He will talk to us on Corda Equina Syndrome, UB approach. Uh, his talk is going to be UB in multi-level uh, lumbar stenosis with severe lumbar degenerative disease. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be talking about, is this on? Excuse me, is this on? Yeah, yeah. Come back. yeah okay. So I'll be talking about UB in severe lumbar degenerative disease, multi-level lumbar uh, disease. 
Uh, I think Dr. Hayati has already explained about the planning and the execution of the surgery, UB for you know, multi-level degenerative lumbar disease. So the operative dilemma in elderly patients is always the disease is very uh, quite advanced. There are multiple comorbidities, anesthesia related complications, surgical complications. Um, we need to take all those uh, all these things together and uh, make a plan for that. So what are the options for surgical management? Generally, we, uh, uh, I'll, be, I'll not be talking about the uh, approaches. I'll, I'll just uh, talk about the decompression surgery or a fusion surgery. And the options for anesthesia are local anesthesia, general anesthesia, epidural anesthesia, or uh, recently uh, erector spiny block as well. So I'll just jump off to the cases as the uh, operative planning and uh, management has already been discussed. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the few cases that are in, when, when we see these cases in our OPD, there's always a dilemma that what, what, what should be done, what should not be done. Uh, I mean, uh, I generally think that uh, I, I just pray to the God, uh, these cases do not come again to me. So this is a case of 84 year old male, severe left lower limb radiculopathy since two years, uh, leg pain more than back pain, epidural injections given twice by a pain, hypertension, diabetes, uh, patient has undergone uh, a PTCA. Uh, the patient has a normal neurology. You can see um, bilateral, I mean, uh, left sided L4, L5, and L5S1 severe foraminal stenosis. So, now considering comorbidities of these patients, there are multiple options that we have in, uh, in our basket. One, one might fuse this, uh, fuse this patient, one might do a uh, para UBE. So, I went, went ahead with the para UBE approach for L4, L5 and L5-S1 left-sided uh, foraminal decompression. So this was, these are the CM images. I docked uh, over the SAP. My uh, docking was on the SAP, uh, left-sided L5-S1. And this is the interoperative CM image. I'll just show a short video. I'll just show the end point of the uh, surgery. I'll, I, I won't show the whole surgery as you, you've seen para-UB already. So this is the video. This is the root that we can see, and I'm uh, going to the axilla of the root and uh, removing some, uh, if, if there are any fidus fragments or anything, to check whether the root is free or not. So this is the patient and his video. This is uh, three months post-op. There's one more case, uh, uh, an 82 year old female, uh, low back pain with bilateral lower limb radiculopathy since four years, diabetic, hypertensive, ischemic heart disease, leg pain more than back pain. Patient had a vertebral compression fracture of L1 10 years back. Patient had a THR operated five years back, which, was, which got infected. And uh, uh, presently the patient is, with, this is the patient with me, with multi-level decompression. I don't know what might be the plan. Uh, but I was quite confused in my OPD. I went ahead, uh, counseled the patient that I'll, I'll do as minimal as possible for you, um, but you need to be ready for another surgery as well. Luckily, it went well. I did a three level, uh, L2, L3, L3, L4, L4, L5 uh, endoscopic decompression. I put on the uh, patient with brace for six months uh, and the patient is doing good. She is able to do her uh, household activities and at least I'm not cursed. So this is the X-ray flexion extension. I, I know, I think, uh, I, uh, I was, I mean, I mean, many of us would even fuse the patient, but I don't know where, where to end, for, end this fusion uh, because L1 fracture is already there. L2, 3 need to be fixed. L, L3, 4 also requires uh, stability. So I did this three level decompression. Uh, she's six months post-operative. I just uh, saw her last month. She's doing good. Not great, but good. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, one more case of 72 year old female, low back pain, bilateral lower limb radiculopathy since two years, leg pain more than back pain. Uh, she has a left THL weakness, uh, severe claudication. She, she cannot even go to her loo uh, bathroom. Uh, she's a diabetic, hypertensive with BMD minus 3.5. These are her flexion extension views. Uh, these are the MRI images, L3, L5 is sacralized, L3, L4, L4, L5. Severe degeneration. 
uh, you can notice a, a little instability over L4, L5, uh, which might be a stable, I mean, on X-ray we can see it is not that, that unstable, but uh, the list is there. So uh, I did a two level decompression. Uh, 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 somehow I, I found a conjoint root. This is just a video so to show that root, uh, nothing else. A conjoint root, which I found interoperatively at the last level, L4, L5. This was an incidental finding. I went on uh, to see the MRI again, but I, I couldn't find, I'll show you the actual images, but because the stenosis was severe, I couldn't find any uh, uh, significant, uh, this thing that I could have find, found the conjoint root over there. I think we have a last talk of this session. Waiting. Dr. Warfarat, I believe. Dr. Warfarat, please, the stage is yours. One last. Dr. Warfarat is going to talk to us about hybrid endoscopic TLIF using a foraminoscope in a UB style. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Walapot Pichan from uh, Thailand. Uh, thank you for having me. First of all, I have no conflict of interest. And today's my topic is uh, hy hybrid endoscopic t uh, using bipartial technique by using a fluminoscope just a uh, 3.7 millimeter working channel. This is my topic content. Endoscopic tea leaf and why hybrid and surgical technique and obstacle. This today I emphasize at uh, surgical technique. How about lumbar interbody fusion? As we all know, indication for fusion like this, instability of spine. And how about lumbar interval diffusion? We have a uh, from anterior to, to posterior, many of procedure. And this state of treatment from conservative to open fusion surgery. And how about transformal lumbar interval diffusion? We have open T leaf, MAS T leaf, as we know, and Michael and endoscopic t -leaf. Endoscopic t -leaf, we have two techniques, uniportal endoscopic t -leaf and bipartal endoscopic t -leaf. This has advantages and disadvantages from both techniques. And why uniportal uh, provide, we provide us for uh, direct performing uh, at, at the site, we performing, we, we can uh, uh, make a procedure and instead, instead of an education system, free movement and RF uh, frequency is uh, suitable for the nerve, but have many of cons. Poor uh, upward gap taking, weak RF and disectomy more difficult, blind shot uh, for case insertion and camera heavier, and need more uh, spacious tools and more expensive. And how about uh, bipartial technique? Many of uh, roles like a strong catheterization, more bone graft taking and uh, easy. Uh, disectomy under visualization and case insertion under visualization. 
and we just uh, use a primitive tool. But about the cons, uh, of course, the, the education system, and you need to uh, skill for uh, UBE technique, and the RF is harmful for the nerve. And why hybrid endoscopic T-lift? Will it be uh, able to take advantage from both techniques? Hybrid T-lift? Okay, of course, direct performing site is stand of uh, irrigation system, strong consolidation, and uh, we have both of uh, strong and uh, gentle of uh, the RF. Uh, bone graft uh, taking more easy and this preparation easier. Case insertion and visualization. And you can simultaneously work from uh, both channel. About cons, of course, you must have the uniportal scope and you need uh, the, the skill for uh, UBE. The surgical technique. Uh, start with prone uh, uh, position, uh, patient position with prone position with the daily odusen bed, normal lodotics, and freak hips, freak knee. Landmark, I usually uh, make a landmark one centimeter flat off from uh, pedicle to insertion and direction to the pedicle above and below. Skin incision is objective, is up to your objective. It's you make uh, vertical, maybe you uh, just uh, make a one incision. Or transfer, you, you can make a multiple uh, incision. It's, it's up to your purposes, like a facet sectomy and bone graft, however, this sectomy and a case insertions or pillar screw insertion. Like this. If you make skin incision more lateral, you can suitable for a, a case insertion but uh, harder to uh, both work. If you make, make a vertical skin incision, you can make uh, the one incision and more freely to uh, both work like this. But if you make a multiple incision, transfer incision like this, you're more suitable for a case insertion, more proper anchor of a case insertion and easy to uh, percutate a pedal screw like this. Insertion point, I always use insertion point for, for two point. One is a superior articular process and one is a cambium triangle. I insert this, uh, the needle and followed by guide wire and dilator and then insert the scope and start to working. I start working at the fast me and take a bone graft first. Clean and clear, soft tissue, identify bone, and then you can work. And you can use a JC cell for a bone graft taking, like this. Just gentle tap to uh, use a chisel, and then you can use the uh, forceps to take out the bone graft just for a uh, uniportal technique. And you can also you can do a uh, biportal technique like this. Use the carison, just the uh, UBE style, and then you can make uh, this preparation. Identify, clean and clear, and then you can start uh, this sexomy. This clean and clear, and you can use the, the strong RF from the spot, like this. And before you start to uh, this sexomy, I usually use the dilator to uh, increase the, the portal for, for use uh, easily. And then you start this exome. Tap the lighter and tap the curet. This curet. Mm. 
and make sure you should uh, use the C arm to make uh, the right position. And then you can serial and uh, more dilate of the disk space and take out the disk. You see? It's really much of uh, this content. And then you can prepare the, uh, the base uh, in play. Just basic tool and primitive tool like this. And then you can try out and case insertion and check the position like this and check the nerve root after you uh, insert the cache and percutane screw. Uh, decompression, you can indirect decompression and direct decompression extended from a facetectomy is up to your patient clinical and your uh, imaging finding. It's between first case and second case. In the second case, you, you see uh, very severe stenosis. I usually, in severe stenosis, I uh, use interlaminar decompression, more incision and more abrasion. Complication, neural structure, hematoma, infection, broken instrument and malalignment of implant. Obstacle, breathing control, and tie up scope. Of course, you need more uh, control, you need more uh, skill for unipotal portal and bi-portal. Breathing control, you can increase portal pressure pump. Oh, right. Okay, so <laughs> take home message. Hybrid endoscopic T lifts are advantages from uh, uniportal and bipotal technique. And instead of, instead of uh, irrigation system, suitable for uh, bone work and bone, bone graft, comfortable for disectomy and easy case insertion under visualization. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for enlightening us on your technique. Now we. At the, can I call the faculty of this session to take their mementos, mementos, the photographs? Dr. Hayati, Dr. Seishov, Dr. Shidem, uh, Dr. Seishov, and Dr. Warfarat, please come on the stage. No. Zopi. And Dr. Zopi. before taking a picture. Maybe I'm not a near endoscopic surgeon. So uh, why, so if you preserve the motion segment, it's, it's very important to, but uh, if you fuse, so what, even with the facet joint, it's a, a, a traditional TRIF, MI TRIF is more, more reasonable and more easy. Why you stick to this uh, small cambium triangle to put a cage? So I cannot get it. <laughs> you are fusing, so you, if you remove the facet joint, so the corridor become very big. But why you stick to the very narrow cambium tri triangle? I cannot get it. You have, a, oh. you have the answer. Dr. Masato. I, I have the answer. The answer is very simple, sir. We do a complete facetectomy. We put in a cage from an x lift position. So I create space which is about a corridor which is about 15 mm long or even 18 mm long. And width depends upon how much of dilator you use and how much of separation you cause. You can open up the disk space adequately. You can put in a cage that is a banana cage that is up to 14, 16 mm in size, length, and width of a length of about 30 or even 40 mm. So you can, with an X-lift corridor, you can put in the same cage that you put in through an O-lift. Anyway. But if you do not do the remove completely the facet, then obviously you are stuck with a smaller corridor. But you must remember that in Japan, they see the sunrise first, so they get the enlightenment before <laughs> all of us. May I request Dr. Saisho Shah to come in front? Dr. Shidam Mumsu.
She is the most beautiful lady amongst us. Dr. Nilesh Zope, please. Anyway, it's a pleasure and it's an honor to give it to you, Nilesh. Thank you. And my dear Dr. Warfarat, the honor is all ours. Thank you. And Dr. Hayati, Dr. Hayati, I don't know where he's gone. Maybe he's gone for a cup of coffee. So we'll give it to him later. Uh, we're now going to start with our debate. So can I ask for my laptop and uh, can we set it up? And can we invite all the faculty on stage for the debate, please? Doctor. Yeah, I'm good there. Don't worry. Can you just hold this one? For the debate, we invite Dr. Pon Papit. Dr. Tripathi, Dr. Ajay Krishnan, Dr. Vishal Kudnani, Varun Agarwal, Dr. Sigdam, and uh, Dr. Pau. Persons for this uh, debate will be uh, Dr. Shai Shao and Dr. Sinagra. And the presenter will be Dr. Paras Banka. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Dr. Durai is there. Dr. Durai. Dr. Durai. <laughs> Dr. Malcolm, Dr. Durai is there. Dr. Durai is not here. Dr. Masato, please. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dr. Sasha. I'm going to present a case because I think Paris is missing right now. And uh, all of you are participants. Okay? The poet is not only amongst us. And each one has to say what he would like to do best in that particular situation. Uh, though somebody is an MIS expert here and somebody is a UB expert here, that does not matter. The, it's the case that matters and what you would do in that particular case is what matters. And then obviously I'll play my little video about what I've done and you're most welcome to criticize it. But let's have the fun of knowing sometimes Pine doesn't give us easy answers and it's all about finding the balance in things. Yeah, I feel suddenly very tall here. Yeah. Great. So, are we on stage? Come on, can you show the presentation, please? Well, laptop back on air. It's connected. Not working. Hey, yaar, kuch karo, yaar. Ya to pen drive me lo, or fir dikhao. I don't know what you do. Ya dusra connector lagao. Ye lo, ye lo, ye wala connector le. Huh? This is more magnetic. Laptop niche do Yeah, it's on. It's yeah, on it came screen. in. Oh, yeah. It came and went.
तुम्हारा दूसरा कोई एप्पल लैपटॉप है क्या समथिंग केमन समथिंग केमन ओके लेट्स नॉट जस्ट डिस्टर्ब इट लेट्स जस्ट गो दिस वे ओके सॉरी गाइस नो फुल स्क्रीन फॉर यू नाउ क्वेश्चन इज व्हाट विल यू डू एंड दिस गोज टू ऑल ऑफ यू ओके सो द नेक्स्ट स्लाइड ऑप्शंस ऑब्वियसली इन स्पाइन सर्जरी वी हैव अ लॉट ऑफ ऑप्शंस सिंपल थिंग अ ब्लेड ओपन सर्जरी एम आई एस ट्रांसफर इंटरलेमाइनर यू बी दस्तानू वी ऑल द ग्रेट गाइज हियर and i am humbled by their presence okay zoom kam kar do zoom kaise karu nahi dikh raha okay yahan se okay now now can now we can see okay great now we come to the clinical history of the patient we have a 77 year old female patient she has suddenly in the past 3 months developed acute sciatica with numbness in the right lower limb she is limping However she had a history of preceding mild pain in the same leg for past many years off and on almost 10 years she had undergone a previous discectomy microdiscectomy at L45 again on the right side and there is on x ray you can see the collapse we'll go to that but now she's got severe sciatica right sided only no left sided symptoms right l4 l5 nerve roots are involved and she refuses implantation she says i'm too old i don't want to be implanted do what you want no implantations so now you got the x ray in front of you i'll i think now again zoom the x ray a bit yep kindly have a look at the x ray we'll wait here for about 30 seconds guys so nobody can say they didn't get to see the x rays properly mild degenerative scoliosis जरा देखने तो दे यार हाँ तुमको नहीं दिख रहा है ओके पीछे से नहीं दिख रहा है ओके फर्स्ट लेट द पीपल ऑन द स्टेज लुक एट इट ओके एंड नाउ आई अगेन मिनिमाइज इट अ बिट सो गाइस यू ऑल कैन आल्सो सी इट इट्स ओके will manage now come come sit sir we all family we all now family so fine you saw this x ray sir at rahul jana please tu pan yaar kya kaadya kare che okay now we again go back to a larger x ray now we come to the mris and uh, can you see the mri yeah it's nice and clean see it carefully level by level yes <laughs> yes all right side left side no problem no complaints pon pa with sir have a seat there there's a throne waiting for you there thanks to dr anta we're grateful to him presence of mind so can i go to the next guys had a good look ji bhar gaya okay if anybody wants me to go back and forth you can tell me yeah please okay this is the t1 and again the t1 so you can have a better look at it what in there in there yaar sir there out yaar bas out the ticket screen var dis data sir one So all these spine surgeons apply your mind maximi see the mri carefully buddy oh would you like to come up most welcome all those who wish to come up can come up 
CT scan cuts. Maxim, come on top. Squeeze yourself in. Yeah, it's okay. We'll push it back. We'll push that back. Sir, nahi chahiye ye. It's not needed. Come, come, Maxim. Ulta, it's a nuisance. Take it down. I don't want it here. Take it away. Sir, it's a little bit. Take it away. 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 So you had a look at the CT scan, guys. Now I'm again going to go up to the X-ray. Actually, I'll go back to the clinical history because that is where the clues are. Sudden onset pain, had pre-existing pain, has already undergone a discectomy. Both L4, L5 nerve roots are involved. Severe sciatica, that only on one side, left side, nothing. Two roots involved, and is refusing implantation because she's old, she's scared, she doesn't want it. And she's very clear about it. I don't want it. Do what you want. And the best part is she's my anesthetist mother. So I bear not disobey. Again, we come back to the x-rays. You can see the degenerative collapse. L4, L5. You can see that there's literally a Bertolotti's kind of L5 fused to the S1. And you can see that the L3, L4 over there is also a little tilted. And I guess the rest you all see. Why should I say? Come back to the MRI. Okay, guys, again the MRI. The L3, L4, L4, L5, and the L5 S1 appear to be culprits. Uh, everything else above that appears to be quite decent. Again, I'm shaking you down to the T1. And then I again bring you back to the CT scan. Yeah, yeah, yeah sir. We, we have enough time. Now, what did I do? We will say afterwards. First, let's see what you all will do. We can have some two mics up here. You have a mic? Good. Dr. Ponpavit, your opinion, please. Okay. The, the question is, uh, how long that the previous discectomy done? Ten years ago. Ten years mild ago. pain off and on in the right limb. Yeah. So and uh, now comes with acute onset of pain. Yeah. After surgery, the patient still have off and on pain, right? Yes, sir. So look at the the patient as 10 years ago is about 66 years old. Yes, and, sir. And uh, this herniation in the elderly is not common. So I think normally the, this herniation in the elderly confined in the foraminal or extra foraminal and also combined with the stenosis. Yes. If the first surgery done by disectomy only, I think it's not good uh, God is not a good one right because of the it should be addressed what is the cause of the pain not that this only this sectomy cannot solve the problem and the second after 10 years you can see the right side of L45 collapse so if you look at the the MRI you can see the foraminal zone have the stenosis but this high decrease, that means they have the SAP on the right side, upward migration, maybe impinge the exiting nerve root. Okay. And in this area, normally the patient cannot tolerate. It's really, Pain. really painful. Pain. And uh, sometimes they have the... Uh, bizarre pain sensation like the burning sensation on yes. the leg something like that so look at the foramen and also you have to look at the ecta foramen as well because you can see the osteophyte in the 
in the intervertebral disc in the extra foraminal zone as well. So you, before I make the decision, I would like to find what is, what is the location of the nerve root compression. If foraminal zone or extra foraminal zone, it should be L4. It should be L4, not L5. If the patient complains the numbness on the L5, that means not foraminal zone, maybe the lateral recess of the L4-5. So we have to localize the lesion, and then we will have the precision attached, attached to the, the cause of the pathology. And yeah, thank this you. is my opinion. Eh? Thank you. Dr. PCD, please. Yeah, this is the uh, already operated and the right side operated. Now, complaints also the right side. And uh, it is L4 and L5, as you uh, mentioned it, the L4 norbrood is also the symptoms. So, if it is the source that is the interpedicular distance in L4, L5 is very, very less. And it is uh, showing the extra foraminal compression in the L3, L4, and L4, L5. So if it is the L3, L4 extra foraminal compression, then definitely it is the norbrood of the L3. But the complaint is not uh, L3, it is L4. So L4, L5 extra foraminal compression means it is the L4 norbrood. But what is the L5? So if it is L5, then it definitely is a traversing norbrood at L4, L5. So I think it is have to be determined the location if it is L4 and L5 both, then you have yeah, to approach both the, L4 L5. Yes, then you have to approach the extra phenomenal L4 L5 and traversing means interlaminar L4 L5. Both. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. No, I think <clears throat> interesting case, Dr. Malcolm, but I am really not um, very convinced with the history so far. The duration of recent onset of symptoms is probably I would want to really understand, number one. Number two, the exact location. Which dermatome are we really looking at? In your history, has, you mentioned the dermatome. Patient has quadriceps weakness, mild quadriceps, quadriceps weakness. weakness. Yes. Yeah. So it is quadriceps weakness, yes. which is not L4. It is L3. We are looking at L3, 4, L4, 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 L4 also contributes to it, sir. <laughs> L4 yeah. also contributes to it. It's so, a large extra foraminal disc. It will lift up the axilla. Again, what I'm trying to bring forward to the point here is that unless and until we are absolutely sure about the offending True. agent, any surgery we do may or may not work. If it works, we are lucky. If it doesn't work, we are unlucky. True. But that's not how surgery would work here. To me, I think the recent duration of symptoms is very, very important. Yes. If it is like really recent with no obvious motor deficit, as was mentioned in the slides, then I would really want to just conserve this patient if really recent onset with a root block, not only from therapeutic point of view, but also from diagnostic point of view to really ascertain which is the offending agent. No, but the patient had L4, L5 predominant weakness, quadriceps weakness, EHL, EDL weakness. Dr. Malcolm, I beg to disagree all again. Your, your slides mentioned about L5 nerve root. Here, I am uh, not able uh, to find an L5 nerve root. L4, L5 nerve root, right sided. Yeah, but the slides sure. are showing it is L4, 5. L3, it shows an L3-4 far lateral disc over here so this and is an L4-5, yes. This is L3-4. which And an L4-5 below. Yeah, I'm coming, sir. A far lateral L3-4, it's an L3 exiting nerve root. Agreed. And L4-5, which is again a far lateral here, yes. it's an L4 exiting nerve root. Agreed. The L5 traversing yes. and the L5 exiting, yes. both free from these images. Agreed, but the so patient L4, has symptomatology. Yeah, but I mean, just this afternoon, I saw some 20 patients with L5 symptoms with all MRIs being normal, but I didn't operate them. That's okay. I, so I asked you, what would you do in this? So that's I would, your call. I would further go in, in detail about the patient's history. If you say there is quadriceps weakness, we are looking at a L3-4 as yes, the Yes, you are, problem. but the patient is not complaining of pain in that area. Weakness, yes. With no pain in L3? No. Not necessarily, sir. I would definitely confirm it, sir. Okay, next, doctor. 
I, I, I would surely sit down with the patient with caveats like a patient who's got quadriceps weakness is hell bent that I will not want a implant in there with two disc pathologies with an insubordinate type of history. Same block, same time. Same time. It's a concordance. It is a concordance. He will give one root takes. block, then he'll give the second root block and see which gives him relief. Which is concordance. Concordance. Okay. Next, Doctor Doctor Krishnan, your opinion, please. I I would defer for at least a surgical intervention in this line with this presentation. Absolutely Krishnan not. Is having acute pain, buddy. Whatever it is. Limping, weakness. There are enough reasons for an acuteness. There can be n number of things which can be reason for acuteness. Secondly, you are very well saying the NSS is mother. So I would refrain from operating and repenting. That is the most important reason. <laughs> you don't operate in family. Okay. It is the things which we are taught by Being professors. Safe. I see, uh, I agree with Vishal. It is L4-5 there. There is a disc collapse there. Probably a foraminal stenosis, which would be more appreciated in more cuts there. It is there. It is seen. It is seen. I don't deny it. And at the same time, at the same seen. time, a lateral recess of L45 is justifiable. So that may be there. I am agreeing with that. But simultaneously, two pathologies, say L34 and L45, both precipitating, both getting symptomatic. Why the patient is so much unlucky to have two presentations at one go? Was she in gym? She is a moderate. Maybe lady. she, she had a, does maybe anything. she had a chronic problem at. L45, and now an acute problem. But she has been L3, living 4. with that. She should live with that. We are talking just about the acute pain. I need more investigations in the form of at least, at uh, least, at least, and the PSI okay. evaluations. Okay. That is for Not sure because I see across so lot of bony pathologies, insufficiency fractures, even a subjective, objective weaknesses for hip with a sacral ala fractures. Small insufficiency is very common at my practice, what I see. And more importantly, there should not be anything else. Provided it is all ruled out, say we have ruled all this out, still it needs to be conservatively managed with a medicine or a block or a diagnostic thing which is to be there. Okay. So your opinion would be to conserve? His conserve for at least two to three weeks. And then decide. Yeah. Or conserve. So again, as I said, if you have to operate doing this by all the techniques that we are sitting here is easily doable. Yeah, a okay. UB guy can easily do it. A transformal guy can do it. A tubular guy can dock the tube and do extra funnel discectomy with ease. In 20 minutes, it will be done. So it's not a big deal. And when we already have a caveat that I don't want implant, that means the responsibility of not implanting and the consequences are all on patient's head, not on surgeon's head. Definitely. So doing a discectomy, a far lateral one by any technique, all the surgeons here are so fluent to do it. And the surgical expertise of the surgeon and the learning of the youngsters can easily do whichever way they have learned it. The question is not how to remove that offending disc fragment. The question is which disc is the offending agent. Agreed. Varun, your call. Yeah, so I do uh, agree with Dr. Vishal and all. And this patient uh, requires a little more workup. Maybe a couple of blocks, maybe even stage the blocks. But okay. unless you are uh, you know, uh, dead sure which level to intervene on, and still, I would still try to, you know, uh, is there a component of back pain in this? No. Uh, because uh, she's I quite comfortable still, with the degenerative scoliosis. I still would feel that this would so that was not the, the reason term for her. With some implant in there. So we we may be able to offer, uh, you know, quick relief, but still I feel that for a long term, an implant would do a better job. Here. That's seventy-seven. Yeah. Long term is not I what I would really think about. 102. So 30 That's years okay. Long That's enough. Uh, from my point of view, the situation is more easy because the problem is um, huge arthritis due to disectomy on the degenerative process. If you do a fusion, you will not sure that uh, she will have a good result. And if you do uh, what you want, monoportal, UB, the result was not so good. So I think the good technique is a neurostimulator. Of the, Doctor for pain, because okay. the probability of, so, of uh, good result of surgery is very low. On the, um, I think there's better surgeon to try to operate her, but I think the probability to resolve the problem is very low. So I prefer to don't do surgery. Thank you. Dr. Seisho? Yeah, I think uh, I would say this is a kind of collaborative case uh, where, I mean, uh, I would not like to touch patient before uh, doing anything. Uh, I think uh, uh, 
uh, root block is definitely uh, can be done, but uh, agreed. A surgery is, I mean, uh, let the let the patient have more pain. Uh, this is an acute symptoms. <laughs> okay. Then I a think patient is already crying in pain, <laughs> so you can't say have more pain. Uh, last week, a patient phoned me. She uh, need to have a fusion. Well, she she, she said to me that one of my colleagues said, with 100 percent, the result of fusion is for him excellent. So I'm saying if the surgeon is better than me, it's better to do surgery with him. So in this case, for me, the better solution is to not, not operate not operate this case. So you would or not let want someone to operate if you want to try agreed. something. I think this is a very pertinent point. I would. Sure. I think this is this is one point that we all agree upon. Probably half the house is already agreeing to this, and we all must take this as the carry home message: is that <clears throat> when we are talking about degenerative pathologies in elderly patients. There is no one surgery that is the last surgery. Very, Every surgery has a reoperation rate and failure rate. Be yeah, it it's palliative. Be it fusion, be it long segment fusions. You correct the deformity or you leave the deformity. You do single segment or you do multi segment. You do only decompression. There is no one surgery which will win this battle. Agreed. It's a war which is already lost. You are only pushing it ahead so that the loss comes to you at a later date in a your later life. Date. Agreed. And Absolutely. unless until this point is conveyed to the patient that whatever i am going to do true despite being the so called minimal invasive technique is not going to change your reoperation rates Agreed. in long run is not going to change the overall degenerative pathology Perfect. and you might require a second maybe a third the longer you live the more chance Definitely. of reoperation Definitely. and so Agreed. with this the smallest or the first ladder is you have to choose but the question is what do i do now let's forget about patient coming back okay, to you later, tell me living 30 my years. question sir since it's your patient <laughs> so, since I, I just patient, ask you, what will you do now? Yes, I am a patient who's got a weakness, pain, crying, wants something to be done to her. So yeah. what so will you, you do now? First of all, you sit down patiently and listen to me. <laughs> first down, sit down patiently <laughs> and listen to me what I have to say to you. That Karmi me, rahi hai, dosto. Which, is the, which is the offending disc? I need to localize that first. The moment I have localized that disc fragment, I will give you an option of surgeries with its own pros and cons and reoperation rates. Then you will have to choose one among them which surgery you want. I chose. I already chose. I you don't want the implant. <laughs> now, do you want a surgery? Do you want a surgery? Do you want a surgery? You got to take a call here. Yeah? The mic. No, I have given my hand. call to you. I don't want a surgery at this stage because Fair your enough. information is not complete. Okay, you put it that way. Fair enough. Chalo. Of course, Navarat Prok is... Nothing hidden, please. Nothing yeah. hidden in my information. Navarat Prok and Radicular graft is um, necessary for this patient. And if you look at L5-S1 lateral is not uh, stenotic. So as, as you mentioned, uh, this area and this area is uh, doubtful. But uh, <clears throat> patient symptom is very important. I do lateral bending. If the lateral bending uh, en en enhances uh, patient pain, it is mainly because of uh, the lateral. And or the, put the discogram and then. Hmm? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, coming. sorry. The, uh, <laughs> discogram, if, if the discogram, uh, the, the, the hydro pressure increases the pain, so this is the main source is 4-5. In my opinion, maybe 4-5, but I will convince the patient to do the, to the fusion because it's a more than 25 degree uh, 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 sclerosis She's there. So short time Definitely. result, maybe uh, endoscopic decompression, transforminal, it works. But uh, two years later, so patient complained that low back pain and the same symptom. And there is there should be some adhesion here. So I choose only four five. Thank you. Should I have your opinion, please? And then we'll have Dr. Pao's last yeah. opinion. <laughs> then the, it's open to the audience for two, three minutes. And then what I did, and then you can curse me for it. OK, yeah. next. Come on, Shidem. Uh -huh. I would uh, decompression surgery by UBE uh, for foraminal stenosis, uh, for five level. Uh, but I uh, also I can uh, include, uh, I can add uh, L3 for level also because uh, she has weakness uh, yeah uh, that's it okay thank you dr pao yes i think the, to identify the the target lesion is the most important just as the, the, the doctor said so I, I think the most possible pathology located the location of the most possible pathology will be the l45 
foramen. So I will insist the patient to have a foramen block to, okay. to find out. Thank and you. And if you, you treat, you inject some steroid into the foramen or around the root, some patient will get well and recover from their pain because, because you said it is acute onset yes. pain or acute onset symptoms. So the very possibility that is a disc herniation. And uh, as we know that this herniation, we should have a, at least three months of a conservative treatment. That the patient, some patient, and a very high ratio of a, a high ratio of the patient will get pain free after conservative treatment. Okay. So I will insist to have an injection well, yeah, Dr. After, I, wants to... after I give the surgery. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh... I, I want to answer your question because uh, first I, I I just make a comment, right? So my 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 opinion is I don't like to work the nerve root injection because in, you inject in the L4 file your your cytokine or ovocaine action on both root L4 and L5 root. Some sometimes you this is not lo localized lesion. Sometimes the injection make more confused which level is the cause of the pain. So my choice is <clears throat> I will approach to L4-5 foramen, foramen or first and under, under local injection, but I, I don't inject into the neural foramen area. I inject in the facet joint. And then I shave the facet and free the exiting nerve loose. Identify that this is a rupture or not. <clears throat> and I ask the patient, you feel better or not? If still pain, I will go down and I resect more the lateral recess and some parts of the pedicle go down to, yeah, to make sure the L5 nerve loose is free. And under local anesthesia, you will know what is the cause of the pain? And the cause of the pain now <clears throat> are solved by your procedure, right? That, that is my choice. If I perform L4, 5, both foraminals and lateral recess, still pain. So I go to upper level and make it again, something like that. Okay. Thank you. I have some different <laughs> options. Okay, yeah, please. I have some different ideas. Uh, the, the steroid injection or xylokine injection is not to find the pathology. It's just to locate the pathology. So after the xylokine injection, if the patient gets improved, then we know the pathology located as L45 foramen. And then now the endoscopic surgery technique is very advanced. With either unipodal or bipodal endoscopic surgery, we can do foramen decompression and as well as lateral recess decompression at the same time. So there's no problem. So we can do both lesion at the same time. But if the patient recovered and got pain-free after the steroid injection or that all kind of injection, then the patient won't need no surgery at all. That's my opinion. For, for example, if the L5 pathologies and we inject in the L5-S1 area, and the cell can also affect the L5 load, even the pathology in L4-5. The patient get better. Okay, so now it's time for me to get hammered. How did I make my decision? A, I thought about, I have to do something for this lady. She's in too much pain. There is motor weakness. Now, Vishal raised a very valid point. I had a close look at the x-ray. The superior articular process is literally touching the pedicle over here. There's no space for an exiting root there. But then that is a chronic pathology. If you see the MRI, yeah, in the MRI, I felt K, this is not really a very acute cause of pain because I felt K, here there is a lot of bone formation here. And the discal part is not very significant. There is an extra foraminal pathology, foraminal pathology. So then that got me thinking, let me have a look at the higher level. Now we are in L34, I see not only a huge extra foraminal disc, but a huge foraminal fragment. Because of scoliosis and again collapse of that foramen also, 
obviously it is affecting the traversing route also over there not only the exiting route so therefore next next no video video last video chejo come down to the video can you play the sajatli mara have a look at it hmm Yeah, they are. They are because there is rotary scoliosis. I agree. <laughs> they don't look compromised, but I'll show you what they look in the video. And then we'll talk. So we'll come to the video. Yeah, yeah, boy, yeah. Please, yeah. You're not so wrong. Not doing it, yeah. Come on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now this is L34 para UB. I'm going in. I've already resected a part of the SAP, and out comes a huge fragment, and many multiple fragments. You can see that the disc is partially calcified. I osteotomized the tip of the SAP. The nerve root is completely free. The traversing, exiting both roots are can be cleanly seen. Yeah, this is three four. Okay, now we're coming to it. Coming to it, buddy. Unfortunately, I'm not able to go into that play mode. So if I try to jump it, it'll stop. The video will stop. So you'll have to suffer through this for another one minute. This is the unfortunate part of my situation right now. So just bear with me. Yeah, and I'm cleaning by the side of the root. I've opened up the root right from its axilla to beyond the SAP. So the root is free. It's entering the psoas muscle there. I'm doing a little bit of annuloplasty, burning out the discal, what we call as. Uh, now I'm cutting the transverse process a bit, because the root is not the apex of the root is not visualized, because of the scoliosis and the upriding nature of the SAP. The root has been pushed below the transverse process, so I have to cut the transverse process to reach the axilla. So the root is not free in its entire path until you see or visualize the axilla, which is what I'm trying to do now, and which I'm now succeeding. I've now freed it right from the axilla outwards. One last check: removal of any other more degenerative fragments. It's like a gutter; it keeps on coming out. But okay, you got to have the patience and sagacity to remove a few more fragments. But this gave her great relief; her pain disappeared. Lucky patient. Lucky. Lucky surgeon, but see the next part of the video. Then you tell me whether I'm lucky or not. I decided by para UB, I'm not paying much of a price. Neither is my patient paying any price in blood loss, pain, discomfort. I can easily explore both routes. I'm showing you, showing you. It's playing. Just sorry, I'm not able to speed up the video because we are not at play format. Just one minute, sir. One minute. The patients, I listen to all of you patiently. Yeah, come on, give me a minute. Itna mat kicho, yar. Ah, one more dirty piece out. Actually, I waited to show that to you. That's double lucky surgeon. Double lucky surgeon, yes. And you can see how the exiting and the traversing route are sitting down. The space created above the traversing route. Is a sign that yes, you have decompressed adequately. Oh shit! I wish I can do something about this. Oh. You get bored with me, but bear with me now. I think this is the end of it. No, it's already past six months. She hasn't come back, and I'm grateful. Are you sure? She has come back to you. Are you sure? Now, now we are going to the next one, sir. Now we are going to the next one. So just hold your guns for a minute. This is the next foramen. Yes, this is the next foramen where you see a plastered, tethered root. That white, flavum-covered root. This is the disc below, 
I partially opened the root. You can see the vessel of the root also. I'm going in creating space above the root right now. My traversing root can be seen. The disc can be seen. But see how deep below the transverse process and into the lower part of the bone, lamina itself, the entire tip of the SAP has gone. It has locked in that root. It has smashed that root. So I see the question is always the, what price is the patient going to pay? If I'm going to do a surgery that is going to cost, like he said, like 20, 20 minutes each level, patient wakes up in the evening without pain. And for me, having cleared out both the roots, I thought it was wise. Maybe not wise. We'll come to know after a year, maybe after five years. She'll come back, I agree. See, again, I'm cutting away the junction of the transverse process and the IAP. I'm burying below to reach the axilla. This depth at which I'm working would be very difficult even if you were to dock a tube. And I've still not exposed the axilla. I have to still cut further, still expose the whole traversing route. This is the SAP here, which is osteotomized. Uh, now I'm bringing in a burr and again burning out some bone, again going up onto the axilla. The whole point is that a no nerve root is free unless you visualize it from the axilla to its entry into the psoas. And there is no way, no way I feel that any other thing could have worked or given the angle to reach that deep below the transverse process and the IAP to free that nerve root. It's a plastered root. Now we are reached the axilla somewhere. We are opening up above the axilla to free the nerve root. I will show you the traversing nerve root because that was also plastered. We opened it up with a hook, freed it also. And then we eventually did a discectomy also. So I'm not going to bore you with the discectomy video, but you can see how the whole axilla, the nerve root and the discal surface is now exposed. But I've still not crossed over the root. The root is still stuck to the transverse process IAP corner up there, cranially. You can see the traversing root, but even that is badly plastered. I've cut the bone out, but the flavum and everything is badly plastered there. Now I'm going over there to free the traversing nerve root, lift all those tissues. So if you're asking me what could have been the cause of pain, this could have also been the cause of pain for the L5. Plastered traversing root, boss. Huh, so I saw it. I did it. I took the trouble of doing it because I felt it, this was an easier thing to do than even given a block. Giving a block in a very tight foramen can be disastrous to a patient. Now I'm freeing the root from the discal surface also. And then now I will be crossing over the root before the video ends. Because I want to free the root from all its attachments. So now I'm rotating my camera to get a view on about the root. See how badly it is adherent. See all the tags that are attached to it. But now the axilla is beautifully open in front of you. The traversing root has been opened up. This is the superior articular process which has been cut. That is a joint over there. Yeah, I, I could have just put in a cage from here if I wanted to. Standalone cage, banged it in. But I didn't do it. I just, now see, now I'm going over the root. I'm freeing the root from where it is tethered and attached to the transverse process. I'm cutting the root from there. I have to cross over cranial to the root to make sure that the root is free. And at the same time, make sure that I don't pull on that root or damage that root. It's badly plastered, I, buddy. I, I, I have just a tongue You're not okay. So. You're most welcome to <laughs> <I> disagree. <laughs> I'm a big fan of you, and I don't want to offend your feeling. But this kind of discussion is never happening in Japan. You are doing L3-4, right? And no, then, this is L4-5. 4 5. This is 4-5. Oh, yeah. Plastered no root at 4-5. And 3-4? 3-4 was a simple discectomy, which I showed you. Uh, both one. Yeah, that was over. It's 
very easy, easy answer. Both one is both easy. ones. Yes, I did both because both for me to do both is as easy as doing a foraminal injection. So I did it. Asan hai bhaiya. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much Wonder, for the debate. Wonderful surgery, but still not it. convinced for the pathology. Definitely not. And for youngsters, the message is very clear. Bulati hai par jane ka nahi bhai. Dur rehne ka. Sorry. It is, it is to be a very cautious approach. You cannot operate, keep on operating patients. But sir is very lucky. His experience, he can justify the surgery also. And uh, he has won. I just feel the root. That's it. <laughs> because that is my stability. Yeah. Yeah. That is my stability. <laughs> I don't want to destroy the stability. Let it remain. Yes. We start with the next. Hello. Yeah. Now we have to. Huh? Uh, minutes rupee ka hoga. Abhi Dr. Tane Prabhu is there. Uh, no, no, one minute, one minute, one minute. Yeah, se chalu karna hai, na. Abhi kaam chale gaye. Minutes rupee ka hoga. Dr. Tane Prabhu, your talk is next. Can you please come on the stage? And we'll just get the stage cleared up in the meanwhile. Can you call somebody to help me to clean this mess over here, please? Let's get the extra chairs and sofas down so we can start. Dr. PC Day, can I please ask you to come and chair this session, please, and help me? Dr. Kavi wishes to go for a nap, so I'm not going to call him. Dr. Vishal? Dr. Vishal Kundani? Sir, are you there or have you left? You disappeared. Okay. Ajay, can you come on the stage, please? Dr. Ajay Krishnan, can you please help me out, sir? Please. Ha, sir. Hello, yeah. Yeah, respected uh, chairpersons, seniors, and my dear colleagues, uh, very good evening to one and all, and uh, thank you, Malcolm sir, uh, Dr. Antao sir, and all the Congress to allow me to speak in front of you. This is basically for all youngsters, and it's a new thing also for me because I'm also growing in this field. So just the minimal invasive techniques in lumbar degenerative disease, I just want to reiterate all the different, different techniques which are there. Uh, when you see such a uh, L4, L5 disc, uh, there are different ways to do, and many of us would do laminectomies, discectomies, in different techniques. But today's time, uh, the open technique is over and the less is more as they say 
we know that various causes of low back pain are present uh, ranging from muscle spasm all the way to vertebral compression fractures disc and stenosis and treating back pain is always and the neck and back is a big problem almost 80 85% of us will experience back pain even in this audience will have some time in their lifetime traditionally back pain always associated with paralysis and people are always having that uh, fe uh, the fear of paralysis there is no proper consensus of the best treatment and that is what it is in this back pain the most important thing is the history taking uh, which is always there mri always helps and facilitate the whole thing many times we feel that this is could be some spine related but many of them are negative conservative line of management is always the first line tried by everyone almost the initial 8 to 10 weeks we always try to do there are different techniques which we all know that in injections nucleoplasty endoscopy micro surgeries and of course open surgeries definitions of mit is those which require minimal dissection local anesthesia uh, sedation mild sedation and of course the day care or quick hospitalization quick results very less blood loss side effects are lesser but of course the flu fluoroscopy is always present uh, these are the area of things which i'll just quickly discuss on that is discography to percutaneous screw fixation generally contraindications are if there is severe infection coagulopathies and if the cause of back pain is something else or there are other causes or diseases causing the pain coming to discography is assessing the disc morphology and pain response to know the level and it's as sensitive than the mri detecting the fissures and low back pain this is the image uh, in the uh, cm as well as the clinical the facet joint usually in the low back they have a lot of pain in the facet area so facet joint injections are very very useful uh, it can be therapeutic as well as diagnostic the selective nerve group plot most of us do nowadays the anesthetists are very well well versed with it even the pain management specialists and even young surgeons like us are doing this routinely and uh, it is very very easy with the help of a single or a double c arm epidural injections are very useful in acute pain conditions than the chronic the steroid inhibits the inflammatory response in the epidural space are, and releases the inflammatory mediators secondary to any pain uh, generator they can be interlaminal epidural and transforaminal epidural the sacroiliac joint uh, type of is very difficult to clinically diagnose but this is a very good uh, technique to give the block it can be intraarticular extraarticular x-ray and cm is just needed and you can give this easily this technique is been done i don't know how often right now but i just want to highlight on nucleoplasty it is a technique which is done in mild sedation uh, and local it's a day care procedure and lasts for around 20 to 30 minutes 17 gauge needle can be used and once you put in the nucleus the coagulation band uh, through the needle can is used to help in doing this technique these are some uh, images this is not of course mine but i'm just showing you the pre and post nucleoplasty that is l4 l5 in this case after uh, failed conservative treatment contained disc in the lumbar regions this is pre in the sagittal view in the l4 l5 and this is the post after one year this is the l5 s1 axial you can see on the right side and after nucleoplasty it has got good results coming to the next one which is the vertebroplasty or the kyphoplasty which is commonly done for the vertebral fractures especially nowadays because of the elderly a lot of people having this so just putting in these uh, fractures you just have to put the uh, cement in the whole uh, balloon and they have good improvement patients are quite comfortable and they walk almost next day only you have to be careful that the end plates are intact so i think a mri and ct is a must this is another interesting thing which i found was the cavity spine wand which had a bouquet of these active electrodes are there at the tip and this is how the tumor in the vertebral body the insertion of the cannula is done and this is how you deploy the spine wand clear clear it clear the void and create a void and put the cement so this is the cavity tumor procedure which can be easily done in minimal invasive manner to highlight the next thing is the interspinous process uh, and the distraction devices which are also used may not be so commonly nowadays but very useful for stenosis low back pain it has to be placed in the interspinous region uh, it is a physical block so it prevents the narrowing and creates a better room over there and 
uh, helps in the symptoms. The flexion increases over there and the flavum as well as the posterior capsule, all that opens up and it has to be correctly placed, not in the disc area, but in the interspinous region. That is important because the disc is much more ventrally. These are the common uh, common one spaces which are named. That is X top, the diam, the cloflex, which is very popular. And just to show the interspacer that is in space by synthesis, which is the undeployed one. And once you deploy it, it opens up and helps in increasing the space. This is the diam system. Those people who have not seen it, this is a deformable damper made of silicon uh, with a polyester jacket. And this is used in between the spinous processes. You can always do a surgery much later. And this is quite popular from the US, from New York Coflex system. Titanium helps in a very easy to insert it and easy and precise application. Just a few representative cases in the AP and lateral view. You can see how the Coflex is put, acts in flexion and extension. This is the CRM images of another case, another Coflex case, which is helping in opening up the canal so that the adequate space is there for the nerve. And this is the in, uh, in space, which is there, which opens up and does the same thing. It also kind of makes the parallel, uh, this thing of the vertebral, you can see the space. Instead of that, it makes it parallel. And this is one of the techniques which are commonly used. The last few slides, this is what we know are the docking system, the MED system, which is easily done, the MED uh, metric system. The scope, when it's used, you can easily remove the flavum as well as the disc. Same way, just by doing the decompression, you can do the mini TILIF or the PLIF in the same way and causing distraction. Percutaneous screws can be easily put, nowadays put for fractures as well as all the fixations. Uh, it, uh, just like how you do a biopsy, this is a very easy and quick in out technique. The very, very small incisions and this is how you get a good result. We know the advantages that there's minimal incision, the soft tissue and the tissues are not retracted and it's a quite quick procedure compared to the open, which may uh, cause a lot of stay for the patient. Finally, the uh, last few things that is PELD, that is percutaneous discectomy on the lumbar region, which is very good for the soft disc contained or not sequestered without any spinal stenosis or instability. That is the indication. Young patients and uh, the duration should be three to six months. And this is the new kid which everyone is doing and uh, UEB is being very, very popular. And the advantages, as we all know, it is fluid medium surgery, continuous flow, hydrostatic pressure, biportal, so endoscope and instrument is used more independently. Triangulation has to be there, which you have to learn. One hand surgery, so no support of the other hand and not getting tired. And the lens helps in to get the image much better, the depth better and much clarity and all directional. So just to recap on the all the fronts, that is discography, which is there. The nerve root injections that are epidural facet, the selected nerve root block, the sacroiliac block, nucleoplasties, kyphoplasty, the cavity tumor procedure, distraction devices like the coflex and diam, MED, percutaneous screw and the T-lift procedures, MIS, P-lift and T-lift, PELD and of course the UB, which is the final thing. Thank you so much for a patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Tane. Uh, I would invite Dr. Vishal Kundani. Vishal, he, he has some commitments. He is probably going to operate the same patient who is waiting with the anesthetist there. So, Vishal. Thank you. MIS is in cervical spine, man. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Malcolm, for accommodating my request to pitch in early with my talk on cervical spine MIS. So we all know cervical spine surgery is a completely different ball game than the lumbar spine surgery and thoracic spine surgery. And uh, as we all would agree, that cervical spine surgery has its own challenges. And the principles of MIS surgery, though applicable to any regional part of spine, uh, excuse me, can you have a replica? Though the principles of MIS can really be applied to any regional part of the uh, spine, the, the most common application has till today limited its utility and reproducibility in lumbar spine. Here I'm going to take it one wing further. How, when, why of MIS surgery in cervical spine? And when I'm talking about MIS surgery in cervical spine, it is not only about degenerative disc herniation pathologies. It's all about application of principles of MIS to expand the horizons of minimal invasive spine surgery in the most difficult terrain of spine, which is cervical spine surgery. 
Now we all know that cervical spine surgery is performed for various indications, be it for neural pathologies or for infective, traumatic, or mechanical instability, degenerative, OPLLs, and various pathologies. And we know that they have served the test of time, not only in terms of expanding the spinal canal to get good decompression, but also in restoration of alignment of cervical spine by various instrumentation techniques. And the principles of these surgeries in cervical spine are simple. Decompress and stabilize, align the spine in the most normal possible alignment. And these have been done by various options available at hand, right from ACDF, which has served the test of time for more than four decades already, to ACCF, and of course, laminectomies and laminoplasties by posterior surgeries, with or without lateral mass and now pedicle screw fixations, and of course, not only in subaxial, but also in craniovertebral junction. So all these options are available, and they have served the test of time. Then why do we need MIS? If they have served the test of time, results are good, why do we actually need minimal invasive spine surgery in cervical spine? Because we are all aware from our experiences in lumbar spine and now with growing understanding about pathologies which can be prevented, which is the problems of conventional spine surgery in cervical spine surgery. So it is our sensitization about more and more problems that our patients tell us that they, we can circumvent these morbidity related to conventional spine surgery even in cervical spine. So why do we need MIS? Because not many cases actually require fusion in cervical spine. Most of them actually now can be averted. So ACDF, probably 10 years, 20 years down the line, will actually become a redundant surgery. Neck pain and other problems related to cervical spine, as you all would agree, are most of them, if not all, at least 90% of cervical spine related problems, morbidity, is related to the access. Access causes dysphagia, dysphonia, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsies, or even neck pain, both anterior, posterior neck pain. When you're doing a laminectomy and if you're not repair the muscles very well, you may actually end up having access related morbidity causing neck pain. Residual neck pain and also the new kit to the block is adjacent segment degeneration, where you put in your plate there and you're touched in the disc or ALL above and you end up having a problem at the upper level. And this ASD is the commonest cause of reoperation in the most simplest ACDF surgery for PIVD. So all these are problems which are related to the access. Not only in subaxial spine, but also when you do a craniovertebral function surgery, like when you do a C1, C2 planned surgery in a patient with either rheumatoid arthritis or ang spond or even in a patient with tuberculosis, you do a segmental nicely done C1, C2, there is an inadvertent OC2 fusion or even C2, 3 adjacent segment facet arthritis which fails your surgery in no matter of time. And this is what can easily be circumvented by the use of principles of MIS surgery, which is access related morbidity can be brought down while serving the same target decompression and stabilization surgery. And this is what we all intend to do by whatever technique we utilize. So we all know that this is achievable and advantages of MIS surgery are very well visible. I'm not going to talk about these small incisions or saving the muscle morbidity or less blood loss, less incision. These are all obvious things which your curtailed access with MIS principles will give you the benefits even in cervical spine surgery. And it is the future. And it works. So what I'm talking here is not only experimental. It is not philosophy. It is not a trial mode of of doing MIS in cervical spine. It is all well established. It is not new that I'm here to tell you. I'm just showing you some of the cases that we have been doing. A calcified cervical disc where ACDF would have been a conventional fusion surgery. We just did a tubular oblique discectomy in such patient and patient has wonderful relief, no fusion required. Another patient where a lateralized disc, soft disc in the lateral area, lateral to the equator, you actually don't have to do a fusion in such patients, just do a micro foraminotomy, even an endoscopic foraminotomy for such patients and discectomy using that small burr area where the disc would just walk in out with your nerve probing there. This is something so easily doable and the incision size is 1.5 centimeter. Such lateral disc osteophyte complex causing radicular symptoms even in elderly patients can easily be tackled. I use a tubular, I am a tubular man, so I use cylindrical tube. In this particular case, we used a 18 millimeter tube. The size of incision is only 16 millimeter there. And these patients actually walk home the same day with absolutely no pain. And this can easily be done like a daycare procedure. We have been doing it for more than four years already. Not only degenerative pathologies, just see this tumor and C7 lamina. You can actually, with the help of a tubular thing and navigation guided birds, you can excise the whole tumor without having the need to go through all the posterior musculature and you can have a wonderful tumor excision out there. 
not only in the subaxial spine, but this tumor, which otherwise would have required excising the whole of C1 lateral mass out there, C1 lateral mass osteoid osteoma in a young 15-year-old lady, and we were able to excise it just by a minimal invasive tubular technique where we used a burr, which was navigation guided, and we were able to bring out the whole thing, preserving the articular surface. So this is precisely what the principle of MIS is, to curtail the morbidity of conventional open surgery be it whatever retractor system or endoscopic or microscopic system you use, but the principles of MIS and the win-win for MIS happens. Similar one case scenario where my colleague Dr. Kulkarni presented where austere osteoma from a C2 lamina was excised without having the morbidity of sparing the muscles in the posterior cervical spine area. Another case scenario, not only in subaxial spine, but in C1, C2. I have been doing this transarticular screws, not only in adults, but in percutaneously in pediatric population where a C1, C2 pathology of various natures, in, in this particular case, it was a JRA, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, but in patients with angst pond, in patients with orthodontoidium, tuberculosis, you can actually do the same kind of transarticular screw using both the expandable retractors or even now cylindrical retractors using percutaneous systems. We nowadays use navigation systems to pass in our screws there. Cervical facet dislocation, one of the commonest injuries where a facet just gets dislocated and you have to just bring the reduction back. You don't necessarily have to open up the muscle from midline and go and resect the facet. You can just do it tubular way. Put in your tube, dock it on the facet, just do a partial superior facet resection and the whole thing will just fall back. Anteriorly, you go into a small CDF and the surgery is all over there. So not only this, but also in anterior cases where you just put in a small retractor, a tubular retractor that we have devised for odontoid screws and you can actually get the same odontoid screw fixation like it happened in this case. Another case scenario of transarticular screw, another case scenario of odontoid and transarticular screw fixations. One very, very case uh, which is published in European Spine as well, which I'm very proud of using the most modern technology of navigation and navigation guided drill burrs where the whole articular space was spared and the C1 lateral mass odontoid osteo uh, um, osteoma was taken out without actually having to go in doing any amount of muscle retraction in such patients. Another case example, another case and so many more. So what I'm trying to bring out is that MIS is not only a future, it has its own advantages and it is not new. If you have not taken this bus wagon so far, please jump in it otherwise you'll have already missed the bus. There are enough evidences, enough literature there, enough uh, ways to prove that these techniques are only evolving over a day of time and now lateral mass fixations, even pedicle screw fixations are happening by these MIS techniques at getting better and better sagittal alignment. Endoscopy has already established its foot wave in cervical spine discectomies and degenerative pathologies but now with the expand of more and more instrumentation and technology related techniques, I am sure endoscopy and tubular things will really work together to bring in the best of benefits of MIS surgery to these patients there. Yes. It has a steep learning curve, in fact, a very steep learning curve, but the simplest and the easiest way to start with is a lateral disc, soft disc herniation in a young guy where you obviously feel that ACDF is the way to go. Try and get a tubular retractor docked in over there and see how you can beautifully remove that disc fragment. And of course, you will have your own way to climb this ladder up there. It requires special tools, but none of us is a fool here. These tools are not meant to just go in and operate. Find the right patient, use your techniques, and follow the basic principles, and you will never have a problem with this. So to summarize, minimal invasive spine surgery is the future of cervical spine surgery as well. It was infantile in lumbar spine, but now it is evolving even in cervical spine and thoracic spines as well. And benefits are very, very obvious. They cannot be neglected from the benefit of patient's lobby. And learning curve, despite steep, is definitely climbable. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, Vishal. Good compilation, good experience things. Ashwin Khange, please. Early hurdles in UB spine surgery. Thank you, Dr. Malcolm, sir, for uh, inviting me for this uh, World Endoscopic Congress. So just before we start, I would like to have a raise of hands. So how many of us uh, routinely do UB spine surgery in their clinical practice? Okay. So how many of us have started UB spine surgery and then just left it out because of some hurdles or whatever problems that happen? So the uh, topic of my lecture is early, hurd early hurdles in UB spine surgery. 
So the objectives uh, of this lecture are to help spine surgeons like us start UB spine surgery in their institutions to help them get, give a bird's eye view about the nuances of starting a UB spine surgery. So what is the problem? The problem is performing UB spine surgery, adopting UB in an already established set spine practice and fear of failure, giving up UB spine surgery altogether after initial hurdles. So the great yoga guru Patanjali in his first verse has said, and then yoga, he starts his line with and then yoga. So UB is like that and then UB. After many like open MI spine surgeries, endoscopic spine surgeries, UB is a natural transition as we can see in this um, photographs. So what are the hurdles in UB spine surgery? Hurdle one is the patient selection. You should always start with a left-sided L5-S1 lumbar disc herniation in a right-handed patient, uh, right-handed surgeon. Never commit to the patient that we'll do an endoscopic spine surgery or UB spine surgery. Always be ready with a microscope or a loop in your initial cases. Don't take unnecessary pressure that it has to happen by UB spine surgery. The left-sided case is my first case where I've tried UB spine surgery. I couldn't complete the case. I had to open it. It healed beautifully well. Patient was without any symptoms. The right-sided photo is the second case which uh, went completely uh, through UB surgery. So what is the hurdle to preoperative planning? Always use a Wilson's frame to open the interlaminar window. The left-sided photograph uh, of the AP is a beautiful uh, interlaminar window for a beginner. The L5-S1 interlaminar window on the left-sided X-ray is good. Whereas the, on the right side, if you see the two, the L5-S1 and L4-5 interlaminar and the S1-S2 interlaminar windows are so clubbed together and because of high lordosis, it's very easy to get lost and operate at the wrong uh, level. So uh, what is the hurdle? We as spine surgeons have never been exposed to arthroscopic instruments like plasmas, RF plasma. So we don't have a hold on using RF plasma. So this is one of the hurdles. So always when using the RF plasma, use rotatory movements with your fingers. The point that I found useful was using a single glove, which may be controversial to some, some, uh, some surgeons. Using a single glove gives the surgeon the temperature feel of the water that is coming out. So we unnecessarily avoid plasma for long duration and we uh, don't cause any uh, thermal damage. After opening the peridural space, make the ablation mode to zero and coagulation to minimum settings. Then there is uh, burr. As spine surgeons, we are uh, used to using burr, but in uh, UB spine surgery, better instrument will be a shaver burr or striker burr. I personally use, found six fluted barrel burrs to be the best. Diamond burr to be used near the neural structures. It helps to do the finer work and to help in hemostasis. Always keep the foot pedal with you. Then there is operating room setup. We should always stand on the side of the pathology. CM, CM monitor and endoscopy tower suction should be across the surgeon. The fluid collection back should be well positioned or we may use specialized drapes which are commercially available. If we are not uh, careful about the fluid, the whole operating room becomes a swimming, swimming pool. So this is a video of operating from the uh, right side of the patient. As we can see, the surgeon is standing on the right side of the patient. The monitor, the CM and the CM monitor are all in front of the uh, surgeon. So this makes a uh, better way to uh, tackle these kind of cases. What are the anesthesia hurdles? So which anesthesia to do? For beginners, general anesthesia is preferred. Experts may choose uh, spinal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia. Hypotension, hypotensive anesthesia is a must. So what are the common troubleshooting? Whenever you try to use, uh, do UB initially, always there seems to be a muscle creep in, in your visual field. So this is a beautiful instrument called as a scope retractor. Whenever it is used, it helps to retract the scope retractor, but beware the bayoneted edge of the scope retractor may, uh, may cause um, damage to the dura if you're not careful. Whereas it acts as a very beautiful nerve root retractor. So inadequate visualization after inserting the, that is because we have not created an optimal, optimal space. So we create an optimal space by connecting the working portal and uh, 
viewing portal together and if still problem arises a cruciate facial incision is always better always start with this picture in uh, before you starting surgery whenever the fluid starts from the inflow and you remove the outflow channel this fluid must flow out only then a good visualization will happen if this is not seen try to increase the size of your facial incision so what are the uh, the second instrument that is very handy is these kind of curved curettes where there is not enough space lateral to the traversing nerve root and it becomes very difficult to retract the nerve root these angled curettes of 2 to 3 mm millimeter can help then there is bleeding if there is a bony bleeding bone wax or a diamond burr can be used if there is a vessel bleed rf fluid gel foam can be used there is uh, routine keratins may cause problems for a new uh, new surgeon in ub so these rotatable keratins are beautiful these angled foraminotomy keratins are also uh, very helpful in the tight spots then there is social palange we try to compare apple with oranges that this is transforaminal i am doing mis i am doing open all have their own unique advantages and ub mind me if you want to learn ub and practice ub you have to fall in love with ub there is no other way always get your set and deep dive into the ocean so it's a beautiful journey where you go from n block flav n block discectomy to n block flavectomy so that's how you progress and that's how the skill is uh, manifested so my take home message for this lecture is uh, never give up have patience be unbiased and don't criticize any method ub is also has its own uh, things and please take a leap of faith and start your journey in uh, unilateral bipodal endoscopy thank you thank you ashwin wonderful learning uh, professor murat sayen do we really need to make fusion in elderly Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I would like to organize a committee and especially Dr. Malcolm Pasanji uh, for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, I'm coming from Turkey, Izmir, a nice city in Turkey. And I'm uh, working in my own clinic, uh, performing only endoscopic surgeries. Uh, the life, the population is getting old uh, every day. The uh, six hours, the life expectancy is getting longer. And by the year 2100, the expectant, uh, the expected uh, age is a uh, minimum 82 years old. The need for spine operations are increasing. The main spine problems by aging is caused by degenerative disc disease that causes spinal stenosis, back pain, short walking distances. Uh, spine surgery in the elderly is a real big challenge with uh, so many comorbidities. Uh, and is there a solution for them? Yeah, the answer is exactly yes. And that's uh, here, the old audience is a uh, solution for that. Uh, checking the x-ray during the full endoscopic surgery is very important. You, how cranial and how caudal you go, that's very important. Uh, I collected my patients uh, that were uh, over the uh, age 65 and uh, called them as elderly. They were totally, the number was uh, one. 
124, the mean age was 65, the uh, 76 one was the female and 48 were male. The level of stenosis operated were, were uh, one to three levels. 70% uh, of the uh, op um, patients were operated for one level, 20% for two levels and 10% for one level. Uh, it's very important to make the uh, decision of how many uh, levels you operate. I really uh, convinced my patients to do it slowly and level by level. Sometimes I have to do a second surgery, but uh, most of the time you will uh, achieve your goal because only one level makes mostly the problem. Uh, the operation time is really changing by time. Uh, in, during the learning curve, it can take about uh, four, 140 minutes, but it really changes to uh, about 40 minutes per level for stenosis at the moment. The average hospital stay for stenosis surgery is uh, six hours, and the, all the patients get out just off the bed, just after the surgery. Significant uh, improvement was obtained. Uh, uh, the VAS uh, for leg pain, back pain, and the old eye uh, was uh, improved significantly. Although some slight uh, compression was seen on the MRI, especially on the non-operated levels, uh, they, they had, were really asymptomatic. Complications in insufficient decompression, especially if they have some clinical results, they have to be reoperated. And nine, uh, I had to operate nine patients again from the same level, and uh, I had to add three uh, patients for for the transforaminal foraminoplasty. They needed that extra uh, additional level com decompression. The, uh, seven patients had to be operated from level one level up or one level be below. Uh, I had five t dural tears. They were also uh, asymptomatic, no infection, uh, and eight of the patients uh, had um, back pain still four weeks after the uh, surgery, and they had uh, facet, facet radio frequency to get rid of the back pain and it worked. Uh, surgery for the instability, I really didn't have, to, no one uh, got uh, instability. And some of the patients are here. It's a 78 year old man with neurologic, neurogenic claudication. He cannot walk more, more than uh, 100 meters. He has a chronic arterial disease. He has a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and he had also leg pain, and he was just uh, operated for, for one level, and he was very okay, and he was really happy. And another patient, he is also 71 years old, and he had also a neurogenic education and leg pain, and he was operated again for a full endoscopic stenosis surgery, and he was also, again, very happy. And this was a 67 years old man. He also suffered from neurogenic education, and he was also uh, operated. And this was a, a, a 80, 83 years old woman who had leg pain and uh, back pain and neurogenic education. Uh, and uh, this was a, uh, also a this an 85 years old woman who had left uh, leg pain and neuro again neurogenic education, and she had got also a, a two level uh, stenosis surgery. And uh, we I did it also in upper levels again, and there was a uh, it's a 72 years old man. Uh, he was 20 years uh, ago, uh, got a disc surgery, and now he had some, again, a neurogenic education. The uh, functional x-rays showed no instability. So, and the patient uh, came to me and he didn't want to be instrumented. So uh, we did a nice uh, decompression from, uh, with uh, full endoscopically. It's all about the same, the techniques, uh, there are, they are really standard, standardized sites. Uh, at the moment, we 
go from the uh, descending facet and go uh, find the typical of the ascending facet and then go uh, make a whole decompression and then get out the ligament and flavum and we can decompress it bilaterally so the nerve is uh, totally, uh, the dura and the nerves are totally free and floating. That's the aim that we were looking for. If it's really pulsating and there is no bleeding, that's very important. You have to uh, never uh, stop the surgery when I see blood uh, in the field. Uh, over the top technique is a really, really good technique. It's mi really minimal blood loss, no drains after surgery. If you wait, uh, if you are patient enough, the bleeding stops and then you finish the surgery. No painkillers needed. If you don't uh, harm the muscles, they won't have pain. I never use painkillers uh, during the surgery and or after the surgery, and only 5% uh, of patients need painkillers after the surgery uh, and they are discharged the same day uh, the and return to normal life is uh, should be as soon as possible I believe that endoscopy will become the gold standard treatment for the canal stenosis in the real near future the take-home message is don't treat the images treat the patients look really deeply where the symptoms are coming from uh, operate less thank you uh, thank you very much and i always welcome you to izmir turkey thank you okay of course you're welcome okay thank you thank you very much ishant no, no, Ishant Gundala, Gunda Gunadala is not there. So, Pritam AR. Thank you. So, so, this session is over. Yes, please. Yes. Hassan, please. Dr. Maxim, Dr. Rodolfo, can I request you to come up for a minute? May I request the speakers of the past session, uh, starting from Dr. Vishal, has he left? Yeah, please come up, sir. Okay. Uh, actually, and Dr. Murat. It's a very Qu answer and come up. Okay, it's a very good question. Back pain is. Uh, I wait. Dr. Ashwin, for, uh, Dr. About Tanay Prabhu. Eight weeks if the uh, back pain is going. Please come on stage. I mostly do a radio frequency treatment extra after the decompression is done, because some of the patients the back pain is also relieved after the, the endoscopic surgery. If if it doesn't work, I, I do it. No, no. Can I request uh, Dr. Maxim to please give this actually, memento to Dr. Vishal Kundani? It's a small memento. Please remember us. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rodolfo, can you please give this to Dr. Ashwin Kumar Khange? Dr. Murat, please come up. It's a small memento. Please keep it on your tabletops and remember us. Dr. Tanay Prabhu. Thank you so much. We'll now start with the next session. May I request the chairperson right now, Dr. Murat Sain again to come up and Dr. Varun Agarwal to come up on stage.
and please chair this thing. It's bad, I think. Can I request the next speaker, Dr. Sutipas, to please come on stage? Good evening, everyone. I am Sujipat from, from Thailand. So I'm, I'm uh, the member of Thai Mens. Uh, yeah. OK, today I will talk about the video as is Torah quote told me, like uh, we, we use the term of brand. So the thoracic spine have a unique characteristic, like uh, have a, the, the kyphotic curve, the developmental muscles, and stability, relative coronal, and adjacent vital organ and, and very risky and important organ. Uh, we not, not, not miss the principle of the, 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 the third, the, the, the in, in general principle of the, uh, the, the spinal surgery, like uh, the first is decompression, stabilization, and deformity corrections. Uh, in, some, in some event, we need to use uh, the, the the diagnostic resections. Surgical approach for posterior thoracic approach, we, uh, we had a traditional approach, like a traditional and transpedicular approach. This is uh, the picture that's open posterior surgery like we do before. The costal transversectomy uh, approach and lateral extracavitary and lateral scapular approaches. Uh, this Approach is uh, is is a minimally invasive approach, but uh, now anti approach is is true minimally invasive. I think in the past, this is an open traditional thoracotomy for example case. Uh, this is a AP combined approach. This is a tumor. This is a tumor approach. Yes, fix and decompression and dissect tumor and something like this. Uh, today we're gonna talk about the wax. Okay, video assist thoracotomy approach. Uh, begin in 19 and 10 with the Jacobius. We, he used the cystoscope and and do visualization in a thoracic cavity. And, uh, and after 1990, uh, it's developed a lot, a lot and a lot. And when we use the, the, the general term of it's wet. The patient position is like this. Uh, we usually put, uh, lift the, the left side up, uh, but it's up to the pathology. Something like this is portals. We can use at, at least two portals by portal or three. You can create three or four or five. It's up to the pathology. This is the operative setting pictures. The, the, the port placement is, uh, can made from metals, the plastic or polymer or something like uh, we call Alexis, like a, you use condom, sorry. Uh, anesthetic considerations. Uh, you need to uh, request the anesthesiologist to talk to her, talk to them to request a double lumen tube and the monitors like an EKG, carbon dioxide, captometry, and oxygen set monitors. The indication for wet is a diagnostic lung pathology, every diagnostic and therapeutic lung like a lobectomy or something. 
and pleural and pericardium surgery and mediastinum and esophagus surgery also. This is a, the sur surgeon, the thoracic surgeon and GI surgeon this all, 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 all also do that. And the hero now is spine and the other disease of spine. We can do the thoracic HNP or remove the disc directly, the thoracic and drainage and biopsy and resection and release the deformity corrections like a severe and stiff form the AIS patient and main instrumentation. Okay, uh, it's, the benefit is reduce the, the pain and because you use narcotics and time and bleeding and overall cause and, and, and early mobilization of the patient. And blood loss is less and shoulder dysfunction is less when when we compare with the traditional posterior approach. The contraindication is in, in every, every condition that we cannot use the single lung ventilations. And contraindication, but not, not, not strong, is uh, like a, a chemotherapy and radio surgery and, and uh, maybe prior thoracotomy in the past that may have uh, the 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 fibrosis okay this is a example cases this is a mass that we cannot distinguish from from the tumor or atypical tuberculosis we use the web the biopsy this is a beginning beginner use Uh, this is a wound. We have the one, one larger, maybe three or four centimeters, and one, maybe one or two centimeters. Uh, the second case is uh, we use a bad of pathologic fracture that we, not, we, we cannot distinguish for tumor and infection too. Uh, the, the plan is uh, with the direct decompression and resection of the, of, of the pathology and fixation from posterior. This example, we create the port portals. We use the Alexis and lysis adhesion like this. This is a maybe infection. There's a, a lot of inflammatory tissue and lysis adhesion. It's adhesion with the lung, parenchyma and lysis. Okay, and after that, we move the pathology and flip patient and fix from, from posterior. Uh, the third case is, uh, this is a ditch, D-I-S-H. This has a hypertrophic osteophyte, a large bird beak osteophyte from T9 and T10. Uh, he present with, uh, uh, after meal, maybe half an hour, they vomiting and weight loss more than 20 kilograms. Something like this. This is barium swallow and CT scan and proof and use this is skinny. The position, left side up and check fluoroscope and drawing and put the port in. Yes, they identify the pathologies. Yes, and use a burr. And it's very slow. So I use the, the osteotome and remove. The benefit of the wet is uh, the portal is larger. You can use some some launcher and also a tom. Use a long cushion, long pituitary launchers, and remove this. And this is a piece of bone, and check the X-ray. 
V op, force op. Okay. That's the same case. This is a wound, postoperative wound. Uh, this is an optional. In some patients, we need the interoperative neural monitoring in some 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 dis disease or tumor, and this is an option too if we want to fix patients. Okay, uh, the take-home message: what is MIS? It one of the MIS procedure for thoracic pathology. This attack from anterior. Uh, the history taking and decision making is also very, very, very important. We, you need to learn carefully before uh, make make the decision. Every patient ha have a different pathology, different problems, and learning and practicing, you can get this bet better and better skills, and be the safe surgeon. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, doctor, for mastering uh, and congratulations for mastering this difficult technique. So, anybody has any questions, or uh, we can move on to the next speaker? Is Dr. Rajamani here? Yeah, please. Pardon? Are you using intraoperative CT for all the cases? Uh, no, no, no. I, I not use ORM in every case. No, it's not necessary. In in some case, that me. What about prostate duct injury in your vet case? Ah, the com complication is uh, 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 I have one case of dural tear and difficult to 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 stop it, and uh, one case. Is uh, hemo hemothorax. Hemothorax. Uh, we we usually put it in, in the chest. Then in every case, but have uh, a lot of bleeding. Maybe maybe one thousand cc after operations. That that need to re and re bleeding from the vein. They stop bleeding from the vein. That's all. Sorry, technical question. How do you push the, the lung parenchyma during the, your introduce your insulins? Usually in open cases, we need uh, something to push the parenchyma of the lung. So how do we push it? Ah, you use, I use a blunt, like a suction tip and sponge, gauze and sponge. Try to push and, and, and if you use the thoracoscope like endoscope, the, magnification, the magnification is you can see the adhesion clearly and you can use the, 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 the scissor. No need for yeah. the tractor for the branchyma? The tractor? Traction, yes. You use the tractor for the branchyma or not? Oh, yes, I use the retractors. The chair surgeon have many type of retractors, but I usually use the, the sponge. The surgery is d uh, done after collapsing one lung. Yeah. So that also creates the space there. Mm -hmm. Is Dr. Rajamani here for, uh, for his topic, Beware and Aware of Endoscopic Surgery? Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Sutipas, for the nice presentation. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Dr. Arvind Malhotra, is he there? And uh, next, I would then like to invite Dr. Abhijit Pawar. Uh, is he there? No? Then I will have to invite myself for the next <laughs> talk. So good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Varun Agarwal, Associate Professor Orthopedics from Rohilkhand Medical College, Bareilly. 
Yeah. So I'll be presenting on percutaneous transforaminal fusion under local anesthesia. I don't have any financial disclosures. So as we all know that back pain is the leading cause of occupational disability in the world and it remains the second most common symptom related reason for seeing a physician and 85% of the general population will have some sort of mechanical low back pain at some point during their lifetime. Fortunately, it resolves in the majority within two to four weeks. It is the third most expensive disorders in terms of healthcare money spent. So these are the general mechanical causes, back or neck sprain, disc herniation, vertebral column fracture, lumbar spinal stenosis, spondylolisthesis, and also the SI joint. So this is another, this is a case. We see these kind of cases routinely in our OPD. And when we see the X-rays like this, we are all ready with our scalpel, ready to jump in for a surgery. So is there a different way of, uh, you know, tackling these cases? And to answer Dr. Masato's question, why do it? <laughs> so maybe with this talk, I may answer that question. So this is a case of a 40 year old female, pain in the back, radiation to both the lower limbs, SLR on the right side 20 degrees, walking distance 30 meter, and you can see the lysthesis there and the stenosis on the MRI. This is the MRI picture. So this is a video. We give local anesthesia and do the simple transcambin approach, place the needle the guide wire over which the dilator and the working channel and use these big instruments to do the disectomy. Since we just want to prepare the disc space for fusion and prepare the end plates, all this is being done under local anesthesia as you can see. Then again, over the guide wire, we place the trial implant. Now again under local anesthesia, the PSIS graft is being harvested and then mixed with the graft expander, I use G-bone and then pack it in the disc space. And you can see here the patient is quite comfortable and she's under local anesthesia. And the cage is placed, the disc space is, uh, you know, restored, the disc height. And then again, local anesthesia, spina erectile block for the passage of the screws. This standard technique of using the Jamshedi needles, the guide wire, and then under local anesthesia, the cannulated screws, they also go over the guide wire. So this is how it looks like under Siam. So this is the dilator being placed then the screws. This is the metronic system which I'm using here. The screws are placed and then again with local infiltration, the guide rod, the rods are inserted through the screws and then the in is tightened and this is the final picture. Then the removal of the towers and then the closure. So this is how the final construct looks like. This is the lateral view. This is the AP view. You can see these are the scars. Transverse screws I use because they are more cos uh, cosmetic for the screws. These are the scars for the rod incision, the cage incision and the bro uh, bone graft incision. This is the immediate post-op and within four to five hours, the patient is out of bed and walking. So this is the question. Can we do adequate disc preparation by this approach? So this is the amount of disc which has been removed by this transcambin and use of the bigger instruments. But will this fuse? That is another question. So this is another case, 55 year old male, back pain with claudication, this is at 5S1. You can see here, this is the MRI picture, immediate post-op at one year, two year and fusion. The, uh, at two years, I got the CT scan done when the patient uh, reported to us and you can see that the patient has fused nicely. This is just good enough for one level. So this is another 48 year old female, back pain and claudication, 
lysis is at 3, 4, reduced disc height at 4, 5. This is the MRI and two level surgery, again under local anesthesia. So we did a study for 66 patients. All of them had low back pain. And this was the result. The VAS was significantly in, improved, also the ODI. So this is our anesthesia protocol. We do a local infiltration of 5 ml lignocaine with ADR and 10 ml sensoricane and a 5 ml NS. This mixture we use. Then dexmedimidine for sedation, one microgram per kg for 15 minutes loading dose, followed by the maintenance. Fentanyl as and when needed and midazolam as and when needed. NTG infusion if the blood pressure is increasing. And when I started these procedures, I used to do an epidural. Now we are using it much less. So in conclusion, the realm of percutaneous techniques are expanding to include fusions and fixations and careful patient selection and thorough knowledge about the, pro the proposed procedures is mandatory. And if the indirect decompression can work from the front as an OLIF, it can always work from the back also. And we always have the option to use the endoscope if we require more decompression uh, to be done under vision. So thanks for a patient hearing. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I would like to uh, ask a question. Do you uh, check the, it with the endoscope in every case? No, so that is determined preoperatively, mm -hmm. right? So if there is just a disc space collapse and there's no ligament flavor or hypertrophy, I don't need to do a decompression preoperatively. I just need to restore the, uh, you know, disc space height and, and the alignment. If there is a midline disc herniation. Then I can put, always put the endoscope. That is always there. So it depends upon case to case basis. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, congratulations. So like I said, now that depends upon the preoperative uh, MRI. If you see that there is a disc there, you first do a disectomy under vision with the endoscope. So why would you fuse in an annual tear? No? Yeah. 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 No, so it's a partial tear, it is intact, and you are go going oblique to that in that trajectory. You are not very posterior. We try to, uh, we use the 50 50 trajectory so that the cage is, you know, a little at angulated and not in the posterior part as we do the disectomy. And then the patient is always awake, na? they can always tell you what is happening to them. That is the biggest uh, advantage of this. Difference in terms of what? So, yeah, so it's around, the, uh, so we take the markings and that's the 50-50 approach where we plan to target the center of the disc rather than the posterior part of the disc. When we do a transforaminal endoscopic disectomy, we go try to go lateral so that we land in the posterior part because that is where the herniation is. Here, our intention is to put the cage a little into the center or anteriorly. So we tend to go a little towards the midline and like the 50-50 uh, trajectory, we want to angulate so that it enters there rather than in the posterior part. Because in that case, we will not be able to, uh, you know, restore the lordosis. It will get fixed into kyphosis. Yeah. So if, uh, so like I said, if you feel that it is required, you can always put the endoscope even either before putting the cage or after putting the cage, interlaminarly or transforaminally. If you feel that is not required, you have done the adequate job, patient is telling you relief on the table that my, you know, radicular pain has gone because the foramen has been distracted or my... Yeah, that is true. So when you do an OLIF, do you always do a posterior decompression? So exactly. So that depends upon what you are doing. So that is always there an option. Na? If you feel as per your uh, recovery of the patient or as, uh, or as per your preoperative MRI that you want to do a decompression posteriorly, put an interlaminar endoscope and do it. If it is not required, don't do it. Yeah, so that depends from case to case. The cases which I put up here didn't require, so I didn't do. But I always have that option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
because if it is required it has to be done just putting a cage will not solve that problem yeah so pathology has to be addressed Uh, yeah, or if you uh, if you uh, plan like that and it's taking a little long, you can always you know try with an epidural from the outset. Have the epidural in C two and then just top it up. Yeah. Yeah. So see, advantage is that the patient is responding on the table. You can ask whether by passage of your case you have hit the nerve root or not. That is one. The other is the as you could see in the video, the patient is quite comfortable. The patient is out of surgery and by home by evening. If you are doing all these general anesthesia, spinal anesthesia, the patient totally becomes an outpatient procedure. See, the advantage is not that. Uh, see, I, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that I agree. Like I said, I started, I started with the epidural. So, so uh, uh, like I said, Yeah, yeah, let me uh, let me come to that. I agree with you, and uh, I don't know why it is not displaying. I always mentioned that having an epidural is also okay. If you are fast enough, why subject to another anesthesia? In my learning curve, when I started this, I used to do epidural. Now, even if I feel that if the surgery maybe it's a multi-level surgery or it is a little complicated, it may take two, three, four hours. I put an epidural, but I will only top it up if it is required and if the patient is. Uh, no, uh, uncomfortable. So yeah, yeah. So obviously, there's so you can do under GA. It will not give you any advantage. You can still do the procedure. The point being that your footprint of the surgery is very less. The damage to all the uh, normal anatomy is very less. Patient is, and for a sick patient, for example, where the GA is not being allowed or epidural is not uh, happening, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I know I don't say that it is to be condemned or it should not be done. That depends upon what best you can do. Yeah. We'll start with the next. Please, he's waiting. Yeah. We'll take all other calls and discussions later. We are running late, and I think. So I'll hand over the platform to Dr. Dr. Nikhil. Please hammer him like you hammered me. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. Really thankful to Malcolm sir and to this federation for giving an opportunity and thankful to the audience for bearing with us and being with us so late in the evening. So my today's topic is something on more specific one, which what Vishal had given earlier. He had talked.
So mine is more of a specific talk uh, what Vishal had elaborated earlier upon the benefits of MIS in cervical spine. So I'm going to talk about only tubular posterior cervical discectomy, the benefits and technique about it. Uh, so as we know, cervical disc prolapses can be treated if you want to go for a surgery through various ways. Anterior approaches are there. You have the anterior cervical microdiscectomy, the anterior endoscopic discectomy. When you go through the posterior approaches, you have the posterior cervical open microscopic discectomy. You have the posterior cervical tubular discectomy, the endoscopic discectomy. Now, the benefits of anterior are, it's a well-versed, it's the one traditional that everyone has learned how to do it. Orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, everyone knows how to do it. You can do it in almost all setups. You don't even require a microscope, even a small loop is enough. It's a standard technique and decompression is almost always a thorough. Hardly any time that you don't have a proper decompression done. When you have the uh, PLL uh, resected, you can have a complete resection done. So there are some drawbacks. Now, if you go through the uh, traditional approach of doing an anterior discectomy, always an implant is required, whether you use a spacer and plate or you use a standalone cages. As Vishal had elaborated, there are some chances of having an anterior structure injury. Most likely if you're doing a C5, C6, a recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, this thing, or if you have a pharyngeal edema causing dysphagia. While in the endoscopic technique, if you're doing through anterior, it is a longer learning curve and which takes time and since most of us will be entirely in private practice getting that set of patients where you'll be able to focus on doing endoscopic anterior may take time so that will eat into your practice so these are the drawbacks of your anterior approach now when you are doing through a posterior technique there are much much more benefits there's a direct visualization when you're doing for the disc fragment more complete removal and the most important thing is for young patients, if you're doing, especially those in 30s, 40s, and 50s, you don't require any implant at all. And such patients actually, after the procedure of doing a tubular discectomy or an endoscopic, have less or actually no neck pain. So this is getting back to the work and normal routine very quickly. Some drawbacks are, if you're doing it through a tubular one, when you're doing through rigid, you need a little bit better orientation. So this takes time for you to get adjusted. And the initial some cases, you may require a microscope to get it done. Short neck is also a disadvantage if you're doing it at a lower level, six, seven, you may not be able to see the position of the tube after uh, putting it, placing it. There are chances that you may have a, a iatrogenic facetal uh, damage when you're dissecting it, especially in your initial cases when you may want to go aggressively hand over proper bony uh, resection done so that you can visualize the root. Epidural bleeding when you're doing it posteriorly is a concern. But that I will tell you how to solve it uh, as we go further. And in some cases, initially, when you're doing it for young patients with the bone is pretty rigid and tough, a burr always helps. And when you're doing it in setups where you don't have a high speed burr, then that becomes a little bit problem. Now, the most important thing is the technique of you need a proper case selection. Now, the cases, as I said, those on the right and the upper one, these are the ones which needs to be taken. A 5-6 or a 4-5 level unilateral disc prolapse, which is causing a unilateral radicular pain, no myelopathy symptoms, should not have actually any uh, central disc prolapse like in the one below and should not have any myelopathic changes, should not have any cord changes and no instability. These are the cases which you should actually choose as your first cases for when you want to do a tubular uh, discectomy. Always if you are unsure whether the disc herniation is a soft or a calcified one, get a CT scan done. This will help you for your cases so that your patient selection is proper and you don't land up where you'll be inherently trying to resect the disc and if it's a hard one it will not come out positioning now for the first few cases i advise that if possible use a mayfield so that you can have a better visualization in the ap when you want to see the position of the tube after uh, docking it no need of any tongue extraction and positioning is just done uh, you can place the patient on the bolster and then uh, fix the mayo Mayfield and then uh, pay, uh, <clears throat> position the patient prone. Now, always get a reverse tendon like position so that make sure that the head is up and put the head in a little bit of flexion. Make sure that it's not too much flex so that you don't want any compression more. The eye should be properly padded, they should be properly protected and give a little heads up position to reduce the venous congestion. This is how the positioning should be. Now, retractor system, whatever you want to use, I prefer that you should use a fixed uh, rigid tubular system. Now there are various uh, tubular systems available. You have the Indian system that are the Pitkar and Jesco. I personally have been using the Pitkar uh, tubular system since the last six, seven years. You have the imported ones also, the Depu and the Metronic. The Depu has got a spotlight through which it has got a light source. 
and the basic configuration of the tubular system is this. It has got a bed clamp through which you attach the retractor system to the OT table and it also consists of the dilators and various type of retractors. Now when you are using the rigid tubular retractor system in the pit curve ones which I use, they grow up in 3 mm uh, gradations through which they go in the mm -hmm. diameter on the width and there are various depths available. These depths depend upon whatever size you see the patient's skin from the bone to the skin. Now how do you have to basically the tubular system that I use most commonly is 13 mm for the posterior cervical discectomy. The depth always varies what you get it from the bony surface up to the skin. A 4 or 5 centimeter depth usually suffices for doing a posterior tubular retractor uh, discectomy. Now the skin incision. For initial few cases for marking the skin incision always take an AP and lateral. Whenever you want to make the AP uh, marking always make sure that it's just to the medial to the fa uh, facet and this is where you can have the AP this. If unfortunately you don't have a Mayfield and you're using a horseshoe and you're not able to visualize an AP, what you can do is you can just take an incision once uh, finger breadth lateral to the spinous process. That should help you in getting an orientation. And initial few cases as such you'll be doing at 4, 5, 5, 6 or 6, 7. So that should be enough. But make sure that you're able to see in lateral because at least the docking of the tube after uh, in lateral should be sure so that you don't go in some other level and do it. So after uh, taking the skin incision, just cut the cervical fascia and then with the dilators you dock it. The first initial dilator, uh, I mean I don't use a guide wire because that unfortunately sometimes can slip and cause some dural injury. You can have the first dilator just dock over the bony surface that is the middle border of the facet. Then with serial dilators reach up to 13 mm and then put the 13 mm uh, retractor into it. Just check the depth that is available from the skin to the bony surface and with that you place that retractor into it. That retractor is connected to the assembly and fixed to the bed clamp. Now after docking the retractor you can just see it in the lateral image that the position is proper or not and this is how it should be. And if you are still confused that where it is in AP you can take an AP image also provided it is visualized before you start the case uh, this way. Now. So after placing the uh, retractor tube, then you have to just remove a little bit of superficial muscle which may have creeped in. With the rigid system, the benefit is that there is very less muscle creepage. As you start doing the cases more and more, you can get a very firm hold of it and this tube can actually be going superiorly, inferiorly, medially and retractory without doing much of manipulation. So once you have docked the tube, then you have to remove a little bit of muscle and this is how the position should be. This is what you are going to do a resection of the superior part and the inferior part and this is how you start it. So pointer hai. Okay. So we don't have a pointer so just to have an orientation the uh, uh, 12 o'clock position is the medial part then uh, 6 o'clock is the lateral part and the 3 o'clock is the uh, cranial part and the uh, 9 o'clock is the caudal part. So for the initial cases start with a high speed burr. I use a cutting drill bit of a 3 or 4 mm and start by going in the superior part resecting it and the inferior part then. Make sure you don't go too much aggressively laterally. You don't want to have the facetal resection done. So this is of the technique. This is how much you will have to have the bony resection done. This is the root. This is the lower root. This is where you will be having your bony window done. Little bit of the medial facetal resection you can do but not entirely. And this is where the disc is placed. So once you have de-roofed the pedicle, made sure that the root is completely free. You can just little bit retract the root superiorly and with the help of an angled ball tip probe can tease out the disc. Most of the superior disc herniations which are extruded can easily be teased out and can be taken out with the number one disc punch. Now once you are retracting the root or a little bit superficially pushing it, you may encounter with some bleeding. Most of this bleeding can be easily stopped with a gel foam or a surgery cell. You don't require a bipolar at all. You can just give it a little bit time, give it a little time for tamponade. If still it's bleeding, put a little bit more gel foam and put in the gauze piece and just wait for a couple of minutes. That bleeding automatically stops. After that, Avoid uh, uh, excessive root retraction, no need of putting any root retractor and all. Just once you have de-roofed the pedicle, the root can be very superficially retracted and with the angle ball tip, the uh, disc can be removed. 
closure is done after giving a thorough wash of the superficial face and skin. Most of the patients are mobilized after the GA effect wears off and with a soft cervical collar, you can start doing all the normal movements. A 45 degree flexion is also allowed. And we start with the normal exercises and after six weeks, a full thorough neck exercises started. So in conclusion, I say the posterior cervical tubular discectomy is a beneficial approach for a soft cervical unilateral disc herniations, especially in young patients who have a well-preserved disc height and no neck pain. This should be a choice of surgery for such conditions. And this is actually the first step before you go on to doing a posterior cervical endoscopic discectomy. Thank you. And any questions? <coughs> okay, we can move to the other speaker. That's <coughs> Ajayan Krishan, Central Disc Herniation, PTLB. Is Ajay Krishan Copy this huh? Direct. Pointer. Pointer. You can. Pointer. Pointer. Yeah, let me be the finisher here or the Knights Batman for tomorrow maybe. So what we are talking about is transforaminal endoscopy in central disc herniation. Long back it is 2008. This was probably my eighth or ninth case. And uh, I was a bit on few cases of chosen paracentral disc which had operated by transforaminal endoscopy under local anesthesia. And I had this case, which was a central typical case, a big one. I went in, I really struggled for two hours. I managed to grab something, but I never saw the dura. I never saw the dura. And this was the post-operative image of the patient. And the patient was, though a little bit symptomatically okay, I kept him in for a day. I told him because I all all the patients till date I get the post-operative MRI done. So I told him that it is not a decompression done. It's a 60 year old male patient. Still he was feeling somewhat better and he went off and then he again came back at 12th day and I had to do a microlumbar decompression on that point of time. So this was my upbeat confidence at the 8th, 9th case and I failed terribly because I tried to equate a paracentral disc with a central disc which at that time also was a contraindication to transforaminal approach and still is dreaded in many of the approaches. So what do you mean by a central lumbar disc herniation? It itself is ill-defined. It can be a protrusion, an extrusion or a sequestration. But the apex of the disc has to be around the midline with a maximum deviation of around 10%. And the one, the first image what is showing is a massive disc prolapse wherein it is extruded out also and the second one what is showing is with a contained disc wherein the uh, PLL and the annulus may be there and there may be a detachment of the ring apophysis the fragment may be just lying there uh, sub annular so if you m classify it further it can be MSU classification which can be used Michigan University classification so wherein the zone 
A is what will house the central disc prolapse and a massive disc prolapse would be something which is falling into the grade 3. So they are the large prolapses which is there and this is what is massive and they are rare. They are not the usual cases. They are 1 to 2 percent only. A high rate of recurrences are there and primary failure are significant high in any sorts of surgery. Difficult to access by a transferable endoscopic surgery. It is contraindicated in most of the literature. Challenging need and use of a foraminoplasty and articulating instruments are needed. That is a higher level of surgical skill and advance and timing which is needed. Difficult to access a complete decompression. The endpoints of decompression can be difficult to assess in the cases and the opposite side route cannot be ensured that it is decompressed. So, additionally what hindrances you have is the view. Because you are going even at a flatter angle, still you are not able to see the dorsum in a prone position. Anatomical difficulties in the form of acetal hypotrophies or associated dorsal stenosis can be there. Sub-PLL, trans-PLL uh, uh, disc which we talked about already. And alpha S1, there is a compounding difficulty to access which is there. So transiliac, I am use, uh, doing transiliac discectomies also. So in transiliac, you don't get that maneuverability in usual disc to grab down the fragment. And common to find a common uh, Kodaikoana syndrome in this group of patients, major deficits in this group of patients, associated migrations, calcified disc, ventral stenosis or say end plate spurs are very common in this group of patients. Even in open surgeries and interlaminar surgeries, in no wise hands this can go wrong way and this is one of the articles which I am quoting just for the sake of making the importance of this is that 15% of cases of cord equina syndrome what happens is iatrogenically precipitated. This is what they, this was a national database which was assessed by them. For transphenomenal surgeries, this is one of the biggest data which is there, a series of 10,228 cases when analyzed, incomplete removal was found in 283 cases and out of that, 91 cases were central disc herniation. Again showing the inadequacy of decompression which may happen and this is a very early paper of Sangoli wherein 50, uh, 55 cases were there and there were good amount of failures of 15% or more. So this is no single trick which can take you through because the endoscope maneuverability is limited. Even small disc in the central say grade 1 and grade 2 of the MSU is, can be associated with the calcified disc PRAF. Posterior ring pla uh, plate apophyseal fractures are very common there and this can add to the stenosis woe and it is difficult to remove. My friend, colleague, uh, Datar, we were all together to start endoscopy and he has mentioned in his a series of some 40 cases odd, wherein a technique, what he says is that put the endoscope there and then you have to medialize it and medialization is by anchorage, the annular anchorage release. So that is one step he mentions. Second, he asked for a foraminoplasty. Yes, foraminoplasty helps us to shift the endoscope more medially. So it is possible to address. So this is the technical tip he has given. There are a good number of now literature coming, which a series of 130 patients with good outcome in, uh, uh, in, in, in 72 patients. There is another retrospective study of 69 patients which has got significant outcome in central disc. Another one which is a retrospective analysis and it is 18 patient and very good outcome with improved cross-sectional area as well. This is another case with pitfalls which is being discussed and uh, outcomes. And they also have included cases where there is no CSF in the Milo, uh, uh, myelogram which is there and they have asked to uh, specifically focus the position of the endoscope because unlike an, another disc prolapse when the transphenomenal scope is reaching into the epidural canal exactly there is where the root may be lying there. So you should not hit the root so you should be cautious addressing such cases. So the most important technical things which I look into is horizontalization and medialization. So take a more flatter entry as possible according to the level the annular anchorage needs to be released. So that helps in medialization as well as horizontalization. If you see on the left side, the facet is the uh, blockade 
for uh, further dorsal angulation. So a foraminoplasty on the right side would allow you to move it more dorsal at the same time angulate it more dorsally. So it is possible to joystick the instrument or the endoscope and at the same time the small green tip what you are seeing is articulated instruments which would be able to grab the fragments. So that is another helpful thing which can be done. Uh, Bipodal approach, don't carry it away. There are more uh, bipodal approach doing surgeons here probably. I am talking about bilateral transforaminal surgery. So that is the another way of doing this cases whenever you have failed to decompress it, you may go in from the other side. This all because it is under local anesthesia. This is another, This these are the modifications which has come in the literature. I have found few articles wherein people have done transforaminal surgery. Additionally, they have gone interlaminar to remove the posterior remnants fragments. This is a very good idea because a interlaminar approach in a central case involves significant retraction of the neural tissue. Having decompressed it transforaminally and then going in interlaminar will ease out the job and avoid the retraction of the neural tissue. And there are multitude of those literature which I spotted and no wise for me. And this is uh, many of my neurosurgeon friends who may be sitting here. This again is done for central disc rather than retracting the neural tissue uh, neurosurgeons do a transdural approach specifically for calcified disc not to retract neural tissue go in transdurally remove the uh, uh, compressing things and come back so that is the idea of not retracting neural tissues few of the examples have massive disc prolapse this is one of the cases of a uh, 23 year old patient you could easily decompress that this is another patient. This is with a PRAF, with a, uh, a PRAF fragment and I could remove it from unilateral side and good outcome. These were pain patients only. This was a large central disc which I could remove. There was a little bit of tissue which was lying on the opposite side. This is the thing which you are at times not able to see. But per operatively the vision was extremely good. What you see is this and I was able to probe it to the opposite side and see. So what you see on MRI because I get post-operative MRI in most of the patients, there may be pseudo bulges which may be there. Don't get, uh, it is just for the documentation purpose and it is completely free. I am probing the opposite side. So it is possible going horizontally to go to the opposite side and probe the opposite side also. So that is possible. So it is a fluttering dura, a pulsatile dura. The near as well as the far root is completely decompressed. This is a CESR uh, 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 cord equina which is impending. This had foot power which had gone to uh, zero. And this is again decompressed from one side and the patient recovered for bladder ball impending in 24 hours and by five weeks the foot was recovered. So pseudo bulge is something which has been reported in literature. So your colleague radiologist should be knowing that what is an adequacy of decompression. So your colleague can comment against you and put it in, put you in a soup. This is a 17 year old male patient, spastic, paraparatic, calcified disc with additional soft fragment, non-walker. I've done bilateral transforaminal approach to achieve a decompression. You can see the opposite side cannula also. See the MRI which is completely cleared the uh, cord so you get away and he has recovered at three weeks time and he is very good so recovery being complete so this is surprising for us and these are just examples this is still not an indication that we everybody should do it this all is it's a little bit risky and not everything is same central disc, disc herniations or high migrated disc are not same as what is simple disc or simple fragments so not to compare Keep exploring the world of endoscopy. Definitely protect your colleague and for images which seems like pseudo bulges. Not refrain from commenting against them if you see across those friends. Thank you. Any questions? I have only one question. We want to go home. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bombardment of endoscopy. I see you tomorrow again at 7.15 to 7.30. All faculty, all delegates, please come to the Cadaver Hall. Dr. Pon Pavit, Dr. Kangtek Lim, and Dr. Santosh Tripathi will be on three stations demonstrating monoportal surgery to you. 
So I see you tomorrow morning. Okay? God bless you. And then we start here regularly. Recording stopped.